Thank you, Dr. Arul, for that kind introduction. Good morning, attendees. Thank you all for prioritizing your time to attend this two-day symposium with us. Over the next two days, we'll be learning about the recent findings in AI and quantum computing. On day one, we will learn about how AI is inextricably linked to its societal impacts, whether it is respect to matters of fairness, privacy, bias, or in energy constraints. And on day two, we will learn more about state of the art in quantum computing and an interplay between machine learning and quantum computing. So as today, AI is proliferating in our daily lives at a very rapid pace. AI economy is expected to grow 13 trillion to 15 trillion dollars by 2030, impacting the very way of our lives. In 2020, cancer, molecular, and drug discovery received the greatest amount of private AI investment, which is up to $13.8 billion. Computer vision, image classification, face recognition, video analysis, or natural language processing, all of these technologies have seen significant progress and are be becoming ubiquitous. More than 30 countries have published AI policy for their nations by December 2020. And the 116th Congress is the most AI-focused congressional session in the history with the highest number of mentions of AI. Also, the AI field grand challenges are being redefined with AI 100 report that has recently come out, highlighting that the most inspiring challenge today is to build machines that can cooperate and collaborate seamlessly with humans and can make decisions that are aligned with fluid and complex human values and preferences. So in the next few slides, I'm going to highlight the research that has been pursued at the Matrix AI Consortium at UTSA. As I mentioned, these AI communities bring new opportunities. But however, AI research today is suffering from a local minima problem. We are not able to achieve the global minima because we are very disciplinary siloed. Today, we cannot generate trustworthy and explainable solutions that foster human engagement, nor do we have robust AI systems that learn in unknown scenarios or deploy systems in severely resource-constrained environments. We can solve such challenges when we use convergent and transdisciplinary approaches in design, development, as well as skill set training. This is really the bold premise behind Matrix AI Consortium at UTSA. By convening scholars from a wide range of disciplines that rigorously explore the technical and societal impacts of AI, the matrix facilitates to deepen our understanding in which AI shapes the future of our lives and challenges that it raises. The core mission of matrix focuses on human well-being, where we are equally passionate about discovery as we are passionate about democratizing the AI field. So, the matrix has an intellectual powerhouse of 65 core and affiliate researchers from four different research organizations where University of Texas at San Antonio is leading. With UT Health San Antonio, Southwest Research Institute and Texas Biomedical Research Institute as our core partners. And our research is focused not only in advancing fundamental uh, challenges in AI, such as building the next generation of AI algorithms, but also in applied domains. So the four research thrusts we focus on are neuro-inspired AI, augmenting human capabilities, trustworthy AI, machine learning, and deployment. And these four research thrusts are led by thrust leads from all our partner organizations. Our research is supported by federal agencies such as NSF, NIH, and several foundations and DOD organizations. And we support or house five NSF career awards in Matrix, 
And also the, the diversity of the student body that is trained in matrix is from six different graduate programs with 20 and coming from 25 research labs. So we inherently foster a rich environment to develop transdisciplinary solutions through and through. Few of the recent notable research awards um, in Matrix are in developing AI models based on the nervous system, in designing lifelong learning systems, or in designing real-time decision-making systems, and we also look at applications that have an impact in our community, such as applications in understanding dementia patterns, or also looking at human-centered decision-making and rolling out new programs that help us build an inclusive AI by projects such as Project Lovelace. We also have recently built our infrastructure to support the cutting edge research that is happening in Matrix. We are in the process of procuring three DGX AI 100 servers in a mini pod setting that would give us to run AI applications from diverse application domains, both for training and inference. We also have three Lambda AI servers that gives our researchers flexibility and modularity in running different uh, data, data intensive or memory intensive compute operations. And for our students, we have procured AI DIY kits, whether it's vision-based or voice-based, and also several embedded platforms for them to have the experiential learning in how AI is deployed in some of the real world scenarios. And we are very much um, interested and we have a responsibility in making AI an inclusive field. And if we look at some of the statistics that we have um, for AI today, the AI designers that we are training do not mirror the rich diversity we have in our society. Only 5% of the AI workforce we have today are from underrepresented groups. So one of our first projects that was kickstarted with support from Xilinx Women in Technology Foundation, Project Lovelace, is really helping advancing women in AI career pathways by hosting a wide range of uh, opportunities in the AI field, such as tinkering with an AI scientist or AI hackathons and seminars or AI fellowships and externships in partnership with industries. Matrix is also engaged heavily with um, our community, particularly in the city of San Antonio. We were engaged during the COVID-19 um, pandemic early days in helping build AI-based prediction models that help in understanding non-clinical interventions on COVID-19 spread. And these models were provided to the city on a daily and weekly basis, along with building a real-time dashboard that would help them understand through easy visualizations on the spread. And this was in collaboration with Southwest Research Institute and UT Health San Antonio, and later partially supported as well by DHS. And the work that was done in this project was uh, led by some of our student researchers from Matrix and published in some of the top venues in AI, such as ICML and Ichikai. We are also offering a wide range of training and educational opportunities to our student researchers, core and affiliate members. For example, every Friday we host AI seminars from 11 a.m. to noon on state-of-the-art AI um, technologies, as well as we host um, experiential learning opportunities for our students and researchers. So we are a young enterprise that is going, that is just celebrated our first birthday. And there are several ways to engage with us beyond research collaborations. We are currently building our research capacity by hiring two faculty positions in this upcoming academic year. We have an opening for an endowed associate and full professor in human-centered AI. 
We have an opening for an assistant professor in AI accelerators, and we also have openings for several PhD and postdoctoral positions in more of our research thrust uh, leads. If you're interested in these opportunities, feel free to reach out to me. With that, um, I would like to highlight that in today's uh, session, we are going to primarily focus on AI technologies. We have two panel sessions, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and four keynote speakers who are going to give us insights about the state of AI. And on day two, we have a similar uh, format where we have two panel sessions, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, with four keynote speakers who are going to talk more on quantum computing and the convergence of machine learning and quantum computing. And this event would not have been possible without the generous support from our leadership team at UTSA. Some of you whom are attending in person, as you might see here, and also from uh, Big Bear AI and um, Missy Dreamport. But more importantly, I would also like to thank our staff leads and the Missy Tech support, Carissa and Armando, who are supporting this hybrid event. Thank you for your uh, support throughout in the planning phase of this event. So enjoy the talks as we start this um, day one of our AI and quantum computing symposium. So we'll proceed with uh, our first speaker for today is Dr. Sebastian Risi. Dr. Risi is a professor at the IT University of Copenhagen, where he's also the director of the Creative AI Lab and co-directs the Robotics Evolution and Art Lab. The goal of his group's curiosity-driven research is to make machines more adaptive and creative. Risi's work focuses on computational evolution, deep learning, and crowdsourcing with applications in robotics, video games, design, and art. Risi's research asks questions such as, can we create lifelong learning and self-organizing machines that continuously acquire new knowledge and skills? Can we grow machines that learn from and work together with humans to solve tasks that neither humans nor machines can solve by themselves. Risi is currently a principal investigator of a Sapper or DFF starting grant. He has won several international scientific awards and best paper awards, as well as the Distinguished Young Investigator in Artificial Life 2018 award, a Google Faculty Research Award in 2019, and an Amazon Research Award in 2020. His work has been published in major machine learning and AI conferences such as AAAI, NeurIPS, Nature Machine Intelligence, and conferences such as Human Computer Interactions. Recently, he co-founded Model.ai, a company that lets game developers rapidly create and test their games through novel AI approaches. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Rizzi. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, so today I would like to talk about uh, towards uh, a more how, how can we get towards a more self-organizing kind of artificial intelligence. Uh, and my name is Sebastian Rizzi and I'm from the IT University in uh, Copenhagen. I'm a professor there. Um, So we have seen uh, a lot of recent progress over the last couple of years in, uh, in deep learning uh, from uh, face recognition to uh, auton some autonomous driving, uh, voice recognition, and these systems work really well if they're trained for a particular uh, task. Um, and these systems are based on um, deep neural networks. And here's a very simple example of such a network. It's not very deep, but basically it's a, it's a neural network um, that uh, processes some information. In this case, it just has to classify uh, digits. 
And then it processes those to these multiple layers. That's why it's called deep learning. And then at the end, there is an output. In this case, it's a classification task. So the output is the, the, the number that the network thinks uh, it, it uh, sees through its, uh, um, that it perceives. Um, and uh, there has been a lot of progress in this, in this field using these deep neural networks uh, combined with methods like uh, deep reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning. For example, here's an uh, example where uh, DeepMind used such a system to uh, teach a neural network in combination with other methods like search to play, um, to master the game of, uh, of StarCraft II. Um, and uh, there's a lot of other examples where these systems have been used recently to uh, really go beyond what was, what was possible, going beyond the state of the art uh, and breaking a lot of um, records. So a few years ago, people would have not thought that this is possible to uh, teach uh, a game such as StarCraft um, to have a computer that plays at that competitive level because the game has so many um, different actions you can do each turn. Um, and, uh, and it was really a, a breakthrough that, that there was a, a neural network that was able to, uh, to work really well in this, uh, in this game. Uh, and then uh, they have used similar approaches combining, uh, for example, neural network with other methods like uh, um, search methods um, uh, to also pr uh, present their system called um, uh, AlphaFold which showed that you can, it can also be used to predict um, the structure of the 3D structure of proteins. So these, these uh, first these methods that were developed in these, in first in, for example, computer games, now also finding kind of real world application and, and revolutionizing uh, a lot of different uh, disciplines like um, uh, in this case, biology. Um, and in our own work, we have also, um, worked earlier StarCraft and shown that a neural network, for example, can learn uh, build orders in the StarCraft game from human um, replays, or it can also learn to um, uh, play this game, um, Doom, also only based on visual feedback. So these neural networks have been now shown to be really good at at learning from very high dimensional data, solving very, very complex uh, problems. Um, but it's not all working so well. Um, so one thing that these networks, for example, still lack is uh, some type of common sense. So you might have seen these uh, examples by uh, this OpenAI's uh, GPT-3 language model where you can input a prompt and the network kind of uh, responds to you. It's a, it's a really large scale with billions of parameters a uh, neural network trained on a lot of text uh, found online. Um, and uh, then you input a sentence and it can basically complement, uh, write the, the rest of the sentence. And uh, for example, here's the human would um, input, what's your favorite animal? And then the neural network would say, my favorite animal is a dog. Why? Because dogs are loyal and friendly. And then the question is, what are two reasons that a dog might be in a bad mood? Two reasons that a dog might be in a bad mood are if it's hungry or if it's hot. Uh, so if you would just see this, it would be kind of hard to distinguish maybe between um, a human communicating with um, with you or uh, a neural or uh, an, an artificial in some AI system like a, like a neural network. Um, but these systems also can break down and, and they basically show that they are what this article from uh, technology review says. Uh, they are shockingly good, like in some cases, but in other cases, they're completely mindless. Um, and also what some people call them, like these stochastic parrots. So, and then can we can ask other questions. Who was president of the United States in 1700? William Penn was president of the United States. Richard Bennett, then I asked in 1650, it says Richard Bennett was president of the United States in 1650. Uh, so people that, um, so something, the network is very convinced that what it's saying is, is true, um, but it's obviously um, not true. And you can, they generate output that is, um, um, that is uh, so technically correct, uh, but that might not, that might be very far removed from the, from the actual truth. But that's something that the neural network, because it doesn't have any common sense, it's just trained to replicate the input that we feed these neural networks. It's not able to realize that, that uh, these answers are wrong or that it produces wrong output. So which makes applying these models to some task very, um, 
you know, complicated and questionable if we can't control basically what these systems uh, produce. Uh, other examples of uh, where do we currently kind of still struggle with our deep learning systems or machine learning systems is that oftentimes they perform really, really well on tasks they have been trained um, before, but then if it's if we it's presented with a task it hasn't seen or, or even only slight variations of the task, then often uh, these systems break down. So here's an example of um, um, AlphaGo, which reached uh, beyond human level performance in this 19 by 19 uh, Go board. But if we would apply it without any modification to a smaller board or um, a, a larger board or, or change something subtle about the rules that a human could easily adapt to, these systems will completely fail. Uh, other examples, uh, this is not trained with a deep learning system, but other examples, we can program robots really well to, to perform a particular task uh, like this acrobatics, but then if they are still, if they are confronted with a situation that they haven't seen before that is surprising, then oftentimes these systems don't know what to do and will basically um, break, break down. Um, some other examples where we currently still struggle. Um, so this was a, a paper from already six years ago, but the, the, the message and the, um, uh, it's it, uh, what they found here is still true with current neural networks is that oftentimes these systems are very easily fooled. So in this case, we have an image uh, recognition uh, neural network. Um, and what we can do is we can actually uh, evolve. We can train pictures that are really good at fooling the network to saying the wrong thing. So these networks are produced by uh, another neural network that uh, produces images. Uh, and the, the neural network is very convinced, um, the deep neural network that has to detect these images is very convinced, for example, that um, this is a sea snake or that this is a stethoscope or this is an assault rifle. Even though for a human, maybe with some uh, imagination, you could kind of see these things in there, but um, um, we also see pictures that are totally unrelated to the, um, the actual image, the actual object that the network thinks that it sees, but we can we can adversarial, we can um, uh, make an adversarial attack that would create an image that the network would say it's one thing, but it's clearly something else. So these networks still um, process information very differently to how we humans uh, process information and are uh, more brittle in, in observing and detecting objects than, than, uh, than humans. Even more uh, interesting maybe that these systems are, you don't even need to um, construct an artificial image. You can just take an image and, and then uh, rotate, for example, this school bus in different, um, in different poses. Uh, and then the network, if, if it sees a normal, the normal situation you would encounter a school bus is this situation. And there the network is, uh, is very sure that it sees a school bus. But if we then uh, rotate the school bus, then it would suddenly say this is a garbage truck. If we rotate it even more and bring it closer, suddenly it's a punching bag. And if we put it on the side, then the network uh, is very, very sure this is a snowplow. Uh, the same for the motor scooter. In, in the normal situation, it's clearly being able to identify it. But what about the situations um, that you could, in principle, encounter while you, if you have an autonomous car, where the, um, the motorcycle is on its side and suddenly thinks it's a parachute? Um, and the same for this uh, fire truck here. So which clearly shows that these systems are not as robust as, for example, our visual system, because for us, it, it's not a problem to uh, detect that uh, we see a school bus in all these images on the top or a motor scooter or a, a fire truck. So there's something still missing to, um, to get to the same kind of level of uh, resilience and uh, that we see in a in, in natural system. Uh, also, one other interesting example, um, these, these uh, agents are trained with deep reinforcement learning. So we have a neural network that's trained through reinforcement learning to uh, perform really well at, at uh, keeping the, the ball out of the... So you have uh, this, this agent that shoots the ball and then you have this goalie that tries to um, defend. And normally this works really well, uh, but then, um, then the, the goalie found an interesting strategy that might not work really well on humans, but it found that if it just throws itself on the ground, the other player is so confused that it doesn't know what to do anymore and also stumbles and just falls down. So the strategy it, it found was to just uh, do something unexpected that the other agent has never seen 
and this way it was able to basically um, uh, fool the, the other agent and uh, able to come up with a winning uh, strategy. Um, so these examples show that there's clearly some gap between what our agents, what our uh, machine learning systems and deep learning systems can do compared to what we see in uh, systems in, um, uh, in uh, oh, sorry, now I, got, I clicked on this message, um, what we see in, in nature. So in nature, we have this amazing uh, resilience uh, and uh, adaptation um, for example, in these ants that make a bridge and they don't, there can be more or less ants that can, the, the gap between those uh, doesn't have to be always the same size. So they're amazingly robust in building these kind of bridges. Uh, we can see barracuda swarms or general uh, swarms and flocks of, of birds that are amazingly robust to perturbations. And of course, we also see the same thing in, in our brains that uh, we are amazing at, at recovering from certain types of damage. They are um, if we lose a, a, a digit of our finger, then our brain rewires itself to use that space, for example, for the, for the other fingers. Uh, we are amazing at, um, at dealing, or animals are uh, dealing with damage to their morphologies. They can recover from that. Uh, they can adapt to even situations that are unexpected. And also animals don't just completely uh, break down if they find themselves in a situation they have not seen before. If, um, you take your dog to a new park, it might be very excited, but it's not that it suddenly, you know, doesn't, doesn't work anymore. Uh, so these systems, um, the biological systems are still way ahead in terms of resilience and robustness. Um, and while we have now systems that can solve specific tasks really well, like solving Go, protein folding, um, these systems are very specialized, but they're not very general. Um, and that's kind of the goal can we, can we get to a more kind of general AI exploiting some of these concepts that we've seen, that we're seeing how nature solves certain problems? And basically the one major difference is, uh, and here on the left side, we have this uh, backpropagation algorithm. Uh, so this is the typical algorithm, how uh, we train, for example, deep neural networks is that we propagate the input through the network and then we get the, um, result back of how right or wrong was the classification. And then we have this uh, top-down mechanism called backpropagation that changes um, the, the weights in this network to make it more likely that next time we produce the correct um, uh, output. So you have this kind of top-down uh, teacher that tells you what you did wrong and tells you every little detail you should change about, for example, your neural network. So it's a very kind of top-down uh, type of um, centralized uh, pro process. Um, on the other hand, we have these um, they have this uh, collective intelligence in, in nature, where each ant just communicates with its with, with its neighbors. It's a it's a system that that basically relies on this kind of idea of self-organization. That each unit is very it's not very smart. Um, but through this process of local communication with the neighbors and through this uh, emergence of this kind of self-organizing patterns, um, they, we create this, the systems have this amazing um, uh, resilience and only oftentimes relying on this kind of local communication. So no, instead of having a central teacher, you have these local units that communicate that together figure out um, or that together tells them what they, what they, should, what they should be doing. Um, and so can we kind of uh, try to um, give our artificial system also a more kind of ideas from collective intelligence um, that we have these uh, communicating units and they have to figure out what to do. And the idea is because these systems are so resilient and adaptive that if we create similar artificial systems, maybe they would have some of the same kind of um, properties. And of course, that's not a completely new idea. People have been working on this kind of idea of collective intelligence and complex system uh, for a while. There's um, this uh, great work um, by uh, a lab uh, from uh, Radhika Nagpal, for example, where they have these uh, kilobots, so very, very small robots, and they can also only, um, they can only see, uh, oh, they can only see their neighbors and they can only communicate with their neighbors and then they have to move to a, a certain place in this uh, um, in this environment. 
And just by only communicating with the neighbors, these robots are able to figure out how do I have to arrange myself to form a certain predetermined shape. So I can tell those this robot collective to form a star, and then this robot collective is, is able to achieve that, or, or also other, other types of uh, objects. Um, but one, one kind of drawback with this system was that um, uh, the, the rules had to be are manually programmed. Uh, the rules to, to reach a certain shape, uh, there's an algorithm that, that creates those rules for the robots then to follow, um, but it didn't really exploit recent advances um, in, in deep learning, where we maybe have the ability to not relying on this kind of hand programming, but we can actually learn the rules to assemble, for example, into a certain type of uh, shape. Uh, and so this is the this is the basic idea. And one of our in in my lab, one of our research agendas, can we kind of combine the advantages of deep learning with ideas from collective intelligence and create more robust and adaptive um, systems? And uh, I'm going to go through two examples of uh, work we we have done that goes in this uh, direction. Um, so one work is where we take a, a quadruped robot and then we want to see what would happen if we damage one of the legs. So we train, this is our original morphology, and then we have another morphology where we removed one of the legs of the robot. And we know that animals are already uh, good at compensating for this type of, of damage. So we wanted to see how do our neural networks fare when presented with this type of challenge, can they somehow can these neurons somehow um, uh, figure out what to do? The, the neural network that controls this robot to figure out to find a, a compensatory uh, behavior so that this robot is still able to 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 locomote. Uh, and what we use for these experiments, um, because it's 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 complicated to um, predict if you have a system that is somehow based on on a self organizational process. Um, then it's hard to predict the outcome. And for this type of uh, challenge, we look at also nature for inspiration. And we use the, we do try to do it the same way as nature did it and using what's called um, evolutionary algorithms. And in this case, we're using these evolutionary algorithms to evolve the neural networks that control these robots. So, and this approach is called also neuroevolution. So we have this neural network that controls this robot so it can send actions um, through the environment, it gets some feedback back from the environment, like the, the angle of all the joints of the robot. And then based on, uh, we let the robot then um, work in its environment, we, we let it actuate its motors, we see how far can it travel. And based on that, that gives us some fitness that determines then the, the chances of to being able to reproduce this particular neural network for the next generation. And initially we have populations of thousands of these uh, neural networks that control thousands of robots. Uh, and some of them will initially perform really badly and not do anything, but some will be able to locomote just a little bit further. Then we take those neural networks, we add a little bit of noise to the connections, we put them back into the environment and we repeat this process hundreds and thousands of, of times. And then at the end, we find some neural networks that perform quite well in this particular task. And, uh, and this is an example of a, a, a standard neural network that was trained through these evolutionary algorithms. And what we can see here is that the two different morphologies it was trained on. So it was once trained on a normal morphology. We trained it on one morphology where we cut off one leg and we trained it on a third. We, we then, one of them we only show during test time. So it, the system was not trained to deal with this. And then we show that a standard neural network is actually, it's not good at dealing with things it hasn't seen. So while it's good to walk with the first two morphologies it has seen, the third one you see now, uh, it's not able to do anything. So it's, it can, it's robust to things it has seen during training, the normal morphology, certain type of damage. But if we then uh, expose it to another type of damage it hasn't seen, then these systems will basically completely break down and, 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 uh, and not being able to uh, work anymore. So how can we get from these brittle systems then? Can we, can we incorporate some of the lessons from um, collective systems and this kind of idea of self-organization into a system like this to make it more robust to this kind of unexpected situations? 
And this is work we presented uh, last year at this uh, NeurIPS conference, which we call Meta Learning Through Heavy and Plasticity in Random Networks, where our idea is to completely forget about the training, the weights of a neural network. So our idea was instead, and some other people have explored similar ideas in, in the past, uh, but we explored it with recent, applying it to recent um, uh, deep, deep learning architectures is where we completely forget about the weights of the network. And we just initialize the weights every time this agent is born, we initialize the weights completely randomly. And the only thing we learn is what's called Hebbian learning rules that tell each, each connection in this artificial neural network how to change while it is interacting with its environment. So instead of the normal paradigm in reinforcement learning or also um, standard deep learning where you train a system, you find good parameters, you freeze the system, and then you put it in a task which results in systems that cannot adapt, we completely randomly initialize the weights and have learned rules that tell each synapse while it's interacting with the environment to change. So these, these systems are not uh, don't have frozen weights, but they have dynamic weights they change the whole time while the agent is interacting with its world. Uh, and and uh, I promise this, I think, is the only formula in this talk where basically what we evolve is, so the, the way, this is the, the weight between two nodes and the way this uh, connection should change is based on this learning rate. And then the activation of this neuron, which is this uh, I and, and, and this neuron. And then we have these different parameters that we learn for each connection basically in the network. We don't learn the weight, we learn these parameters A, B, C, D that then tell this connection how much should I change based on the activation of the pre, this is this node, and the post synaptic neuron that those two connect to. And then we wanted to find out, is it, would the system be able to basically self-organize its weights during the lifetime of the agent to deal with things that it hasn't seen before. So what you see here is the Hebbian network, this uh, approach I just described to you where we evolve these rules. What we see on the other side is a static network where the, the weights are trained and they are fixed uh, during while the agent interacts. So they're trained, frozen, and then the agent interacts. And, and um, these are the, um, the matrix of the weights of this individual here. Uh, which has these kind of three layers, and this is the the, um, the visualization. So if you if you look briefly, it goes very fast. Uh, these weights very quickly um, organize into some other uh, pattern that still looks random to us, but apparently works to control the robot. Uh, so on the left side, we see that the robot is able to work with the two morphologies that has that seen during training, and it also works with the morphology uh, a little less well, but it still works to move forward with a morphology where we cut off a leg, which it has never seen uh, before. Um, and this is based on this, uh, that the weights in this network are not pre-programmed, but the weights are um, emerge through this kind of self-organizing process that then really quickly, or after a few time steps, allows the robot to basically uh, move. And we applied the same approach to, um, uh, also, a car this car racing domain where the agent has to only it only gets the high dimensional raw uh, uh, sensory input, so it has to learn to drive from pixels. Uh, and then again, we can see here that it very quickly the weights kind of um, self organize in some way. The pattern is still changing. So as I said, the, the weights are not static, but they're still changing over time. But they're changing in some kind of sensible way that allows the agent to drive around this the track. And again, it's only after a few time steps that the system needs to very quickly learn or self-organize based on the learned rules, uh, how should I um, change the weights to being able to, to drive. And uh, another interesting property is that these systems are also resilient to, to damage. So that's one thing that we want from our collective uh, intelligence systems that if we damage a part, like we remove some ants, we, we uh, damage a certain area, uh, then they can recover from this um, very, very quickly. And here, here as well, what we did is we, we took this weight pattern uh, that, that um, 
the system uh, reached in the self-organizing process, then we then we set a certain number of these just to, to zero. So all these, we basically, we damage these weights in the neural network. Uh, and then only after letting the system run again, 10 time steps, did those weights recover? They look, they are slightly different than the weights that were there before, but they uh, um, reached a pattern that allowed it again, this uh, the system to, to work um, and to uh, perform in this environment after only a certain number of steps. And here we can see that the, initially the performance drops uh, when, we, when, we, um, when we damage these connections, but only after certain time steps, um, it's able to recover and reaching basically the same kind of performance level that it was able to reach uh, before. And then uh, we also were interested in kind of, can we get some idea of these self-organizing systems oftentimes learn some attractor that they are, that they, uh, that um, they, they converge towards. And we wanted to see if we do some dimensionality reduction of the, the thousand um, dimensional weight space, can we see some of the similar dynamics? And we can see that uh, when we have these evolved coefficients, we see some interesting dynamics that are a little bit different to if we just use here in this case, the random coefficient baseline. And we can see the same thing here that the, so basically we see here this kind of progression of the, how the weights while the agent is interacting uh, in this high dimensional weight space, what is it traversing? And interestingly, it also never kind of stands still. It's not that it's just confined to one area, but it's actually somehow like going around in this area, converging to different points, also depending on if we have a damaged um, left morphology, for example, if we have a, a, a damaged right morphology, uh, or if we have the, the, the standard uh, morphology. Um, so now I kind of showed you that we can um, we can uh, make the, use these kind of ideas of self-organization to create neural networks that are more robust to unexpected situations. But of course, the, can we also make going one step further, can we use the system to make machines uh, that make themselves? Uh, and so I think this is one of the next kind of holy grails that can we have a system that not, doesn't just um, learn to make these neural networks more robust, but can we actually grow uh, these, uh, these morphologies? Can we grow robot morphologies? Can we grow neural networks similarly to how nature did this also only through the local uh, interaction of cells that we see in this uh, in this video here and and so for this we kind of base our research on this idea of uh, of a cell automata um, which is this uh, idea that that uh, you have these systems that are made out of these kind of discrete um, blocks and each one of these cells follows a very simple rule the rule could just be in this for example this game of life if you have three neighbors, maybe you make another cell. If there are four neighbors, then the cell should die. So each one of these cells in the cell automata uh, performs a, a certain, follows these uh, specific rules. And each, importantly, each cell follows the same rule. And then you, if you arrange things um, correctly, you get this kind of very interesting patterns that almost look lifelike only by these cells communicating locally with each other. And um, and one um, kind of drawback of the original kind of cell automata game of life is that these rules, basically the rules of how cells should behave had to be specified by humans. So humans said, if there are three cells, they make another cell. If there's one cell, then, um, then the cell should die and so on. So, so it was a lot of hand engineering to get kind of these different uh, interesting patterns to emerge. But um, what we can do, and is to use instead, we use a neural network that is running in each one of these cells, a neural network that looks at its neighbors, at the neighboring cells, and then decides what it should do. And we have very efficient ways now to train in these neural networks. Um, and so we can train a neural network, for example, to assemble a certain type of shape that we, that we find interesting. Uh, and one uh, push that really helped also move this, this field forward was also showing that we can train these systems actually very efficiently uh, also with things like gradient descent uh, and uh, with this differential idea of a, of a neural cell automata. Um, and so in, in our work, we wanted them to see, can we grow um, simple robotic structures 
uh, and then see if those structures are also more robust to damage because they're only relying on this kind of local interaction of cells. And this is one some work we, we did here where we're growing these virtual creatures and then these virtual creatures are put into an environment and then we see how well are they at, at, at locomoting and if they perform well, then they get a higher fitness. And we, again, we use evolution to find a neural network that would grow a robot that is good at doing this specific task, which is uh, locomotion. And uh, then we also wanted to see what if we cut off a leg of this robot? Maybe you think that we always cut off legs of our virtual robots, but that's, that's part of the job. Um, so we cut off a leg of this robot and then we wanted to see what would happen. Uh, and, and the robot was then able to basically regrow its leg. You can imagine like a salamander only by having the, 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 the voxels communicate with each other locally, it's able to recover and uh, able to move, uh, move again. Um, in in follow-up work, we wanted to extend this and growing, can we grow more complex structures? So the robot I showed you is still has, um, has less than, um, than 50 cells. Uh, so we wanted to see, if, can we grow things that have thousands of cells? And can we grow, uh, can we grow more functional machines that can do interesting things? Um, similarly to how we grow, um, how um, uh, organisms in nature are grown uh, to perform complex functions. And so for this, uh, we looked into what kind of um, domain can we use? And one domain that we thought, because it supports growing very complex things, it supports growing functional machines, uh, was this uh, Minecraft domain. Uh, and so we, we changed this neural cell automata that normally worked for for uh, in two dimensions, growing uh, two dimensional um, structures uh, to grow in this case, these uh, three dimensional Minecraft structures. Uh, and so the, the neural network gets as input what is already, uh, what is already grown. Uh, and then it determines for each cell what, what should basically be grown uh, next. And here's the example of this process uh, where we trained the system on existing artifacts that people made in Minecraft, for example, this tree. And then we trained the system being able to, just from the interaction of cells, being able to grow uh, this, the, the, this target structure. Uh, and then we can see it's able to grow things like this tree. It's able to grow things uh, like this apartment building, uh, making very, very few mistakes in the growth, in the growth process, almost 100% replicating the original uh, uh, structure. So it figured out rules to, to grow these systems. And then we also wanted to see, does it work for functional machines? And this is a very simple functional machine in Minecraft that can move forward. We wanted to see, does it also work for this more like a caterpillar uh, that is able to move because of the specific arrangement of blocks. And then again, we do some uh, questionable experiments where we cut the caterpillar in half uh, and seeing, can it recover from this damage? And as we can see here, it's able to regrow the damaged parts again, just based on the local communication of cells. And then those two caterpillars can go there, uh, able to go their way and be happy. Um, another example, it doesn't, maybe you, you might ask, does it always work? Uh, so most of the time it works quite well, but if it becomes very, very complex, uh, it, it doesn't 100% work. There are certain artifacts. So for example, and those are also quite interesting. Uh, so in this case, we wanted to, that it grows this very complicated cathedral, but as you can see, there are certain artifacts. It, it didn't grow it, you know, like 100% correctly, um, but it got uh, quite, quite close. But you can see that there are certain parts that are not 100% uh, correct. And of course, what, where we want to get to is that we want to, we not just want to have our connections in these artificial neural networks being able to change what I showed you before with the heavy learning. We want the, we want ideally those, the whole neural networks to grow similarly to this neural development of the zebra fish that you see here. So that is the, the vision. Can we grow neural networks instead of having to hand design neural architectures, can these neural networks grow based on the activation they're getting from the environment? Um, and, uh, and that's one of the things that we are currently working on now. So going away from hand engineered architectures, but having architectures that can actually grow and um, being adapted to the task and hopefully replicating some of the resilience of, um, of the, the biological inspiration. And here we can see we have some uh, 
some initial work in this direction where we can see here you have the initial neural network it's basically um, empty and uh, it has this one one connection uh, and then we can we now in each one of these neurons we have another neural cell automata running that says should this neuron make a connection should it not make a connection how strong should this connection be and we can see if you if you notice here on the right that very quickly it finds a neural network grown during the lifetime of the agent during the development and then with this network it's able to uh, run away and uh, and hide somewhere um of course there's so so kind of wrapping wrapping up there's uh, of course other people working on these ideas as well. There's some very interesting work um, where uh, in this case, and again, it shows kind of the similar resilience to damage. In this case, these uh, blocks, these modular robots are controlled by separate neural networks. Uh, so clones of the same network, but, but separated, they can communicate with each other. Uh, and then we can see here that it's based on just these uh, blocks communicating, it's very, quickly able, and this was at the beginning of training, this is at the end of training, uh, it was able to very quickly to just local communication and self-organization to figure out um, how can I coordinate to, to solve this very complex task of making this long uh, chain, for example. And then the authors of this paper, of course, uh, also wanted to see what other cool things they can do. And here you have these robots that self-assemble and are able to even traverse these kind of, um, uh, uh, stairs uh, as well. And then other work here uh, by uh, the lab of um, David Ha, uh, where it's a system that's based also on interacting uh, components. And by doing this, the system is able to figure out not just to learn to work from uh, the correct image, but you can give the system this completely broken um, uh, scrambling of the screen and the system is able to figure out how to, how to deal with this without additional training. So the system is so robust that you can scramble the whole screen uh, and it's still able to figure out how to control the car with this, um, this new visual input that uh, I don't think I would be able to do that. And this again, it's based on uh, local communication um, mainly uh, and, uh, and these, uh, com and these uh, components. Um, so, this I'm, I'm kind of wrapping up. So I hope I could give you some idea of that, the, the promise of basically combining these ideas of deep learning with ideas from collective intelligence, like self-organization, uh, emergence, local communication, to being able to create things that are, that are more robust to, um, to things like damage um, or more robust to perturbations and things that, has, that the, the system has not seen uh, doing training and and maybe with this communication the, with this combination we can uh, get closer to kind of reaching the goal of these um, more generally um, robust systems that we that we see in in nature and with that uh, I thank you very much for your uh, attention thanks again for the invitation and also uh, thanks to all the collaborators that made this possible and the uh, different funding organizations uh, thanks a lot for an excellent presentation. Um, the floor is open for questions. If you are joining us virtually, you can type in the questions on the chat window and I could um, walk around to give you the mic for those who are, who are attending in person. So the first question, Dr. Ritsi, uh, as you're uh, looking at building these um, models that are learning in uncertain situations or able to adapt dynamically, I see that a lot of models that you have described have uh, uh, are using topological uh, changes or morphological changes. So what do you think is key to building these kind of um, lifelong learning agents, for example, um, that are bi biologically inspired? Is the morphological structure enough or um, what other key features should be incorporated uh, from the biology? Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of other features that need to be incorporated to make these systems work better. So in this case, we use the very kind of simple, the most simple learning rules, like these Hebbian rules in the case of this uh, quadruped. Um, but there are, of course, a lot of other mechanisms in biology that make these systems learn, for example, a lot better 
and, and learn better uh, continually. Uh, so one thing that we are also want to incorporate and that other people uh, are already um, are already working on is this idea of also neuromodulation, which is a, a different, uh, an additional um, um, method that works in our brain that can up or down regulate, for example, how much certain uh, neuron synapses should be able to, to change. And so there are a lot of, um, I think, insights that we that we can take from, from, for example, neuroscience about which mechanisms work well in the brain. Uh, there's also this idea of uh, this neural Turing, Turing machine where we have this kind of external memory component, um, which gives us a little bit more persistent memory. So, so these kind of ideas that um, um, taking those from, from biology, making these systems use more of the, the learning rules that kind of nature already invented, I think that would be an important uh, next step as well. Um. So as a follow-up to that, so you're saying neuromodulation, and even in your presentation, you talked about metaplasticity. So some of these local plasticity mechanisms are also integral as you are building these uh, agents in order to get those features. So for uh, the metaplasticity-based model that you have shown, you said that you'd start with a random network, right? And then let the system figure out um, or do the meta-learning and you figure out what those values should be. Um, using different mechanisms. So uh, did you see that with different kinds of distributions in your random network with your initial C values for your brains, was there a change in the performance of your network? Yeah, so we actually tried to use, um, so we can, if we initialize the network too drastically, like uh, give it very, very, um, very high, for example, random values, then it wouldn't work anymore. But it's, it's, uh, um, surprisingly robust to different types of initialization. So we used a lot of different standard initializations of um, uh, that you find in, in deep learning, like saver initialization and high initialization. Uh, and it was able to, from all these different types of distributions of like the weight distribution, as long as they're not completely off from what uh, was trained on, it's able to, from those, also find uh, weight dynamics that, that still work. Um, so we are, we were surprised that it how robust it was to these uh, these type of changes. Thank you. Uh, we have one question in the chat window. Uh, yeah, I can. In the meta learning paper, what is the reason for resilience of the network? Is it because of random weights or meta learning uh, approach? Um, so because the network was trained to always work with, so we didn't specifically encourage resilience. So in the case of the, actually in the case, that's good to note, like in the case of the, when I showed you those uh, Minecraft results or the soft robot results where we did the damaging, we actually trained for being able to recover from, uh, from damage. But in case of the, um, the, the quadruped, we actually did not, uh, specifically trained for it we just it could be that just from this the the combination of this meta training that each in the in this inner loop you show these different morphologies and every time you have to start from completely random ways that this way it learned to be resilient but it's not something that we encourage so it could be maybe even made more resilient if you would specifically train uh, for resilience as well one more question. Oh, I in the chat. Okay, yeah. Um, so you discuss damage to agents like losing limbs. Uh, what about damage to the computation mechanism? Um, any work being done on what happens when part of the neural network is damaged? Uh, yeah. So this is. Um, yeah. So we didn't try like uh, reduction in layers. Uh, um, or the inputs. Um, so what we did try is with the, um, uh, the quadruped is that we actually did damage its neural network. So we set, we were setting specifically certain weights in this network to, to zero and then seeing can it recover from that. So I would call that damage to the computation mechanism, but of course it was not to the level that we would uh, reduce or increase the number of layers. So that that's one thing that we are definitely uh, interested in can you have 
neural networks that are so robust that you could add more computational elements, that you could remove computational elements, and they would be automatically integrated. But that's not something that we have done with the current um, the current setup. Well, another question on the cellular automata, what you have done, what type of um, connectivity did you use for the cellular automata? I know you uh, cited Chua's work in there, but um, are there a specific um, connectivity models that work better for you when you're using this? Yeah, so we, we used for the, for example, the Minecraft work, we used like, um, uh, uh, it's a convolutional neural network that because it's a, basically it's an efficient implementation of like a cell automata, a convolutional network, but that only sees like the, the surrounding area uh, around it. Um, so it only sees the neighboring pixels, but it's basically uh, in that way uh, doing convolution. Um, and, uh, and that it, it definitely was like some, depending on the complexity of the task. So we've seen in this Minecraft that we had to, for example, increase the number of um, um, layers or the number of, of filters, depending on uh, if the task was more or less complicated. So if we, if we went to a lot of like thousands of different blocks and different uh, 50 different block types, we needed a larger network to be able to solve these tasks. So there's definitely um, uh, some um, connection between the, the complexity of the network, the neural cell automata network, and the task you want to solve. So if you want to create more complex patterns, then in general, you probably need to have a more complex network. Um, but, and the other thing was in this Minecraft, we had to work a lot with this loss function because of the particular that we wanted in Minecraft, we have this discrete type of blocks. And so we had to um, kind of make a different type of loss function that worked well in this particular uh, domain. So those things required like a little bit of, of tweaking. One last question. Uh, what would your recommendation would, uh, for somebody who wants to enter into designing like long learning features that, biologic, uh, that are biologically inspired, what would be the first step or starting step for them to have uh, play at these models or networks? Yeah, I think what's a great starting point, uh, I think this uh, the, the the original kind of neural cell um, uh, or the differentiable neural cell automata work that I also mentioned in my my talk is a, they made a really great um, interactive system where you can play with the system. It's growing like these 2D structures and you can change them. So if you Google neural cell automata, one of the first hits is this work by, by Google. Um, where they uh, where you can play with the patterns, you can load your own patterns, and they they give a it's a very kind of nice, very interactive system to try these systems out. So I would that's a good starting point, I think, for people that are interested in this kind of collective intelligence combination with deep learning, can definitely suggest people to go there and check that out. Thank you so much, Dr. Rissi. That was a very inspiring talk. Thanks again very much for the invitation and sorry that uh, I think I was confused with the starting time. Oh, don't be started early, I guess. So. <laughs> okay, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the first panel of the day, uh, AI Ecosystem for the Edge. Uh, my name is Murtuza Jadliwala. I'm an Associate Professor of Computer Science at the University of Texas at San Antonio and I'll be moderating this panel. Uh, edge computing, as you know, is a distributed computing paradigm that attempts to improve application response times and network bandwidth requirements by bringing computational data close, uh, computational requirements closer to the data. Uh, edge computing is especially uh, relevant in the current IoT era. An ever increasing number of IoT devices and sensors have resulted in an explosive amount of data being generated which needs to be appropriately processed and archived uh, by applications. Uh, at the same time, increasing uh, computing and storage capabilities of devices that are in the proximity of these IoT sensors, for example, your smartphones, smart home uh, device hubs, et cetera, provide an opportunity to pre-process uh, this large amount, large amount of data, uh, thereby avoiding unnecessary and large uh, network-based communications with the service providers. This greatly improves uh, the overall response times and quality of service of applications uh, relying on this data. As modern services 
heavily rely on state-of-the-art AI and ML algorithms, efficiently uh, integrating and executing uh, these algorithms within the edge computing paradigm um, is important. Obviously, doing this in a secure and privacy-preserving fashion is, uh, is an open question, which is still facing the community. Uh, advances in federated and single shot slash zero shot learning algorithms have resulted in uh, uh, an encouraging progress in this direction, but obviously there is a lot more work to do. So this panel comprises of four experts in AI, ML, uh, security and privacy, and IoT and edge computing. Uh, and we'll discuss the recent advances in AI, ML technologies for edge computing. Uh, uh, you know, And we'll try to uh, answer questions uh, related to uh, how to realize a functioning AI ML uh, ecosystem for the edge uh, and the path forward. Uh, so before we begin, uh, let me introduce uh, each of our panel members uh, and request them to provide a short uh, summary of their work in this area. Uh, let me first begin with uh, Gabriela Siukchale, uh, who is an associate professor uh, in electrical engineering, uh, electrical and computer engineering at a department of uh, a department, uh, electrical and computing engineering department at UTSA. And she's a vice president for securing automation and secure manufacturing architecture uh, at the Cyber Manufacturing Institute, uh, Innovation Institute uh, at UTSA. Uh, Gabriela. Thank you so much. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Uh, looking forward to the discussions with a, with a great panel. Uh, so, um, I've done, I've done work <laughs> across IoT and across uh, machine learning and across security. And I'm, I'm going to share with you some of my experiences and some of the conclusions based on what's happening today. Where do we want to go uh, today? So I started with my, <clears throat> with my thesis uh, a long time ago, back in uh, 2005, 2000, between 2005, 2009. Uh, I started studying uh, poisoning attacks, which are very relevant for for any kind of machine learning uh, uh, approaches that we are doing today. And I, I proposed um, uh, approaches for uh, cleaning attacks from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, data sets, from the training data sets. And I also looked at in, uh, collaborative security. And I think um, nowadays we are talking a lot about federated learning as a co collaborative learning approach, but there is also the other angle of collaborative security. How can we do better uh, when we uh, share information uh, with respect to security. So back, uh, back in the day, I was, I was looking at ways in which we can share uh, uh, models, not uh, the way um, uh, we are doing it now in federated learning, but sharing the models to actually further uh, clean uh, uh, the, the, tra the training models of, uh, of systems. Uh, so that was uh, a different approach, but uh, it can uh, definitely have a, a, a meaning uh, nowadays as well. And then I extended my work to, to Manet. So I looked in ways in which models can be, can be built on uh, Manet's uh, nodes uh, so that uh, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, provide access control capabilities. So for example, when you form a Manet network, you will be more uh, willing to actually talk to nodes that have similar models to yours. So again, this resembles a little bit uh, the, the concept of uh, edge devices uh, uh, nowadays uh, in the sense that we had exactly the same um, uh, uh, let's say uh, limitations in terms of resources. So uh, we were approaching uh, uh, ideas uh, around pre-model, uh, pre, uh, pre-trained models, and then uh, deploy them on the managed network, and then do a little bit more uh, assessment of uh, of the network um, uh, behaviors and uh, try to uh, to characterize those devices in uh, such ways. So all of those all of those different approaches uh, are um, uh, have been. Uh, uh, very um, a, a good foundation for me to to look more into IoT devices over over time, uh, and uh, I've done a lot of work in IoT and I've used machine learning to actually assess the security of IoT devices and I've done device um, identification and monitoring capabilities uh, using um, uh, different uh, ML uh, capabilities. I've done I've also looked at uh, ways in which we can. Um, model cyber physical interactions and attack patterns across IOTs. And um, I looked uh, together with my colleagues, I looked at uh, ways in which we can formalize that. And that, uh, that type of work is also relevant for nowadays when we are talking about edge devices, because we want to be able to, 
to have uh, certain guarantees when we talk about ML. Um, I also looked at uh, uh, causality analysis, and that's something that is definitely relevant for edge uh, devices when we want to figure out what's happening in an IoT network, what was the causality of a particular event that is emerging in a, in a large scale uh, type of uh, system. Um, more uh, more uh, recently, I also looked at a different angle for IOBT, Internet of Battlefield Things. There, there is a big, big need for trust assessment, uh, being able to distinguish between nodes that are uh, good and bad. And again, uh, it's uh, it, it has uh, the the relationship with the uh, with the edge devices. We are dealing with a lot of uh, devices, and we have no way at the moment to distinguish between the ones that we should trust and the ones that we are uh, we are not going to trust. Um, and um, these type of uh, problems are actually now converging towards a new. Uh, work that uh, I'm looking into, uh, where we are trying to secure manufacturing uh, systems. So I'm part of the uh, of the Simeni Institute, and there we are uh, building a, a, an open uh, reference architecture for securing uh, both the, the automation systems and also the the supply chain. And when we are talking about these systems, we want to be able to do that in such a way that we can provide strong guarantees. So we want uh, to look into formal modeling. Uh, and uh, ways in which we can uh, uh, we can uh, rely on these strong guarantees, and the same kind of needs apply to uh, everything that we are doing uh, with respect to AI. We want to be able to have explainability and trustworthiness uh, for uh, all the AI uh, uh, systems that we are uh, going to consider. And edge devices are a big part of uh, uh, of uh, manufacturing systems. So being able to to leverage everything that is uh, happening uh, now in uh, uh, in our community and being able to kind of work together towards this idea of trustworthiness is something that really resonates with me and also with the needs uh, that we see across different industries that rely on AI. So I kind of see uh, this, um, uh, there are certain needs that I, I identify when we talk about edge devices and the use of AI. So there is the, the trustworthiness and explainability. We want to be able to have systems that, um, uh, uh, so IoT systems are going to be combining different approaches, different AI approaches. If we don't have uh, explainability, we cannot assess what is happening across a large IoT system. We have to, to understand uh, and we have to have a consistent way of, of extracting uh, that explainability uh, across a large uh, scale system. And the edge devices are, are definitely uh, extremely relevant there. And then I want to, to kind of uh, point out this idea of collaborative learning versus collaborative security. And there is some contention between the two of them uh, in a way, because when we talk about uh, collaborative learning, um, just by itself, uh, there is uh, uh, there is a lot of work in uh, in that area, and there is a lot of work on edge devices. But it doesn't necessarily consider the uh, the security capability. So I think we have to start thinking uh, more and more about combining the two. So doing uh, doing learning and security at the same time, and just uh, see security as uh, as an intrinsic uh, part of all our AI approaches. And I will stop here and I'll invite my colleagues to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. Um, next, uh, we'll go to uh, Sek Chai, who is uh, the co-founder and CTO of Latent AI. Sek. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation and happy to, to be part of this uh, great symposium. Uh, looking forward to have a good discussion with the extreme uh, panelists. Um, again, uh, Sek Chai, uh, co-founder and CTO of Lean AI. Um, at Lean AI, we are um, a spin-out of uh, SRI International. I spent about 10 years uh, at SRI, uh, work on a lot of DARPA, DOD, even NSF type uh, work uh, as part of the nonprofit SRI. We built some technology, uh, we've sought some of this funding, and uh, I decided to kind of spin off the company from SRI from Lean AI. Uh, what do we do? Uh, we build tools to make uh, edge AI uh, efficient. Things that are being trained and targeted for the cloud doesn't have any resource constraint in a sense, right? You know, you plug into the wall and you have big, massive kind of uh, data centers supporting that, that inference workload uh, and you run billions of these jobs. When you get to the edge, we know that, um, you know, these devices are battery powered, they're small, they're constrained in a way. 
And so now training for accuracy is already hard. Training for accuracy and resource constraint is even harder. So we built tools to make that happen for folks to deploy uh, some of these things out. Uh, what I'd like to do is just share one slide. Sorry about that. Okay. And, um, and I want to kind of give the, the, the kind of audience a little bit about the perspective from the industry side of things, right? I can talk about research and research uh, perspective, but it's probably better to also see what's, what's going out there in the industry. I give that kind of context because, you know, I'm, I'm from industry from that perspective, right, as a startup. So things that we are looking at in terms of today, folks are really looking at building tools, infrastructure to build that single model to deploy to the edge, right? Uh, and that's where Lean AI is kind of sitting. We focus on quantization, pruning uh, on the ML side, and we have a, a compiler backend to kind of bring that definition, the graph representation into machine code that can run on different hardware. Uh, the hardware themselves are all heterogeneous. You have thing uh, uh, processors that are being developed, um, you know, NVIDIA, Intel, and a lot of different crops of hardware coming up that are specialized for AI workloads, right? There's a whole heterogeneous mix of things. And that becomes hard for, for programmers then, right? Uh, in order to get the best efficiency. So with great tooling, we hope to make that workflow a little bit more systematic, a little bit more robust, and it becomes an engineering uh, kind of task rather than a science black art kind of task, right? When you train and model and you want to deploy the edge, you want it to be consistent. And what we also see is that there's a transitioning from these AI services that are already in the cloud, you know, things that we rely today um, in terms of AI workload that's already in the cloud. And those are slowly transitioning into edge kind of devices, right? Things that we rely on like, uh, um, you know, your Google, uh, hello, Siri, those kind of wake up words and things like that are now transitioning right closer to the edge. Um, but what we also see is that it is not just an edge as a destination. We believe that there's more of an edge continuum where, um, you know, all of the inferences that, that you want to run on the edge may be in the infrastructure edge. It could be network gateways and things that could be running and also the sensor edge you know, these are the devices with the microphones and the cameras and things. So it's a, a, a whole continuum of edge devices, we would say, that could be running uh, a lot of different edge uh, inferences for you. Uh, so the tooling that we are thinking about really thinks about where you want to run all these kind of models. It's not just one destination, but actually a continuum of um, um, devices that could be run. So that's today. People are really focused on building infrastructure, deploying that single model, getting it out there, getting some um, solutions out to the consumers, right? But tomorrow, I think it will be more, a little bit more interesting because it's no longer that single model. Uh, you may have large systems with many different uh, devices running, uh, intelligent uh, AI models. Um, and you have to start thinking about how they are working together. You know, Gabrielle talked about you know, collaborative and things like that. That's gonna be important. Um, how do you know one model versus another, right? Uh, because it, do you trust the model where it came from? Was it trained on the type of data that you want? Is it unbiased? All those things becomes important because you no longer recognize uh, one model versus another because it's just set of weights. Today, if we make the model efficient, if we're compressing the model uh, with low footprint, uh, we have a choice to put uh, signatures in there, watermark signatures on the weights, for example. And then tomorrow, when these things are efficient, but also kind of um, labeled correctly, let's say, right? You can then track it, you know where it came from, you know how it's trained, um, you know the source of it, right? And you trust that model. So things that we built today, um, you know, the, all this infrastructure and things would be useful when tomorrow when there's a lot of these models running. So we think about uh, how these models are being adaptive, how it continuously run. And I think more importantly, these models are gonna be uh, live, live in a sense that it is not one model that uh, lives, but it's the life cycle of that model. That model will live and it may be moving from one device to another. That model may also be improving over time, right? So that's an instance of that model and that model is moving around to uh, different data pockets, data lakes and things like that. So how do you orchestrate that? How do you know that model is what you want to be updating? All those things becomes important, again, the trust uh, worthiness uh, thoughts that uh, Gabrielle talked about. 
Uh, and then I, I think, you know, it's more than just training that model. Today, we train a lot of models to understand features, to understand um, kind of scenes, object detection, those kind of things, some signatures within kind of raw signals. Uh, I think there will be a lot more interesting things to talk about where we think about context, meta learning and attention, right? So if you have a plethora of models, hundreds of these models running around, each one uh, may be trained for different scenarios, right? Uh, daytime, nighttime, uh, you know, snow uh, conditions versus uh, dry conditions and things like that. They are live models and running around. Um, how do you know which one to use when, right? In our biological system, we have contexts that we switch, right? Uh, Short-term or long-term memory. Um, and if we kind of use that biological uh, principles and say, you know, there's these models, but they are trained for different contexts. How do we switch them and when do you switch them? So these are the type of meta learning attention mechanisms where we think about uh, models that can be uh, moving in and out, right? And I think those would be interesting kind of topics, uh, things that we are looking into, right? As we build things for tomorrow, the, the large systems with you know a lot of edge models running around. So my, my research position is that there's a lot of good things that we can be doing, uh, federal learning being one of them, uh, a lot of work in uh, synthetic data generation, uh, unsupervised learning, those kind of things, right? And when I talk about synthetic data generation, you know, we know that when you train a young child, uh, you show it a few samples of, of uh, a dog and, you know, the child will recognize a dog, uh, you know, further on without more data. Today, we still train our, our kind of AI model in a way where uh, we show it a lot of samples of dogs, right? More than enough in all different aspect ratios, augmentation and things like that. And uh, there's a lot more ways, uh, better ways, I think, to train it. That could be with uh, synthetic data. Uh, it could be more unsupervised kind of uh, approaches, right? And that could supplement a lot of things that we could be doing in federal learning, not just one model, but many models, right? So I'll stop there um, so that um, we can have uh, other folks talk on it, but happy to, to talk uh, and, and chat a little bit more. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Sek. It was a uh, it was a very nice introduction and a uh, and a summary of research challenges facing the AI ecosystem uh, for the edge. Uh, we'll we'll move on to the next speaker. Next uh, is uh, Claire Tang, uh, who is a senior electronics engineer at the Air Force Research uh, Laboratory. Claire. Uh, I think Claire, you're muted. There we go. Sorry about that. We got the network issues here. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me see if I can share my slide here with you real quick as I uh, get going. Okay, can you see that? Not yet. Uh, one more chance, and if not, we'll just talk to it here. There we go. How's that? Yep. Okay. So, uh, real quick here, I'm... Uh, I bring to this panel, and by the way, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, participate in not only the symposium, but also uh, this panel session. Um, what I bring is my perspective of 34 years experience with a lot of different technologies, uh, both uh, and hands-on experience with, you know, in the lab itself, but also programmatic stuff and trying to help lead the push for getting um, hardware-based computational intelligence to the field. And I'm going to give you, you know, a perspective from um, what I've seen in the years and what's going on within my branch here. I'm a member of the uh, Air Force Research Labs Information Directorate, in particular the High Performance Systems Branch. And with that, we do a lot of computing stuff, both um, at all levels of the uh, fundamental research, applied research, and um, technology demonstration. Um, the teams I'm on are usually involved more with the fundamental research and early applied. Uh, but we do have people that go to uh, the next level and uh, develop that a little bit further. 
Um, and, you know, so we have this large neuromorph computing work. And from my side of the house, sir, what we tend to look at is non-traditional techniques, not the von Neumann uh, computing work. Um, you know, we can collect a lot of data, but we can't process it well. So we're looking at non-traditional approaches, and we're targeting more of the size, weight, and power-constrained environments on it there. What can we do with the hardware um, and to come up with more efficient computing, more energy efficiency, more computational efficiency? And that's where we see, if you look at uh, the right hand of the chart under neuromorphic computing, you know, we talk about spike encoding to get some energy efficiency. Um, and then also, you know, how can we use the technology to uh, get around uh, can I, the... Uh, can I interrupt yep. you? I, I, I don't think we can see your slides moving, uh, your presentation. We, we just see your, your slide deck. Okay. Let me see what we got going here. So you're seeing that slide? Yes. Is that, yes. that you're seeing? Okay, you're not seeing the other one. Okay, let's just, let me blow this out then. We'll do it this way. How's that? Yep. Okay. Second here. There we go. So on the right-hand side there, we have the neuromorphic computing. We, we can't uh, see your slides again. You can or cannot? Oh, we cannot. Oh, boy. Huh. Yep. We can. Oh, okay. Now. My apologies, folks. Um, so on the neuromorph computing side, as I was saying, we tend to go for the uh, energy efficiency from the spike encoding, and then also the using non-traditional approaches, try to get away from the um, the memory bottleneck and uh, you know going after low input and output power requirements and that for it there. The work we do is sort of broken into uh, the three areas shown at the bottom. Yeah, the neuromorph processor, um, that's on looking at people within the branch, sometimes our team, sometimes we look at both commercial um, technologies and technologies coming out of small businesses. Um, to look at that and um, you know we have uh, some team members here not my particular uh, group though that have worked with IBM True North we are working with the uh, Loihi um, Intel Loihi processor and the next generation that's coming out but then we're also doing you know work with other technologies uh, a lot of emphasis on the memristor technology right now to come up with new uh, neuromorphic computing um, architectures and that's where it leads into the second um, area there with non-electronics and optics. You know, we try to use the physics of devices to exploit their operation to do the computing for us and to get some of that efficiency we're looking for. You know, so part of the challenge is how do you start implementing some of the models and algorithms in hardware uh, to get the ideal benefits from them? Um, and so there, you know, which goes to the next part of understanding the models and some of these algorithms in order to implement them. Um, in you know the hardware itself so we can take the technology from the field or from the i should say from the laboratory and get it into the field and part of this you know goes in there we use a variety of funding um some of it within internal uh, air force funding and other side, times outside of it um if we have gaps in some of our knowledge on our team or we don't have the manpower to look at different technologies we do use things such as summer faculty faculty fellowship programs to help um, others uh, look at either optics or uh, magnetics or spintronics and that um, when we can't do that and help us understand their strengths and weaknesses and the potential um, for that technology to help us achieve advanced computing for the uh, air and space forces. Let's see if we get this advanced. Can you see that change? Yep. Okay, so um, what we've uh, recently become involved with is um, one of my hats I wear now as Air Force Program Manager for, uh, it's called the Tri-Service Neuropipe ARAP program. And what we're doing with that is um, a few things. We are taking some of the Air Force investment and sharing it with the other services so they can train up people in memristive technology 
um, leveraging what their Air Force has learned from their investment, um, and to also take the technology and um, help it evolve to where it can become a fuelable technology and be more than just something that can be done in the lab by the developers itself. So we're trying to make the environment more robust, um, trying to get the process design kit um, optimized so that we can uh, exploit. Um, in our case there, we're using uh, into a 65 nanometer CMOS process and then train up new government folks to be experts in the technology and help guide you know, the future investment in it and the future research uh, direction. And, um, you know, so what we see on the top part of the slide is, you know, some of the reasoning based off the ARAP program and this in general about um, what we'd like to have is some on-chip learning. Um, and in doing that, we also try to uh, tap into what others are doing, uh, both within a, um, Air Force Office of Scientific Research and also DARPA, you know, such as their um, lifelong learning machines. Uh, program and that's something we are actually tapped into right now and um, have a single effort of actually with uh, Professor Kuth Pudi. I'm trying to see what we can do in hardware uh, with some of those principles and some of the concepts that she gleaned uh, from involvement in that technology. But as I said earlier on, we're trying to, for us on the DOD side, we're looking at can we do some of these operations in these size, weight, and power constrained hardware platforms independent of the cloud you know what happens when we you know break down we our communication link gets severed we're in a um, denied environment can we still perform a mission and the other thing is you know the size weight and power constrained environments while um, part of our group on looking at the uh, more advanced technology demonstration do look at small footprint gpus because they are available now um, but power wise they still require um, too much energy than too much energy than we like to deal with, so um, we try to look you know use the current technology to help us scope future systems and guide the technology that was coming down the pipeline. And uh, part of the thing is I've been around long enough to where I've seen things move from where the Department of Defense at one time was a driver of electronics um, the research and development to where now we have to really um, be aware of what's going on in the commercial industry because the commercial industry is what's driving it. Um, you know, as it, the bottom bullet says there, you know, we're more of the boutique uh, market there. We just don't have, uh, you know, the necessarily the budgets or the volume to uh, compete with the com commercial market. But at times, our needs are a little bit different. So how do we um, work between uh, our needs, availability, and then get what the warfighter needs to do their job efficiently? And then my last slide here, um, one of the aspects of the uh, Neuropipe ARAP program, uh, when we work with the different um, research laboratories, the Army and the Navy, you know, they have different materials they want to try to do. Uh, we have different concepts, but then we have to uh, deal with the challenge of the integration. How do you actually take that off the lab bench, get into the field? And there's several different ways to do that. Um, and that's shown in the bottom there, and there's pros and cons of each one. And part of that is the speed of the operation you're going to be able to get um, on the performance of the systems, depending on how you do that integration. If you're trying to hook up some new technology, just tra uh, traditional PCB boards, it's going to be a little bit slower. If you can start exploiting into a CMOS line or putting stuff on afterwards, you can get a little more speed. But then if we can exploit the materials that are already available in the standard fabrication lines, then we can get the best of all the worlds. We do not have to have uh, invest in uh, new fabrication processes, um, but we also get more speed uh, for what we want to do. But now we also have the challenge, you know, that comes up now is how do we work with these um, environments or with this technology in these new environments and um, get back to, if you want to say, what is the proper way to bring these into the field? What is the right learning environment? And, and in this particular setting, we're going to hear more about federated learning. Um, and I tend to lean more toward of, I want to have the right tools in the toolbox, but in order to do that, you have to know how to use those tools. Um, and so I think one of the challenges, which we'll probably talk a little bit later, is understanding the pros and cons of the different approaches, especially when we deal with the size, weight, and power-constrained environments. You know, on the commercial side, it's um, 
you know, the Internet of Things on the, you know, more the government and military side, it's the computing at the edge when you're into the actual battle space. How do we do it there and keep the mission going forward? Um, and with that, I think I will uh, turn it over to the next panel member. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. That was uh, that was a really great introduction um, and, and a summary of uh, all the all the needs, especially from a Department of Defense perspective. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, we'll move to William Severa, who is a researcher uh, with the Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, William. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm William, as was mentioned. Uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me and having me here. Um, I just wanted to uh, show a few slides that sort of have, um, you know, basic ideas or concepts of, on, on my perspective for, uh, for AI at the edge. Um, can everybody see that? Okay. So um, just a quick, quick background on me. Um, I'm a mathematician. I'm in cognitive and emergent computing at Sandia. Um, but basically what that means is I work primarily on uh, resource constrained AI algorithms and mapping to uh, neural inspired embedded hardware platforms, right? And um, some, you know, spiking neuromorphic systems as well. Um, so that's that's where, where I'm coming from and what my perspective is. Um, and you know, just to, to reiterate, um, I think the upshot, um, the upside for edge AI is, is absolutely immense, right? Um, AI and deep learning have, have worked themselves into many corners across industry and government right now, but sort of true deployable edge AI is still, um, still not quite there, right? And you know, I've listed a, a few uh, sort of applications that I think are really interesting. Um, but, you know, for example, the, the one in the middle here, this is a, a SAR image taken from a satellite showing the displacement of soil after volcanic eruption. And right now, you know, processing and analyzing this has to happen um, in the data center on the ground. But um, you can imagine how much more beneficial it would be if we could do this, you know, in real time on a satellite, um, you know, at, at, at low size weight and power, as Claire was talking about. So. Um, but, you know, like I said, we're not there yet. And I think the reality of things is that we're hitting diminishing returns in a lot of aspects. Um, first is that traditional computing is, is hitting a stagnation point. Claire talked about this a little bit. And a lot of smart people are working on, you know, non-traditional ways of computing. From uh, someone who works on algorithms primarily, uh, there's also an algorithm challenge that we're not seeing. So there was this really interesting uh, result uh, last year, Thompson et al. Uh, collected uh, different neural network models from the literature, a couple hundred of them, and basically found there's this relationship between accuracy and computation. Um, so the higher accuracy, the higher computational load, and this is despite all the advances that we've had recently in, in auto ML, neural architecture search, quantization, things like that. Um, and then you know, the takeaway here is that for high consequence decision making, right, the really interesting applications where your decision matters, you can't sacrifice accuracy for, for, for performance. So, um, you know, if you look at the relationship and you're, you're, you're wanting a really high accuracy system, um, unless something changes about this picture, you're going to pay for in power, which is untenable, right? So we either need hardware that can do it or we need, um, you know, advances algorithmically or deployment wise that, that, that are sort of, um, you know, considerably better, right? And I think that's sort of my main point here is that I don't think incremental change is gonna be enough to change that picture to the point where we can do all the things we wanna do. And in particular, I think that there are challenges in uncertainty, um, communication, generalization, uh, security and privacy, all these topics need um, advances that, that we're gonna to have to really think out of the box from. And, you know, I work every day with neural inspired computer hardware. And so I'm sort of drinking the Kool-Aid that biology has a lot to offer in this aspect. Um, I think both on the hardware and algorithm side, um, you know, from the keynote and, and, and more than that, spike neuromorphic hardware um, has a lot of benefits. But I'm gonna also say that if we have good ideas, it doesn't really matter where they come from, right? As long as we get, um, 
to where we want to go. So uh, that was just a quick whirlwind of my perspective, and I'm really excited to talk to, to with, with the panel and everybody else. So thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, William. It was a, a great summary. Um, so basically, now we'll go to the, the, the fun part of the panel, uh, the questions. Uh, and so all the attendees, uh, please get ready with your questions. Uh, we'll try to alternate questions between our in-person attendees and virtual attendees. Um, uh, so, so let me kick off the discussion uh, with uh, a question of my own, and then you know we'll move on to other questions. And uh, panelists, feel free to jump in. Uh, as you as you feel uh, suitable to answer the question, uh, so my 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 first question to the panel is: uh, What do you see as the main AI ML challenge uh, in the edge computing paradigm? Especially keeping in mind the IoT uh, 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 the IoT devices that that have proliferated over the past uh, decade or so. Uh, so this clear. I'll I'll take a shot right out the beginning. Um, I think for us, it's it's understanding what the real realistic expectations are for the hard, you know, for in our case, how we when we deploy the hardware, what can we actually do when we get out in the environment? You know, we deal with our model simulation. Usually, there's some ideal states involved with that, and um, trying to really get a handle on, you know, how many neurons do you actually need for the problem and all that stuff, and how does that vary from problem to problem is a really big challenge still. Um, I think anybody that gets introduced to uh, artificial intelligence when we see visitors in that end and one of their questions is well how large of a system do we need and um unfortunately we don't have a good answer to that yet um to this day that's really difficult over thank you uh, I, I totally agree with you, Claire. One other thing that I'm also seeing, what, what I was mentioning earlier, this explainability. Um, if, we are, if we have large IoT networks, which will be the case and is already the case, uh, not everything is uh, done consistently. So um, making a system work when uh, you don't have consistency in how uh, uh, the, the methods that are used, the devices that are used, is a big, big challenge, right? We have a, a highly heterogeneous uh, system that we have to operate on, and it's uh, it's quite um, it, it's quite a challenge. And then I will mention yet again the the trustworthiness, like um, and the transparency of uh, what is happening in the network. That transparency can also be used by attackers. So uh, we have a we have a dual uh, uh, role that uh, we need to 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 tackle, making making the networks more transparent, more explainable, but still um, not enabling attackers to take advantage of those. I can go next, and I can think I'll add to to what the panels are saying. Um, certainly, you know, heterogeneous kind of hardware, uh, heterogeneous environments; those things are, are challenging. I think, uh, from an industry perspective, expectations I think is is the clear thing, right? People are expecting things that are running on the cloud today to magically run on a small edge device, right? Things that are running at hundred megawatts or whatever in nanowatts, right? So that that's never going to happen. Um, in a sense that you know you can't transform it right away. You need to find other ways, other solutions, right? And this is the, the type of research that we're working on. Uh, it's the collection of these edge devices that collectively work well, rather than one central location, right? How do you then deal with the distributed nature and things like that? Uh, trustworthy and, and security, those are important. But guess what? The industry is not going to pay directly for it, right? You go and ask, hey, you know, I have this great security stuff. Uh, would you like to buy it? Uh, how much does it cost? I like to buy it for free, right? Um, so that never is going to happen until something happens, something drastic happens. Then, then you need to change it. So a little bit of education, a little bit of kind of prompting from my end to build the necessary foundation such that it is there, right? Uh, nobody's going to ask for it until it's too late. So those kind of things uh, with respect to expectations. I think uh, we as, as ac academics, we as industry participants kind of need to push a little bit of that. So that's my comment. Um, I'll, I'll add with, with expectations, there's also, um, you know, everybody wants to have their cake and eat it too, right? So a lot of the challenges that we're talking about with, with trust, explainability, you know, they come at a cost of accuracy and power, right? 
And so, so balancing all that to, to sort of maintain expectations, no matter who, you know, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, a customer or, you know, a, an agency or, or what have you, um, you know, I, I think that's, it's a challenge to keep all that in balance. I think great points, uh, explainability, um, expectations, balance. Uh, thank you very much, panel. It, it, you know, wonderful points. I have a question from the audience uh, and I'm going to read it out. Uh, what communication protocols are currently used for agents on the edge? Uh, which ones are being considered for nearby? I would expect NFC or Bluetooth uh, wireless, but what about uh, I'm assuming large distances? Uh, I would assume uh, the expectation would be that each agent or node in the system has to be able to broadcast to all neighbors. And we know there are limitations. Uh, this is where quantum entanglement may help 15 or 20 years. Uh, thoughts. That was a long question, but I, I hope. <laughs> uh, so who wants to take that? I'll start, I'll start from the industry perspective and then uh, I have yeah. the, the, the more academic quali qualify that. Um, industry is not thinking quantum right now, <laughs> except <laughs> for the, the, the things that do for computation, right? Not for entanglement, for communication, things like that. The interesting thing about these uh, distributed edge uh, devices is there is some notion of um, autonomy that the, the edge devices are running by themselves but you still need to be collective, right? You need to have at least some smarts among these uh, nodes and therefore there's some collaboration needed and collaboration then needs some communication. So you have to trade off some level of communication. And I think the industry is looking at say, how can you reduce the amount of computation such that you know, you're you not always broadcasting data around, you're at least being smart about sending the right type of thing. So, uh, and you're communicating uh, inference results and things like that, right? So minimize the communication so that you save the power for the actual computation that you need. Uh, I think what's interesting, at least in the near term, is the uh, 5G kind of collaboration, right? You're gonna have 5G kind of services that at least gives you some level of, uh, you know, from a distance perspective, from a communication perspective, the ability to kind of handle, um, you know, a lot more uh, larger kind of systems, right? Not just Bluetooth, near distance, uh, not even Wi-Fi kind of range, but you know, really city-wide or kind of sector-wide uh, kind of rollout. I think that will be coming near term. Uh, and with that, you could do quite a lot of things, right, from an industry perspective. Now, you, you need to go further, then, then you think about maybe quantum things. I, I think that from an industry perspective, a little bit further out, uh, but I'll let the, the other panelists talk. So I can, I can chime in a little bit. Um... And this is this is just from my my perspective. Um, I, I mean, I agree for uh, the sentiment on quantum. Like, I I, I haven't, um, you know, we're I'm not looking at that too much. I, I would say that we're not looking at that too much, but there could be things I'm not aware of. Um, but you know, it really depends on you know the type of agents you're talking about and and the deployment scenarios, right? And, and what fits. Um, it's very different if you're talking about um, you know something that's going to be in a house or on a car versus something that's going to be on a satellite or, you know, a, a drone or under the ocean, right? So um, all of these have, have different challenges. And, you know, sometimes that's, you know, uh, you know using, using radio or microwave or, or uh, laser communication, like these are all options. Um, but I would say that one thing that is, is important to, to emphasize is that in a lot of these applications, communication bandwidth is a huge bottleneck. Um, so, you know, it, in your day-to-day -day life, you're like, oh, well, maybe my cell signal's not great, you know, so on, so on. But, you know, th there are definitely deployed systems where you're measuring bandwidth still in like bits and kilobits, right? And like, that's much harder, especially when you talk, start talking about very high fidelity sensors and having to wait you know, you, you you sense at a high at a high fidelity, then you have to downsample, and then you have to wait. And you know, there's this bandwidth bottleneck that happens in a lot of different application areas. So, um, it is definitely a challenge. And let me add to that challenge that there are now uh, more and more uh, battery-less devices, and those are very nice devices because they they can be uh, they can instrument systems very easily, but then they come with a 
downside of the battery less uh, part, which means that uh, they are uh, very, uh, very, uh, they, they have very low power um, uh, radio. So then their communications are even more limited and they require certain ways of uh, actually uh, producing energy, right? By uh, uh, using temperature uh, uh, and other types of uh, physical uh, uh, changes that can help them charge. So all of those are, are even more interesting. I don't even know how and when AI will be able to run in uh, these battery uh, uh sensors, but they are definitely extremely, extremely important for, uh, for versatile uh, systems. I'm, I'm thinking also for Claire's uh, uh, type of environments, right? Where you want to, to instrument a, an area very quickly to collect information and then uh, remove it very quickly. And those types of devices are highly uh, uh, flexible. Thank you. I think the, those were you know, very interesting points. Uh, I want to give an opportunity uh, to folks in the audience, if anyone has question in person who are attending. I'm sorry, I can't see because of the glare. Does anyone have any questions for the, the panel? Are there any unique considerations for security um, given that uh, for AI devices? So the question, uh, let me repeat, are there any unique considerations for security um, uh, uh, you know, for AI on edge uh, devices? There are a lot of security considerations when we talk about federal, uh, federated learning. I think uh, people have been studying a lot. There are uh, papers that are looking at the different types of attacks. There are papers that are um, uh, looking at taxonomies of, uh, of the attacks. And uh, for example, there was uh, one paper last year um, uh, at UCSD that was uh, uh, putting together the different types of attacks in terms of uh, security and privacy. There are, uh, we have two angles that we have to keep in mind. So the usual suspects for the uh, for the security side are data, data poisoning and model poisoning attacks. And then the usual suspects for privacy are uh, model inversion, uh, membership inference, and uh, uh, ways in, uh, in which we can reconstruct uh, the attacks. Um, so all of that, um, uh, all of uh, that uh, work uh, has also identified different types of mitigations. And people are now looking more and more at uh, differential privacy for the edge, particularly. So that's kind of uh, like a new area that uh, uh, is explored at the moment and uh, uh, people are continuing to, to think in terms of uh, edge specific uh, mitigations when we, when we talk about federated learning uh, issues. Yeah, if um, I might put in, you know, one of the things uh, we talk about locally here, we do have a, a group that works uh, cyber issues and that, we always talk about the resiliency of the system, but one of the concerns is with um, these smaller hardwares as we develop them to go out to the edge and all that stuff is that we're not opening an access point to the system, you know, and causing, you know, introducing a, you know, a path to for threats to get in. Um, so that's a real major one. I think from my personal point of view, from uh, security and all that stuff, uh, we try to do stuff with home systems is, you know, it, you're always scratching your head of what information is actually being collected. And do you have some insight of what's going off? You know, when you, you keep on plugging these things into your, uh, you know, your system, even on a home system, you know, what information is going where? And that, that's just, you know, as you plug things in, take things off the system, how does that change? Over. I can, I can add a little bit more. Um, you know, um, there's a lot of models out there uh, that people curate pre-train, right? So, you, uh, you know, developers, the, you know, in the industry, download these models, uh, you know, for object detection, people are trained on ImageNet, you know, Coco data set, whatever, right, for object detection. And then they put it onto deploy systems, right? And, and you start to buy them in consumer products, right? They happen to detect very well because, you know, uh, academics like us, we put these great models out there. Uh, over the long run, uh, people start downloading these models and you deploy them, but you have no idea where it came from. Mm -hmm. Do you really know uh, that model really uh, should be there? Uh, was it trained accordingly? Uh, do we trust that, uh, that model? I, I don't think we know that. I don't think people have at least consider, you know, that security aspect, not just the security of the device. Of the device. Yes, and there's 
things, but the actual model themselves, where did they come from? I think that that is a, a, a kind of the issue that we, we need to kind of address, right? Yeah, the, the idea of a Trojan, right? Embedded into one of the models that will, oh, suddenly it will not detect uh, uh, that uh, exactly. you, are, you are in your car and it's not going to detect the divider on the highway. Exactly. How do you know car. that exact moment? Because yeah. it's been trained or, you know, like you said, Trojan to do that. A lot of the AI models are statistics, right? Statistical models. So it's not going to fail, uh, you know, statistically it fails the same way, but not exact moment. So how do you know it's not trained for that exact moment where it would fail? How do you guarantee yeah. that? And that comes to the trustworthy side, right? How do you uh, ensure the model is trained as it is? There's a lot of good research on understanding uh, from a quantization perspective. If you've done shrink the model, you have less of an attack surface because there are less bits. So that's interesting things. Uh, this work of, around uh, encryption of the model themselves. So those are uh, kind of good things to kind of push forward, but it needs to be on deployed system so that um, it is is not just that one node, it's the collection of it. Right? You don't want a catastrophic failure across uh, the number of devices that, uh, that you deploy. Yeah, what you were saying earlier, uh, removing parts of the model that comes with a downside of the accuracy. We are always fighting uh, different, right? You, you lose some of the accuracy. You do, you do. And, yeah. and back to William's point, right, where I, I think that, yes, th there are going to be accuracy and power trade-offs, but you, you set the expectations differently, right? Yeah. For example, we work with a, a customer that has a big model on the cloud. So 1,000 classes, you could do everything. But when you put on the edge, you say, well, I need to detect that 1,000 classes. Uh, but maybe the context tells you differently that you know in that situation that you have, you only need to have 10. And how do you run that model in a small kind of sliver, right? How do you then uh, minimize the attack surface because you're not, you know that the situation tells you you only deal with that 10 classes. Those kind of things will be important. Mm -hmm. Fantastic points, guys. Uh, one last question uh, uh, from, from the audience online. Um, through a project sponsored from the UTSA matrix uh, using Google's AIY camera, I was able to run some AI calculations on Raspberry Pi, but I had to stay plugged in. The computational task can be compressed, but not uh, the power supply. I understand UTS students are also working on harnessing um, electron spin for power generation. So um, I'm assuming that's that's basically more of a comment, but I, I, you know, computational, I think the power issues, something that you guys probably mentioned and discussed before, um, so, okay, here comes the question. <laughs> uh, what would you consider the most essential to achieving an edge IoT learning network? Uh, I'm noticing wonderful qualities like security, accuracy, robustness, all needed, but what if all can't be achieved in one device? So, you know, it's kind of, again, uh, going back on the balance question. I think we cannot talk in general terms. There will be certain systems with certain criticalities. Identifying what is critical for a system and then solving for that problem is, uh, is uh, important. So uh, for example, uh, when we are talking about home devices versus a car, uh, there is a different level of criticality. Even if attackers have uh, done uh, horrible thinking, you know, horrible things uh, inside the homes taking over um, uh, cameras taking over uh, devices uh, for babies and so forth and scaring kids and doing all sorts of things. Still, uh, there is the, the higher criticality when we are talking about a car, uh, when we are talking about a car where uh, somebody's life can, uh, can be lost. So I think that, ba that balance comes from, uh, from understanding the systems, from understanding the requirements and the expectations like Zach is uh, mentioning. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, it was a wonderful panel. I really would like to uh, you know, give a huge round of applause to uh, our our panelists who took the time out uh, to join us and you know gave their uh, insightful comments on this really important problem. And thank you, everyone, for attending uh, both in person and virtual. Uh, uh, and one last oh, one last question. Okay, I'm sorry, I I couldn't see. <laughs> All right, we have a question. Uh, sorry, guys. There's been a lot of talk about yeah. uh, the accuracy versus power, uh, but I didn't hear uh, very much about uh, AI logistics and how that goes into managing at the edge. You know, how much time you have to spend to update to keep these models intact. So, uh, well, 
were you able to hear the question? Can you repeat it? Uh, not clearly. Okay. Uh, so can we repeat the question again, please? Uh, so a lot of questions have been around space and power and, and dealing with that and the fact that you can't have very robust models. Uh, how do you look at AI logistics and the logistics of managing those models being able to overcome? I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll address it in one way. I'll try to be short. I want William, Claire, Gabriel to also kind of have some, some time in. Um, I think what we ought to do is not worry about uh, necessarily one particular peak solution that solves everything. I think the answer to all of this is adaptivity, right? That you can adapt. Us humans, right? We are, we're not best in everything, right? We don't run the fastest, we don't swim the fastest, but we take care of everything and we can adapt to different scenario. The fact that you can explain problems and then solve it later, uh, find out um, why it's optimal in a certain condition and adapt to it. Attackers are hard to uh, find a solution if you are not uh, stationary, right? And I think we need to think about that as, as a way to solve these things, that you always not have to have one optimal peak point, but you can move around. And the, the fact that you are moving around makes it hard for security perspective, from explainability perspective, all those kinds of things. Yeah, I, I think that those comments hit right on the head. Um, I don't think there is a one solution that's going to solve everybody's problems for applications. That's why I mentioned earlier about having a tube bag with a you know a bunch of tools in it. Um, and then you, you're going to have to look at it on an individual need basis. Like I said, the DOD side would probably be different than what the commercial side is going to need. So over. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and so I think we will end the panel over here. Um, thanks again, everyone. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll see you again for the next uh, for the next talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amina Anklip. I'm the director of the UTSA UT Health Joint Graduate Group in Biomedical Engineering and an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at UTSA. I'm also a research thrust lead for the research thrust augmenting human performance in the AI Matrix Consortium. It's my great pleasure to introduce our plenary speaker, Zachary Chase Lipton. Dr. Lipton is the VP Junior Chair, Assistant Professor of Operations Research and Machine Learning at Carnegie Mellon University and a visiting scientist at Amazon AI. He received his master's and PhD in computer science from the University of California, San Diego, and his bachelor's in economics and mathematics from Columbia University. Dr. Lipton directs the proximally correct machine intelligence lab at CMU, the ACME lab, and focuses on machine learning methods, applications to clinical medicine, automation, and natural language processing. His um, focus areas more recently have been on robustness, decision-making, causal thinking, and practical high-dimensional settings that resist causal models and ethical AI. Dr. Lipton, looking forward to your presentation. Uh, great, thanks for thanks for the nice introduction. Can everybody hear me? Maybe that is a... Yes. All right, great. So um, thanks, so I'll be, uh, I'll kind of cast a wider net in the beginning of the talk. Thanks, I'll be, I'll kind of, all right, um, and then kind of zero in on some specific work, uh, a particular line of research that we call um, a method that we call counterfactually augmented data that I think is um, maybe like a, um, not necessarily like a panacea for, for all the problems that I'm gonna set up, but maybe a, a nice window into like uh, the, the shape of a solution strategy. Um, so to, to start off, I guess set it up with, you know, just saying a little bit, and I guess the introduction already said something about my interest, but, you know, I just sort of say at a high level, something about, um, the kind of problems that interest us and excite us in our lab. So I run, I run this lab that we call the approximately correct machine intelligence lab. And, uh, the sort of obvious, uh, sense in which the name is, uh, machine learning nerd reference is that the sort of foundational theory for describing learning algorithms 
uh, you know, statistical learning is usually based on some notion of probably approximately correct type solutions that you, you never sort of look at some data and say, here's the exact, here's the answer, but you say, here's a classifier that with high probability is not, you know, that does not make mistakes more than, you know, a small amount of the time. Um, so that's the obvious reference, but for us, it's, it's kind of a pun. Um, the, 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 the maybe more salient sense for us in which machine learning is approximately correct is that we're almost never actually solving the problem we care about. What we do is we go out into the world and we, uh, we look at, you know, real problems, real decisions that need to be made, real kind of behaviors where we don't know how to program them. And then we think, um, sort of how can I fashion a toy data science problem where the solution to that problem might somehow be useful for this real world scenario. And in that process of translating a real problem into, um, you know, a, a toy data science problem, and by toy, I don't just mean like, you know, three variables in a causal diagram or something. I mean, the entirety of everything we do in machine learning being in some sense toy relative to uh, the real world, we, we square off and we just hack off all the little bits that we don't know how to deal with. And this includes we, we, we develop technology which is fundamentally sort of premised on the idea that we're in a static world when it's actually changing. We uh, forget that at the end of the day, basically if, if you wanted to change anything or you wanted to improve anything, which is presumably the reason why you had made some kind of investment in technology, the reason is because you wanted to make some kind of decision. Like the only way that uh, technology is going to somehow make, whether it's, you know, a company more profitable or, a, you know, a, a military more effective or a public agency more efficient. Um, the only way that happens is if you've somehow made a decision differently than you otherwise would have. Otherwise, it doesn't matter what, you know, patterns you've picked up if you don't do anything based on that. And this part, like doing, we, we, we sort of always forget about. So, you know, we have this combination of simplifications that we make. We assume the world is static when it's actually dynamic. We assume the world that, you know, uh, it, it's enough to solve some little prediction problem and hope that, you know, magic dust will close this gap that we will just be able to sort of heuristically throw predictive models into uh, decision-making pipelines and things will just work. And, you know, it's just uh, the real world, uh, you know, God is not so naive and is not so easily taken in. And so I think, you know, we, they, there's a price to be paid. And I think you're seeing this over and over again play out as people sort of sometimes forget that this gap is there and they deploy these naive solutions and, and they either break or they turn out to be brittle or they turn out to degrade in accuracy or they turn out to be embarrassing or they turn out to um, another important sense in which there's this divergence of uh, capability versus like, actual need um, is in the incorporation of various societal desiderata that are often not represented in the data set or not easy to quantify, but are things that we care about. Um, like if you're, if you're the training a machine learning system, because the idea is you want to uh, make better hiring decisions. Well, it's like in the first place, but you never modeled the fact that you were making decisions and that what you cared about was not predicting how well someone would perform under the old policy, but what would happen if you substituted a counterfactual policy. There's also the fact that you need to consider what are like valid basis for making hiring decisions in uh, with respect to ethical considerations, with respect to notions of say procedural fairness, et cetera. So we kind of zero in on all these situations. And sometimes this takes the form of, you know, something that looks more like moral and political philosophy on the side of addressing these societal desiderata. Often it takes the form of something that looks more like statistical theory on the side of figuring out precisely under what circumstances can you actually build robust technology? Um, or, or you know, how do we estimate causal effects in the kinds of data regimes that we find ourselves in in the deep learning world, um, which is you know, complex high dimensional data where a lot of the traditional causal machinery breaks down. Um, and so you know, for us, like, we, we, we like to sit in this area and uh, you know, explore the, the, the chasm between, between what we're doing and what we, what we say we're doing. Um, and so, um, you know, for us, healthcare is an important motivating application because the, it's, it's harder to sweep the consequences under the rug. Um, I think it's easy for people to look at recommending products and, you know, they say, well, let's just predict blah, 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 and then we'll sort the items according to the score. And then we'll just recommend that. And if you say to someone that's what's well, the wrong way to do it, they'll say, well, who are you to say what's the wrong way to do it? Why don't, you know, what, why does it matter at all? It's like, if, 
know, we'll just try it and see if we make money. What's wrong with that? Um, in, in the case of healthcare, if you if you start suggesting you should give somebody a treatment other than standard of care, and you don't actually have any reason to believe that it's going to make them better off versus kill them, um, you know, it's a little bit it's a little bit more immediate, and it maybe it's just personal values. I care more about the outcome. Um, so you know that's that's one kind of setting, and then as an additional modality, we 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 were also just very often, I think, just fascinated by language. I think, for 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 how messy the field of natural language processing is, I still feel in some sense it's it's where the action is. It's how it's how we communicate almost everything, and so surely it's going to be a key part of how we communicate with computers. And um, thinking about you know you know how we how we map some of these ideas into that domain. So so I'll I'll kind of get a little bit more concrete now. Um, all right, so the backdrop to this all is, uh, you know, we're all kind of living in the wake of this uh, sort of like bombshell moment of uh, deep learning kind of bursting onto the scenes in 2012, 2013, with uh, a set of capabilities that we didn't have before. And, you know, we have these huge data sets, we have um, large, you know, uh, sort of, sort of uh, uh, like a fundamentally transformed compute landscape with the introduction of GPUs in there adaptation to uh, training deep learning models. And there's sort of this fascination of like, what can we do with this? And already rushing out to deploy it. And at the same time, you know, um, you know, there's this way when you get really good at one thing that you forget that there are other things in the world. Like you almost think that like, oh, if we just keep pushing on this one thing, it'll solve all of our problems. Like if I only build a faster car, maybe I'll get to the moon as opposed to like, I'll just circle the world faster. Um, and so we, you know, we, 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 what we, what we witnessed was a, a huge leap in predictive accuracy and it's not just predictive accuracy in any old, you know, to, to any setting that we could conceivably encounter. It's predictive accuracy when we evaluate our models on randomly partitioned holdout data. So that's a fairly restrictive setting. It's, it's never the setting in which we're actually deploying models. And so we started to see all kinds of settings in which this technology breaks down. Um, one well-known example is the case of the adversarial examples, where it turns out that um, even when you don't change the underlying measure, so you have the same probability distribution over the images, the same test set, all you do is allow it to be composed. So you just focus your attention on the push forward of that measure through some threat model. So, you know, usually these like L2 or L infinity uh, constrained attacks that you're able to reduce these you know, otherwise astounding models to the level of random guessing. And that, you know, while we're making some progress, you know, there were, there was years of people just kind of saying, well, what if we, what if we make the network noisy? What if we just add a discriminator? What if we encode our data this way or that way? You know, sort of a lot of like, uh, you know, masking tape and popsicle sticks and uh, silly putty type solutions. We're starting to get to the point of people's understanding some of the fundamental contours of this problem and actually even providing certificates, but they're, they're pretty bad. We're actually, our robust accuracies for the best models that say ImageNet scale are, are, are not good enough that you would, uh, you would ever wanna stake your lives on them. So like that's one example of, of, of the ways that you know, these models are kind of limited. Um, it's not just limited to uh, images. So in my lab, we had a paper at ACL a couple of years back with my student, uh, Danish Pruthi, um, and our uh, good collaborator, Boan Dingra, who's now faculty at Duke. And um, we showed that uh, this sort of weakness, you know, in, in text, there's no such thing as an imperceptible change, but there are changes that couldn't conceivably change the meaning of a passage. And one example of this is if you introduce a sort of benign spelling mistake. Like you uh, just, you limit yourself to looking at words that have at least five characters and you look only at the internal characters and all you're allowed to do is pick two adjacent characters and swap them with each other. Um, it turns out even with such limited threat models, you're still able to identify perturbations for uh, each passage that, you know, um, hurt the model such that you could take a state-of-the-art BERT model and bring it down from 90 something percent performance to uh, below the perform, like even worse than random guessing. And if you're allowed to make two character attacks then you can, you know, destroy it almost all the way. So, um, right, this is a sort of a widespread problem that like we, you know, we're, we're sort of limited, you know, and I think there's a lot of confused discussion about this. You know, I think this is an area where uh, we're in this weird area where the, the theorists are sort of walled out from what's going on in deep learning, or they're sort of getting into it on, on one side. And we have a bunch of people in deep learning who are, 
really good at this process of fit the test data, but don't really know how to talk in a principled way about these kinds of out of distribution attacks. And among other things, people describe this as overfitting the test set, but you're not overfitting the test set. You're doing just fine on the actual test set. This model generalizes both these models to unseen data, what they fall apart on is in a very plausible scenario, a non-ID IID scenario, but in a very plausible one, which is, you know, spell stack checks have been introduced or someone made, you know, little edits, you know, like things that it seems that they would fool no human. And so it's unsatisfying that they fool the model, but it's, it's not a failure. It's not a failure of overfitting, not in the traditional sense of overfitting to the finite samples that you've seen. This is a problem, a much deeper problem. Even if you've seen an infinite amount of data from the source distribution, you still have this problem, which is under what conditions can you extrapolate to a different distribution? You know, if I see examples in distribution P, what gives me any right to think that I could generalize the distribution Q? Um, in my lab, we've looked not just at these kinds of adversarial examples, which are cute, but I think they're, you know, only some portion of what we care about, you know, among other things, it's a very limited threat. It's just one threat model. Like you, you solve L2 attacks. All you need to do is say, okay, they're allowed to do an L2 attack plus they're allowed to rotate the image one degree. Okay, now all of a sudden all the models break again. We've looked at some kind of, you know, models that are based more on causal structure. So for example, um, dealing with the problem of label shift. Label shift is uh, the problem that the, the, the label distribution could change, but we assume the class condition will stay still. And then the, in this case, if you have a bunch of unlabeled data from the target distribution from the test time, and you've got label data from the training period, you can actually, it's possible, it's mathematically possible to identify the optimal predictor for the target distribution. So it proceeds like you would you would first basically solve this quantification task, which is use the, the unlabeled target data and labeled source data to identify what is the new label distribution in the target period. And you're able to do this under this assumption, the label shift assumption that the class conditionals are not changing. This becomes an identified quantity. We could design an estimator. We can prove that it you know actually is consistent. We can work out what is the target label distribution and we can update our classifier on the fly to respond to the fact that the base rates are changing. So we could deal with these like dynamic class balance changing issues. And that's that's one area that we've worked on. Uh, we've also, you know, uh, this is different from the covariate shift setting, I should note. In, in, in our setting, P of Y given X can change. It's P of X given Y that can't change. Uh, there's this tendency in this area for people to just say covariate shift sometimes just as a catch-all to mean distribution shift, but that's not what covariate shift means. Covariate shift isn't an assumption that something shifts. It's precisely an, an assumption about what doesn't shift, which is the conditional probability of the label given the example. Um, so there's a nice paper uh, by Bernard Sholkoff that kind of talks about covariate shift, about label shift, and uh, some, some other kinds of shift, and basically relates them to what are the corresponding sort of implicit like causal assumptions that make those make those settings reasonable. Like in the case of label shift, the, the setting is like you imagine that uh, the label distribution is changing, but the label causes the covariates and it's the, you know, the, the process that generates the covariates given the label doesn't change. So a good example of this would be a disease with shifting prevalence, right? In the short term, in the long term, you know, we as we've seen, all kinds of things can change, new variants could come out, et cetera. But in the short term, you know, what, what symptoms of having the disease look like versus not having the disease look like might not change, but the overall prevalence of the disease might change. That'd be a setting where label shift is a well-motivated kind of structure to work with. Covariate shift would be the opposite setting where, you know, you assume X causes Y and the background distribution over X can change or sample selection bias, but P of Y given X does not change. And these are in general, in ge except for one degenerate case, which is when the, the labels are, are totally separable, completely re you know realizable setting. These are actually mutually exclusive. You know, if you have label shift and you don't have covariate shift, you have covariate shift and you don't have label shift. I talked about before. We have this problem that um, we uh, we often are just making predictions. And we forget about the fact that we're actually making decisions, and that a good prediction is not necessarily a good decision. Like one of my favorite examples for this is if you walk into the bank. If, if you work at the bank and you find that everyone who wears Oxfords or most people who wear Oxfords repay their loans and most people who wear, wear sneakers or not, that doesn't mean that it's a reasonable policy to say we're going to start granting loans based on your choice of footwear from now on. And the reason why is, among other things, um, you know, this, this isn't you're not going to 
<laughs> among other things that's going to happen is even if it was predictive, people are going to go out and the response they're going to make is they're going to start wearing different shoes when they show up at the bank. They're going to say, okay, that's the new policy. Now I have to wear Oxfords if I want to get a loan. And suddenly you're going to start granting loans to all these people because they're wearing Oxfords. But it's no longer the case that this is predictive of repaying your loan because now it's everybody who's wearing Oxfords. You forgot about the fact that, you know, it, it, it's almost never in life um, uh, reason or very rarely reasonable to just entirely ignore every aspect of decision making and just focus on predictions that you the basis for making a prediction is in part connected to causal structure, for example, you know, especially when you're in these settings where you know, either you're going to do something different than you did before, like I'm going to give someone a treatment that I otherwise wouldn't, and I need to estimate this potential outcome, not just estimate what would have happened anyway. Um, or a setting where there's incentives and strategic classification, people are going to start acting differently. I would note also one thing that goes wrong is that our, our whole world is characterized by, by these systems. Um, they're being trained not to make passive predictions, but they're often being deployed to build services and, and we had this weird kind of insidious loop where we're often collecting data from users to build services that we deploy in ways that impact the behavior of those very same users, which invalidate the, you know, it's like the model invalidates itself just by virtue of being deployed. And this is, I think, the, the setting that characterizes a, a lot of the modern use of machine learning. So I, I've kind of set a high level stage for like, um, ways in which I think that like our, our, our present sort of approach or, the, or the, the main thing that people are doing is, is sort of broken. And, and some of some hints of some of the ways that we try to isolate certain, basically in general, you can't just say, oh, uh, you know, I wanna make decisions and the world can change and whatever, whatever, give me the golden solution. There is no general solution. These problems are all wildly underspecified. However, you can make crisp assumptions like label shift or covariate shift. These are examples of, concrete assumptions that you can make. And if, if you say, okay, I know something about my problem, such that this is the appropriate assumption, then you can handle still, you know, living in a changing world, et cetera. Or if you say, I know something about the causal structure, then I could estimate a treatment effect, then you could do something. Um, you know, there, there's no getting away from having to make some assumption, but at least you're, you're being clear about what they are and you're being clear about how you're actually using a model and what, what it is that you cared about in the first place, which I think is not the dominant practice in machine learning today. I think you have a lot of people just kind of wildly talking about like machine learning is going to, you know, affect uh, somehow personalized healthcare without having any clue about how you get from making predictions to actual healthcare decisions. So I'm gonna focus now on one specific family of problems, which is this problem of so-called spurious correlations. Um, and so the problem here is that, look, you train a machine learning system on a bunch of features and your goal is basically there's some real conditional probability of the label given the inputs and the model is gonna try to just produce a function that agrees with that function a lot of the time. Um, it doesn't care what is an appropriate way to make decisions. It doesn't care. Uh, is there confounding going on? It doesn't care, you know, uh, are certain features like somehow like superficial and others not superficial. It, the whole task just says estimate this conditional probability. And so, you know, machine learning systems for the most part, you know, that's what they do. They exploit any associations that are available in the data that make it easier to make accurate predictions. And there's a sort of growing chorus of concerns now. They say, oh, but the models, and, and you see this kind of fuzzy language. People, people think they know something's wrong. And this happens a lot in science. That people, they know they're wrong, but they don't know they're wrong. You know, they know that something, like they have a, you know, like they, they know something doesn't add up, but they don't possess the vocabulary to express it. I think that's what you're seeing here. And people start saying the model relies on the wrong features or the bad correlations, or even a lot of times when people say the word artifacts, they don't know what they mean by artifacts, but they're just saying like, the model's not doing what I wanted it to do, but it's doing precisely what they told it to do. And so I think what people are lack is like this language for distinguishing between what they actually want the model to do versus what they've been doing all along all these years. Um, so people say that the model relies on spurious associations, superficial associations, but again, what, what, how do you determine what is the spurious association? What is the superficial association? What are the wrong features and what are the right features? And maybe more importantly, like, you know, you have this culture where now people are so used to just say, I, I ran the model, I got a better number on the test set, I published a paper. Um, and this kind of mode of just, I tried something, I didn't think about why, and then I saw the number go in the direction that I wanted and I published a paper. 
I, I think there, there there's this danger that um, folks are trying to now like solve these these the thing is that that actually works. This is a weird thing that actually works for prediction in the IID setting because you could try whatever you want. And as long as you have some sufficiently fresh holdout data to evaluate the model, if it turns out you did well, you did well. You actually get to observe that and certify that. Whereas here, people, um, you know, it's the problem that people in causal inference are used to thinking about and people in machine learning or applied machine learning are often not used to thinking about, which is um, the problem of identification. You know, like before, you know, because like if you're, if you're just saying, I just want to find the most accurate hypothesis in the class, like, that's identified. It exists. You can tell it from just looking at holdout data. Um, if you say, I want to estimate a treatment effect, it may not be identified based on the features that you have for just some observational data. You might actually need to, it might only be identified if you add some kind of domain knowledge in the form of, say, like uh, a graphical model or some structural assumption. And one thing people, I think, have stopped to ask is, you know, they, they've just rushed to publishing papers saying, here's a paper. It's robust. It, it, it's not susceptible to artifacts, like in, as like a blanket statement. But it's not even clear what constitutes an artifact, and is that even determinable based on a data set alone? So you know, here's an example of I think the kind of problem. I think so. I want to be clear at a high level that I think people are right that there's something wrong, but they're wrong in like failing to express it correctly. You know, they're right that there's something wrong, but they're wrong in. The, the way that these problems are maybe cast or sort of glossed over or the way people present solutions as though the problems are solvable in contexts where they're not. Um, I'll give you an example of I think the kind of case where people are sort of rightly peeved that you know something seems wrong. And this is gonna be a running example in this talk. Um, you could take a collection of movie reviews and you could train a classifier. So you just do the simplest, dumbest things. Do bag of words like TFIDF kind of, uh, feature transformation, let's just train a SVM on top of it. Uh, let's just, you know, or logistic regression, pick your favorite linear model. Um, and let's just look and say, look at the coefficients that are the, the highest magnitude, just do the, the squint, squint the eyes, look at the, it's like kind of look at the coefficients and, you know, the, that, that mode of, you know, uh, heuristic uh, data science practitioner interpretability. Let's, let's just focus, say, what are the super high magnitude positive coefficients and super high magnitude negative coefficients. And you find um, when you look at these that the positive words include great, fun, wonderful, excellent, perfect, will, love, but sorry, will is a weird one. Why will? Why is will positive? Um, but then the negative ones include, you know, again, bad, worse, boring, awful, terrible, you know, poor, but then there's a bunch of words in there that just don't belong there. It's like, why is horror the second most negative word? Horror is a genre of film. These are movie reviews. Like, why should you just assume the movie is a bad movie? Like, why should you just downweight it? Um, because, uh, just because it happens to belong to a genre. And the answer is like, well, this is just a predictive model. And it just so happens that the horror movies on average are rated lower than maybe some genre that overall has, you know, you know, perhaps like less low budget movies made or something. And uh, similar, it was romantic, but if you expand it to let's say like the top, the full list of like the top 20 positive and negative, you see also like, romantic, romance, there's a bunch of genre words. And these are genre words, they shouldn't be like, they're not, you know, so it feels wrong. It's like, well, this isn't what makes the review positive or what makes it negative. And yet these are the words that are catching high, high coefficients. And so, you know, you have all these papers that are saying this is, you know, oh, there's a problem here. And I, I agree, I think there's a problem, but I think they're sort of, um, Failing to articulate what the problem is in a coherent technical language, often just saying, you know, the spuriousness, there's spuriousness. We need to make the, the robust model that's not susceptible to spuriousness without thinking, like, is it even identifiable? Like, is it possible to just look at the data without having any of the background context that we have about what these words actually mean and know which are the spurious signals and which are not? I'll give some more examples of this kind of thing. Um, there are these papers about, um, you know, uh, like our, our models uh, sort of more susceptible to shape or texture. And they give this example that like you take a, a zoomed in picture of like uh, elephant skin and it's classified as Indian elephant. You take this photo of a tabby cat, it's classified correctly as a tabby cat. They overlay the uh, elephant skin on the tabby cat and now it's classified as an Indian elephant. Um, I think it's intended to kind of, I think people are supposed to think this is wrong, but you know it's sort of like well it's unclear like uh is there anything in the data that you would have seen that would make it clear that you know when such an you know again like what's going on here maybe this is a tattoo of a cat 
on an elephant. So maybe it really is an elephant. Um, you know, you've probably never seen anything like this. Like, what should you be doing? Um, and it's it's just not clear. You know, there's again this um, uh, extensive literature about the extent to which uh, image models pick up on cues in the background versus in the foreground. Are they classifying the object itself, or are they classifying you know the the sky and the trees in the background, and that's what makes them think it's a bird? Because most photos with the sky in the background happen to be photos of birds or something like that. Um, you know, there's the classic, like you uh, put a cow on the beach and it's classified as, you know, water, beach, outdoor, seashore, um, but there's no cow because like the model's never seen a cow on the beach before. And so, you know, there, there's again, this kind of problem of, uh, you know, is, is the model classifying the background or is it classifying the foreground? Or is there any way even in the first place to, uh, you know, why the model, you should expect the model to not rely on the background given that all you did was just train it to make accurate predictions. Um, similar things have popped up in NLP. Uh, one, one example here is that you have um, a data set for a task called natural language inference. It's a bit of a goofy name, but the uh, high level is basically that the inputs consist of pairs of sentences. One is called the hypothesis and one is called the premise. And they can stand in one of three relations to each other. Either um, the premise entails the hypothesis, the premise contradicts the hypothesis or they're in a neutral, you know, so, so a, a contradiction might say, um, you know, the, the man is sitting down and the premise is the man is not sitting down. It's like, okay, that's a contradiction. Um, but, you know, maybe say uh, entailment might be the man is sitting down on a chair and that entails like the man is sitting or something. And, and uh, um, um, you know, neutral might be, you know, the, the man has uh, 10 fingers and then the, uh, the, the hypothesis, the man has 10 toes. Well, neither uh, uh, implies nor contradicts. So um, people have these data sets have been constructed and the idea is to uh, train models that take as input the pair of sentences and output the relation between them. Um, unfortunately, you know, they constructed the data set in such a way where um, the hypothesis were the premises were all given and then people were instructed to construct a hypothesis such that it satisfied each of you know the corresponding labels and it turns out that there were there were enough clues in the hypothesis for example like uh intent for contradiction people often have negations in the hypotheses things like this so there were enough kind of like silly si signals that you could sort of get high performance even like outperforming like some models that had been published in the literature without even looking at the premise. You could just look at the hypothesis and predict the labels. You say, oh, the model's not, again, the problem that people have is they say, the model's not really doing the task or the model is, um, you know, right. It's relying on the spurious association. But again, what is the spurious association? Who's to say? Um, they haven't made that clear in a formal way. Um, in uh, work with a student of mine that this is actually, uh, uh, my student Divyan Tkalshik uh, got a, a best short paper at EMNLP for this in 2018, but honestly, we shouldn't have been able to write this paper uh, if the community was, I think, like a little bit, you know, sort of a little bit more considerate in uh, um, operating, operating, you know, uh, maybe at a slower but more deliberate kind of cadence. And so what we found was basically all these question answering data sets. So there's this question answering basically is you're given a question in a passage and you're supposed to output the answer. Uh, depending upon the task, that might be a, 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 a multi, multiple choice out of a, uh, um, you know, like a multi-class setup or it might be a generative setup or often, uh, probably most often, it's uh, the answer is a subspan of the passage. So you have the question and the passage, then you're supposed to subselect, you know, a just a, a region, you know, like a phrase from the passage that is the constitutes the answer. Um, and it turns out that like, well, uh, many of these tasks, the way they've been set up, you could do better than the state of the art models or as well by only looking at the passage or by only looking at the question and completely ignoring the other. So you can't possibly be, you know, doing a reading comprehension. What you're doing is just, you know, it turns out there's some, there's some tell, there's some dead giveaway in, in, in one or the other. Um, and we found all kinds of other issues, places where people thought that, you know, oh, the model was doing QA based on these super long passages, but actually you could answer the question just based on the last sentence. So this whole kind of 
question. So, you know, there's some one, one question would be sort of like one, like why should we care at all about distribution shift? And there is, so why, why should we care at all about this like tendency to rely on spurious associations? And there's, you know, a couple of good reasons. One is that, you know, um, if what you really want are the causal factors of, of, of whatever it is that like is the important thing to measure, the thing that's actually of say like business significance, then, you know, it might not be procedurally fair to rely on all kinds of other features that don't actually influence that. You know, it might be that uh, your taste in music is predictive of your job performance. It doesn't mean that it's right for me to hire you or not hire you on the basis of your taste in music, because, you know, you listening to different music isn't going to influence your job performance. And so it'd be kind of this like, you know, un, sort of unreasonable, uh, thing for me to do to just distort the incentive structure. So at the end of the day, you're still going to get the job. You're just going to have to like act in this artificial way online to conceal your preferences in a way it's sort of like inappropriate. And another reason why you might care is that as we've been talking about distribution shift, you might believe that, you know, what it is that actually causes the label to be applicable is something that's robust and is going to transport across settings, but that these other sort of signals, they, they might be, true signals that actually hold in the, the distribution characterized by your particular data set, but they don't actually hold more broadly in the world necessarily. So, um, you know, like if you're only able to recognize contradictions when they involve a negation operator, then, you know, you're not going to be more broadly able to recognize uh, contradictions when you encounter text where, where, where this pattern is no longer, you know, as overwhelmingly predictive. So what can we do? Um, so here was an approach that my student, Divyant Kaushik and I, you can tell he's uh, very excited over here in the bottom right corner. Um, Divyant Kaushik and I developed this approach and one idea was that, okay, maybe it's not a priori, just like something that you could just pull out of thin air. What are the spurious phrases or the spurious signals versus not? But maybe this is something that, um, you know, certainly when it comes to text, we believe that we recognize, you know, what, what, is, what it actually is, like what actually it is in text that causes a label to be applicable, what causes it to be a positive review. Like we look at this and we say, oh no, horror, that's not relevant in that it's not semantically relevant. So given that like humans actually do have this ability to recognize the difference, uh, our kind of question was, can we leverage humans in the loop to attack this problem? Is there a way that we can incorporate humans in a more clever kind of way? So, you know, to date, the, the standard process is like you take data, you give it to a person and you say, well, what's the label, you know, like, or, or even like where it's like, here's a data item, here's a candidate label, does it apply? Yes or no. And you just use humans in the loop, um, you know, like real flesh and blood humans with billions of neurons in their brain. And what do we use them to do? It's most of the time just to like give us these binary labels, like yes, no, yes, no. And so our, um, uh, our this, this is a kind of speculative thing uh, at the time, and this is back in, I guess, fall 2019 and published at ICLR or summer 2019 and published at ICLR 2020. Um, the idea was, could we leverage humans in the loop in a more engaged way to solicit like a richer source of information from them that would allow us to sort of disambiguate in some sense, the, you know, the dispurious from the substantial. So what we did is instead of just saying, here's an example, give me the label, we created an, an interface where we take a data point, we show it to them and we say, basically, uh, here's the interface. We say, here's an example, here's the corresponding label. We already know the label. This is a point from our data set. Now, here's that same point like pre-populated into an editable text box, and here's a counterfactual label. And what I want you to do is to edit that data point. I want you to edit the passage such that it makes the counterfactual label applicable. So this is the high-level idea, is that um, we, we, we want to model basically an intervention, almost in a causal sense, but it's like we're it's not, you know, we don't have like the high level variables, but we believe that, we, you know, we carry them around in our heads when it comes to text, right? Like we talk about the sentiment of a review as like this, you know, this single variable, this one knob, you know, how was this very positive, very negative. And we think like you can edit the review to make it more positive, make it more negative. And yet, like, it's not something that you directly see with your eyes when you look at the review. It's that, you know, humans are able to infer this latent uh, variable and, and also able to kind of like, intervene on it like you're able to edit the review to make it more positive or make it more negative 
otherwise leaving the like general tenor and uh, sort of, you know, statements of fact intact. So this is the high level idea is that we created this uh, setup. Now, um, it turns out, you know, people, for all that people talk about like, you know, mech tech workers are not creative or they're not this, whatever. I think they're just often given tasks where it's very difficult, like, hey, write a passage for me on the spot. But in this setting, I think there was just enough context that uh, they had some starting point and instructions. We iterated a few times to make sure they were crystal clear what they should do. I should mention, by the way, that they sort of, their, their, their instructions are they should revise the review to make the counterfactual label applicable. They should make sure that the resulting review, whether it's one sentence or seven sentences, should be internally consistent. They shouldn't just edit a few sentences, but leave it in a kind of like internally inconsistent state. It should look like a coherent review. And the thing is that they should not change anything unnecessarily, like only intervene on this review in the ways that actually, you know, change the sentiment of the review. Don't change any like points of fact, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, people come up with all kinds of clever ways of editing the reviews. They take things that were maybe uh, expressed earnestly in the original review and they uh, find ways to uh, insert parenthetical phrases or uh, sort of scare quotes to make them sound sarcastic. They uh, will sometimes delete words or they'll swap out like modifiers. They'll say something that was cool, uh, you know, say that it was lame. They'll um, insert some supporting phrases to either, you know, make the, the review, you know, sort of more, more positive or, or to kind of hedge and make it more negative. Um, and so here's what, here's what happens when you get this data. So we, remember, if you take the original data uh, and you look at the most positive and most negative review uh, words uh, as assessed by like a TF-IDF, you know, coefficients of a TF-IDF uh, bag of words model, you see horror, super negative, romantic, uh, super positive. You have all these other words that don't really belong there, like will, well, my, has, uh, life, both, uh, dawn, seems, um, yeah, see, something. Why is something super negative? What, what's negative about something? You can say there's something, a je ne sais quoi. There's some, you know, there's some something special about this movie. That's not negative. But for some reason, it's the size, something is a negative word. Um, and um, now here's something interesting. When we take the revised data, for every review that was originally negative, it's now positive um, because we told, we gave them that review and we said, edit it so that the corresponding label is positive. And so when they do that, what we get out is a data set where now horror, but basically what we rely on is the fact that people know that horror is, is not, like this is like superficially related, but this is not, you know, this is not what causes the label to be positive or negative, the genre, the film. So when they take a negative review for a horror film and they make it positive, they don't change it from a horror film to a romance or a rom-com or a action movie or whatever. They leave it as horror because it's not relevant to the sentiment. And so suddenly all those horror movies that had a negative label in the revised data, they all have a positive label. And all the ones that said romance had a positive label, they now have a negative label. And so if you look at what happens, um, you take the TF-IDF model on the revised data, you find that the negative words are not boring, worse, terrible, bad, awful, dull, and romantic, romantic flipped and it becomes one of the most negative words. And the positive words are great, good, best, amazing, interesting, funny, better, whatever. But horror actually becomes one of the positive words. Interesting, something actually flipped and became a positive word too, right? Um, so now what happens if you take the original data? So, so again, there was a spurious association in the original data. There's also this like spurious association in the revised data, right? But the difference is just that it's switched, the polarity is switched. But if you take them and you merge them together, they cancel out, right? You've essentially like made this, you've made genre independent of um, sentiment label. And so what you find in the revised data is that neither horror, when you train on the, so this is what we call the counterfactually augmented data, you find ne neither horror, no rom nor romantic, nor something, nor, you know, any of these um, other kind of really not relevant words, they, they drop out of the top words. So again, this is just TF-IDF experiments, but they, they give like something tantalizing. I think there's something real going on here. Um, we do the same experiments, but instead of like looking at the coefficients because these models are not, you know, sort of as readily decomposable, um, we can still look at, you know, 
uh, random forests, by LSTMs, BERT models, and we find a similar pattern, which is uh, we can find it just by looking at the accuracy, which is that if you train on the original data and evaluate on the revised data, you have a huge drop of accuracy. You go from like 90% to 50% or whatever, 80 something percent to 50 something percent. And vice versa, when you train on the revised data and then you go to the original, you have another drop of, you know, from like 90% to 50% or 80% to 50%, depending on the model. But when you train on the augmented data, which is the original data plus the revised data, you basically get more or less the best of both worlds. You actually, it turns out, you know, there is a model that does very well on this task that's accurate on both the original and the revised settings. And this is the model that doesn't rely on, you know, those patterns in, in precisely the same ways. And then interestingly, we take this model as trained on movie reviews, not trained on Amazon products, not trained on Twitter uh, tweets, not trained on Yelp reviews, but we take it and look and say, how well does it work if you take this, the model trained on the counterfactually augmented data and look at its performance out of domain on these other sentiment tasks versus the original model. And interesting, this is totally empirical, you know, where we're in the wild west of messy real data. So it's not like we have a proof that this is gonna happen, but interestingly, we find that you get substantial benefits somewhere between, most often between like five and 12% accuracy benefits at predicting sentiment in these other domains when you use the model that was trained on the counterfactually augmented data. So I think this is like a, a kind of tantalizing, like, you know, proof of concept that, that, that there are ways we can inject, even in settings like NLP where you have messy unstructured data, ways that we can sort of inject some knowledge by collecting the right sorts of annotations that allow us to, 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 to get at these problems. And I think in, in some sense, a more satisfying way. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of jump over because we're, we're kind of just about out of time, but we, we sort of followed up on this work. We, we investigated, you know, what are actual precise uh, toy causal models that could be useful for sort of understanding when you would rely on spurious associations in the first place, where here spuriousness is defined in terms of uh, a common cause, a confounder, and, you know, uh, kind of formalizing what precisely is it that we believe counterfactually augmented data is doing. Um, you know, and, and sort of like, you know, making some, some headway towards better articulating our hypothesis about why this should actually give us these sorts of benefits in out-of-domain performance. Um, so um, I won't go too deep into there, um, but uh, this is, um, I think, you know, at a high level, you know, I guess what I want to highlight is that I think that these are the problems of our time. Like, I think people will continue to make incremental progress on slightly better discriminative models in the IID setting. But I think like far more pressing than our limitations in the IID setting are the ways that everything falls apart when we step into the real world in any of a number of different ways. And this is where, um, this is, I guess, where, where we're placing our bets. And I think where we, we, we find, you know, um, you know, I guess the kinds of problems that, that, that we think will, will sort of increasingly become the problem, the primary bottleneck to, using this technology effectively in the real world. Thank you so much, Zachary. It was an excellent talk, really exciting. And, and it kind of has many discussions. One of the questions that I had in the um, audience and, and Drisha and others had is, you're talking about looking at these counterfactual data augmentation. And you, you're, you mentioned very briefly that you can look at the context of multiple uh, information from multiple domains being that way of augmenting your original model. How do you, uh, do you rank? Can you, can you figure out what is the best new counter information um, based off the modality of the data and the domain context? Is there, is there a way that you're thinking, framing, well, framing this? So I just want to make sure maybe, I just want a little bit of clarification. I just want to make sure that I fully understand the question. So, I mean, like in, in our case, uh, you know, Well, what really matters sort of is just, um, you know, what is it that we're really after, right? Like we're, we're not singling out, we're not saying, okay, like you should, we're, we're not picking out different kinds of spurious correlates and saying, okay, make sure genre is not, we never tell the people anything about genre. We never tell them anything about all these factors. All we do is we say, here is the original input and the category to which it's assigned. And we basically say, like, we're sort of asking them just for a counterfactual. 
which is more or less this exact same input in every relevant sense, but different only in those ways that are relevant to flipping the label. And so I think what we're teasing out of them is like, we're not actually enumerating like, did these are the different ways that things might break or we're not telling them anything about the different domains where we might be wanting to apply this model. We're just taking data from one domain, but we're being, we're being explicit about what it is that actually is relevant. And we're exploiting the fact that this is a domain. Now, now, I think porting this over to other domains is harder. Like, I don't know for like healthcare data, how you ask someone to give you a counterfactual health record. We're exploiting the fact that like for, for text, humans are the generative model. Like we, we actually generate text and we actually have this superpower, which is we can, we can take a document and transform it into another equally plausible document, um, which is a power that we don't have even for images, right? Like if you say to someone, you know, I want you to edit this image or instead of this happening, something else is happening. And like people don't have the ability to just be like, I'm gonna, you know, through like the force of, you know, telekinesis, just like rearrange all the pixels so that this looks like a credible image in which some counterfactual scenario is playing out. But in, in the case of text, we do have this ability. And, and so that's, you know, we're not like, we're, we're actually not, we're being fairly generic. We're just saying, we're not saying anything about the domains to which we want to generalize. We're not saying anything about what are the specific spurious correlates. We're just saying this is what needs to change. And everything else that isn't relevant to this change should sort of remain. And, and that's all we're asking for. So it's a kind of, this is somewhat like, you know, lightweight um, interaction mechanism. And there's not many choices to be made, I guess. It related as a follow-up question, and also in the audience, there's a question about, applying it to the healthcare domain, would it be in a sense easier because you're, you are maybe more limited in the type of language that would be your input of your model? As an example, you publish on the, the SOAP summary hmm. uh, examples, and that's a very specific use case, uh, but it, it maybe the framework of the application to doctor and patient interactions allowed you to be able to test specific hypotheses about how the summaries and the counterfactual information could augment the original model. Could you speak towards that and whether? Well, I, mean, I think it's a good question. I, I think, right, like in general, right, like in general healthcare data, I think you'd run into trouble because it's like, you know, if you're talking about things like physiologic measurements, like how is a person going to conjure into their head what would be the, but, you know, I, I think that it, it would be interesting to see, um, you know, like I, I think I think this technology. I mean, I think you, it, whenever you touch a, any healthcare technology, it would actually could be deployed. I think you want to tread lightly and, and be careful. And the uh, but I think at least like you know at, a, at the level of research, I think it would be interesting to apply this on the soap notes. We haven't applied this method in conjunction with the soap notes, but I think you know there's there's all kinds of scenarios where um, you know, for example. Um, treatment decisions may be associated, you know, or historical treatment decisions might've been associated with, you know, um, age or race or gender in ways that both appropriate and not, but, you know, you'd like to think that um, uh, perhaps that like condition on whatever the facts of the medical case are, these other things wouldn't play a role. And you could imagine, I think like, you know, coming up with some, what are the relevant forms of counterfactual there where, you know, you don't want them, you know, I mean, again, like the nice thing here would be like, you could, there, there's, there's something powerful in the idea of like, say what you, like sort of say what matters, not what doesn't, like by sort of implicitly everything that isn't the thing that matters is the thing that doesn't matter. So you could just say, for example, take, uh, say, edit the, edit the doc, take all the medical summaries and then say, have people edit them to, so that the medicine prescribed is different, the dosages are different, the follow-up appointments are different, everything else, but you've left intact, you know, all of the, all of the other miscellaneous factors. And, and I think that might make models, um, you know, like, for example, you can imagine that uh, a model might be overly reliant on knowing your past medical history and chief complaint, et cetera, when trying to predict what medicines be because, oh, I know this is a heart patient, so probably they need Lipitor or something. Whereas you might want a model that is only outputting that if it's actually mentioned in the note and not relying on it. And I think that this could be like an effective 
tool in that scenario. Of course, I think you just always, always got to be really careful if you're saying, okay, we're, we're creating a bunch of fake data and uh, then training a model on it and say, oh, go, uh, go generate your patient summaries and stick them in their pods. But you have, you have to be just as cautious in the first place, I think, with deploying that technology in that domain anyway. Thanks. I think in the comments, there's the same note that you you don't want to uh, be too superficial in your approach if you're talking about life and de death decisions in the medical field. Yeah, and but I think in general, like to be clear, I would just add that, like you know, I know this talk isn't really about the soap note generation, but you know, I think in general, when it comes to that kind of technology, the the route is not to make a life and death decision. I think that would be uh, as one of you, I think that would be totally crazy. Uh, but I I think the more uh, plausible route to that technology is something like. Um, just like, you know, Google doesn't send your emails to your boss, that would also be crazy. But, you know, they'll, if you start typing, like, you know, they know that you were trying to make an appointment for Monday and then you found a complex site and you start saying maybe and it'll autofill, we can meet on Tuesday or something. You know, it doesn't, Google, Google doesn't uh, hit send and then, you know, you know, carry on some long conversation without your intervention, but rather it's sort of, an efficiency enhancement tool. And I think that that in general is, uh, I think maybe the only responsible way to incorporate this kind of like generative text models into a medical setting at this point. It's as a, you know, and it cuts both ways. Like doctors right now are often writing these notes uh, after the visit or later that evening, they forget things. So on one hand, you're, you might be surfacing things that they forgot about and uh, saving them from some false negatives. But I, I think you, don't want to be the one pressing send. So anyone is welcome to type in the chat or raise their hand for additional questions for Dr. Lipton. As a quick follow-up on your causal model discussions, could you, uh, is, are there uh, fundamental ways to systematically explore how you would look for causal relationships or the structure of the data? Uh, because you're, you're talking about developing ways to address causality when you have these low level features and, 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 and you're using it broadly across many domains. So how do you start to identify uh, the robustness of picking causal? I, I, would, I would like to hear a little bit more on your background on, on picking the causal features from, from, this, from the data you're working with and your well, approach I, to that. I think that the move, you know, there's, there's a lot to be, there's a lot of ways that you can try to like make this uh, close the gap between like, um, you know, say I, I did, there's, um, I'm trying to think about like what, where I've seen it called, um, like this is like, uh, was like causal representation learning or, um, causal coarsening, but there's all these uh, attempts to say, how do I make the bridge between the sort of symbolic world in which, um, in which sort of causal machinery makes sense and these sorts of statements make sense. And then like the observed world, the perceptual world, which is also low level data. And, you know, th there's lots of attempts. It, it, it's very much, I, I would say it's like compared to like the theory of statistical estimation of causal effects, it's like purely in symbol world, or even compared to the level of technology that we have for learning representations for purely predictive purposes, like this kind of causal meets uh, representation learning areas. Um, super, super like early, super, super, um, you know, not ready for prime time, but maybe, you know, front lines of something potentially interesting, but th th you know, they're, they're super difficult problems though. And, you know, I think, you know, there's like, like that one of the examples is like, um, you know, it's like there's, ma there's many equivalent ways, like causality is a fiction in the first place, right? It's it, not a fiction, but it's like a, uh, like a narrative device. It, it's like there, there are many causal descriptions of the same environment, all of which are correct, but uh, one of which is maybe much more useful for you as an agent with a specific set of actions at your disposal, right? It's like I could describe this room at the level of like, there's a there's a, my coffee bottle over here and there's a light switch over there and there's a computer over here. And if my goal is like figure out how to make the room brighter, like, you know, that's, that's a good description. And, you know, there's an equally valid description of the room that says, here are the trillion, 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 trillion subatomic particles that are all in this room. And these are their locations and these are their velocities. That's not so useful to me if I'm trying to. And so this whole world is like trying to bridge those gaps. But like our, our move here is actually kind of like, uh, 
is is sort of to like dodge it all. Like our, our move here is to say like let's um, we we don't directly discover this structure in the data. We're relying on the fact that like there's we have this translator, the human, who's able to uh, take our our causal manipulation, which is like I've you know intervened on some some factor like the perceived sentiment of the movie, and is able to realize the consequence in the inputs. And so we're not the ones doing that. You know, I think that a lot of times, um, I think it's like a lot of times how, like it, it's one move that we sometimes forget about like when solving a problem. I think sometimes it's like that. Sometimes it's change the problem or something. Or sometimes it's like, uh, I mean, we, we, so we've seen this a lot with our work on distribution shift where you hit a problem where it says, oh, everything in, involved in distribution shift involves com computing these density ratios and things like that. And we just don't know how to do it with high dimensional data and all the settings today are high dimensional data. Um, so what do we do? And one of the moves that we've used like paper after paper to develop like theory that makes sense here is to say, um, well, what if like, what if we just don't have to worry about high dimensions in the first place? And the way we're able to do it is to say, well, like, um, well, high dimensions were also a problem for just classification in the first place, but no one doubts our ability to just produce in, in the naive like IID setting, no one doubts our ability to just produce a decent classifier, right? So like the same obstacle exists there. The cursed dimensionality is there in principle. We just have some, you know, these neural nets that happen to be for whatever reason, like a, a suitable inductive bias such that they, they do well in the real world. Um, so like the move that we make is to say, well, if we could just assume that you have a good classifier in the source domain, could we then basically use that classifier as a, reden re as a dimensionality reduction device and basically just push all of our data forward through it and figure out how do we do everything that we need to do in label space, not in input space. And so, you know, we just dodged the problem entirely. And it relies on a very mild assumption, which is you're capable of training a classifier in the easy setting. We're able to turn that into a solution for the hard setting. And everyone already takes for granted that like you have good classifiers in the easy setting, right? So I think we're doing something similar here. We're saying, well, how do we make this translation? Like, like we don't, the human does. Um, like we express the, the intervention in like symbolic kind of speak. The human realizes it at the low level. We train the model on the low level and it has these values that are, has these properties that are desirable, you know, with respect to like um, a desire that would be expressed in the high level language, if that makes sense. I don't know if that was too abstract. That's very useful. Thank you, Zachary. I think there's a question from the audience that, that they're in person. Yeah, yes, thank you uh, for a very uh, interesting conversation. I think you kind of just answered the question, but I would just ask for in, in layperson's terms, uh, since you flipped through the slides on your hypothesis, so why this works, could you summarize why you think counterfactual data sets work? And then the second part of the question is, given that there are limits in the ability of uh, human inference, does that create a cap and then the performance improvements that can be achieved through counterfactual augmented data sets? Um, right, so, I mean, I think that what I would recommend is the second paper here, which is just explaining the efficacy of counterfactual augmented data. We actually go into quite a bit of detail about explaining what are a couple, couple sort of toy causal models that you would you know, might be useful for sort of conceptualizing what's going on when we ask people to make these sorts of interventions. And you kind of see how basically, you know, the, by, by, by having, you know, if you assume it's like, I've got this one latent factor along with a bunch of other latent factors and they're all correlated with each other because of some background common causes and they're all influencing the input, you know, and now I'm able to go in and I'm able to basically like, intervene on this latent factor and realize the counterfactual, you know, for each of these examples, what am I doing? And the answer ends up being that like, if you look at it in like graphical model land, you're sort of de-separating like the input from, or you're de-separating like the label from, from um, sort of all of these uh, um, spuriously correlated like other latent factors. Um, but I, I'd, I'd encourage you to like take a look at the paper. Um, I think, you know, I don't have enough time to go into like a lot of detail about the model. Um, and the second question was, so like limits about humans, it's not just, right, it's not just like limits of human inference, it's like limits of human um, generative powers. And, you know, and I think that's absolutely the case. I think what we're doing is very kind of gestural here. It, it's a bit of a leap. Um, 
Um, but like among other things, right, there's the case of well, what if humans, when they're in this artificial data annotation setting, aren't conjuring the full breadth of the full diversity of ways that these, you know, documents might be realized in their like kind of counterfactual form. And that's, that's absolutely a possibility. I would take these as sort of um, a very kind of like speculative proof of concept that, you know, I think should, um, you know, but but they're, 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 that, that's absolutely a, a problem and something that we think about it. And I think uh, in some sense, we, we're, we're lucky that it works. Um, so there's also a question in the chat from um, David Hans. Is the, the term causal inference should be dropped entirely unless a perfectly randomized experiment can be conducted? So I'm just going to say um, this is wrong. I disagree. Um, uh, I think lots of people misuse people, mislead people with the term causality. But, do you, you know, it's like uh, lots of people mislead people with statistics, but the solution isn't that we uh, stop speaking about uh, probabilities and stop drawing inferences. It's that we get a little bit more rigorous about what we're saying. Um, uh, in general, first of all, uh, randomized controlled trials are, um, you know, they, they don't require causal inference. Basically, when you conduct a randomized controlled trial, you have completely uh, deconfounded your sort of uh, data in such a way that the uh, causal quantities that you care about are the um, are the associative are the corresponding naively corresponding as associative quantities, right? Like the causal risk difference and the associative risk difference become the exact same quantity. However, causal inference as a field refers precisely to the entire discipline of um, of uh, estimating causal quantities based on observational data. And that's not the same thing as naively computing conditional probabilities and calling them causal quantities, but it's the synthesis of a set of structural assumptions. And structural assumptions don't say, I believe this causes this, or I believe this causes that, but it's, you know, for example, things about like, wh what is the direction of causality? Like I know that, uh, smoking might cause cancer or, or might protect against it. I'm not going to even say whether it's, you know, protective or causative. Like I'm just, gonna, but I'm just going to say that like the arrow of causality goes from smoking to cancer, not from cancer to smoking, things like that. So, you know, when you make a, a set of statements, you're, you're clear about your assumptions about what are the possible confounders out there? Um, what are the things that they might cause? What are proxy variables? What are potential mediators? When you're clear about those assumptions, then you actually can use observational data together with your model. And the model, you, you know, you might need to test some of those assumptions. Some of those tests might take the form of, you know, they might just, some of them might not do, need to be tested because they're, they're sort of flow from your basic knowledge of science. Some of them might be things that you could test experimentally. But like once you have a model, which maybe is subjective, you could at least say under this set of assumptions, this model together with this observational data yields this estimate for the causal parameter of interest. And if you're going to wholesale write this off, then I suggest you go out and uh, buy yourself a whole bunch of cigarettes, because this is the foundation of your knowledge of all kinds of facts, including the fact that smoking causes cancer. The only reason why you know it is because people have done precisely this sort of observational causal study, not because they took uh, 10,000 people and they made them chain smoke uh, for five years, and they took 10,000 other people and they deprived them of cigarettes. It's precisely because we knew something about the arrow of causality. We had, and people had spirited arguments. They argue about what are the possible confounders. Different people pose different models. You had among other people, you know, um, you know, one of the founding figures of uh, statistics, Ronald Fisher on the side, arguing that you, you know, smoking didn't ca cause cancer or that if it did, you couldn't prove it. And ultimately, you know, the field uh, kind of grew up a lot through that particular example. Among other things, uh, there's, you know, a uh, famous study by Cornfield, or what they did precisely is they said, you know, they developed a whole area that's now called sensitivity analysis, where you're very precise, not just about what are your assumptions, but the extent to which your assumptions could be violated and still the thing that you found would not, you know, totally evaporate. So, you know, you say, okay, I, I allow that there could be some amount of, um, confounding and still the finding would be robust. So, you know, I think you're saying most researchers don't take the, don't use causal numbers that way, but you know, that's, I think that's a dangerous route to go because I think most people don't use anything correctly. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't, um, 
you know, I, I would say put it this way, anyone whose job is that they work in causal inference, this is what they mean by causal inference. And by their job, I would mean like people like Buda Pearl, Ilya Spitzer, Elias Barenboim, uh, Carolyn Euler, you know, uh, Nathan Callis, like the, the, the Jamie Robbins, you know, um, Miguel Hernan, I think like this, this is the entire field, I think is, is, is its central problem. Yeah, and what it, the approach it takes. Have a response to you. So thank you so much for, for the talk and, and for also your follow up uh, starting discussion with uh, on, on other aspects. So um, anyone in the chat, please feel free to, if, if you're open to it, Zachary, they can maybe connect with you later um, online. Thank yeah, you so much uh, for a really exciting talk. And we're now going on to a, a short break before the, the lunch talk. All right, great. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Welcome back. Our lunch speaker is Dr. Robinson Pino, who is a program manager and previous acting division director for the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program Office in the US Department of Energy's Office of Science. Dr. Pino focuses on basic research and development efforts for high performance computing, edge computing, cybersecurity, neuromorphic computing, AI, advanced wireless photonics, microelectronics, and their applications. Dr. Pino has a PhD and master's degree in electrical engineering with honors from RPI and a bachelor's in electrical engineering with honors summa cum laude from the City University of New York. Dr. Pino is a recipient of numerous awards and professional distinctions and has published over 55 technical papers and reports, including books and several patents. He's also been integral in uh, launching the 5G initiative and incorporating neuromorphic computing in ASCAR program. So it's an honor to have you here, Dr. Pino. I thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity uh, for being here today. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Hopefully you all can see my screen. And again, I'm, I'm with the Office of Science uh, in the Department of Energy. And today I'm gonna take this opportunity uh, to talk to you about uh, what we're doing in the areas of, um, of primarily AI uh, and neuromorphic computing and how the intersection between those um, with microelectronics uh, and 5G. But before we start, I wanna take an opportunity to describe to you uh, what the Office of Science is about and describe some things about the Department of Energy. So in the Department of Energy, we have uh, three uh, primary missions. Uh, the number one, as you can see, as, as you can see in the name, is energy. Another important mission in the Department of Energy is nuclear safety and security. And another one where I belong is science uh, and innovation. When we look at science and innovation, the Office of Science uh, plays a key role in the stewardship of 10 of the 17 uh, DOE national laboratories. And the, the laboratories are distributed uh, across the United States. And the way that the Office of Science manages uh, research activities um, overall and in the national laboratories is through six um, research programs. Uh, as you can see here, I have listed the names of all six research programs. I, in particular, am in the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program uh, in the DOE Office of Science. One of the things that we're known um, in the scientific community is for establishing uh, large scientific user facilities that are used annually uh, by thousands of scientists 
uh, not only in the United States, but also around the world. And one of the things to keep in mind is to use these research uh, facilities is um, free uh, for open basic research. So in science, uh, the future of computing is, is very, very important to us. Uh, as, as you can imagine, science uh, uses a lot of computing, a lot of, needs a lot of computing capabilities, uh, not only for transmission, uh, for storage, for analysis, uh, but, but for performing very large scale simulations. And so when we look at computing, and future computing uh, beyond CMOS or digital computing, uh, we're, we're, we're placing a lot of uh, investments currently in quantum computing and emerging in metamorphic computing. Uh, we, we spend a lot of uh, uh, research uh, resources in applied mathematics and computer science basic research. And recently, uh, we are uh, uh, supporting, uh, starting to support research in basic microelectronics. And hopefully, I'll, I'll describe some of that in the future. So historically, uh, my office, uh, we've been very focused uh, for several decades in supporting uh, the research and development of very large scale computing systems. Uh, we are in the process of deploying our exascale systems in the national laboratories. And, and these, these activities are very important for science, uh, given that uh, it is very, very critical for many aspects of physical uh, research uh, to perform uh, monolithic large scale computations. Uh, for, for many aspects uh, of the research that we support. As you know, as we can imagine, if you haven't seen uh, the size of these computers, uh, they, they're, they're very large and, and they require a lot of energy. And, and you know, many of you, many of us have heard about the you know, microelectronics shortage, and all the challenges that we have in scaling microelectronics technologies. And so today, it has been very important to explore new types of computing. Now, as I've showed you in the, in the previous slide, the, the work, uh, we, we have been investing significantly, uh, several billion per year on large scale uh, computing architectures and systems. But as we know, the world for, for well over a decade has been moving in, in, in the opposite direction in, into more embedded mobile uh, uh, communications and computing systems. And as we see the advent of advanced wireless communications starting with 5G, uh, many people expect to see a, a revolution in terms of the, the applications and technologies that will be developed uh, as we move forward from now on, where basically everything that can be connected to a network or anything that will be electric for the most part will most likely be connected to a network and will have remote control and operation. And as we all know, uh, AI autonomy uh, is a big part of it. So the world is changing and it has been exponentially changing, especially in the last year and a half uh, where where we all want to see more autonomy, we're all more comfortable with autonomy. Uh, we expect to see autonomous vehicles in the near future. 
uh, we expect to see smarter, more intelligent grids. And we see the rise of more capable uh, edge computing devices, uh, as, as we can all see uh, with how the smartphones uh, have evolved over, over the last decade, where today they're very, very, very capable. And at the foundation, uh, beyond state-of-the-art uh, digital technologies, AI has become a, a key part on, on the development of these technologies. However, as many speakers, as several speakers have mentioned today, there are many challenges in, in, in ensuring or, or in developing AI systems that have a level of common sense. So though a lot of the research that we fund today and a lot of the research that is coming up, it is leveraging uh, state-of-the-art machine learning and deep learning, uh, there's still a lot of opportunity for research and innovation in artificial intelligence. And one of the areas that we're focusing on is on neuromorphic computing, uh, coupled with uh, microelectronics uh, to, to support uh, new, new research activities uh, that does push that try that will try that try to push the envelope to what we understand today. So for next, we've been um, we've been exploring uh, machine learning applications for scientific environments uh, for over six years now, and and we can. We, we've begun to see where that machine learning, as we know it today, and deep learning uh, has is beginning to take significant applications or significant root in areas that we couldn't we couldn't have uh, predicted before. Uh, for example, in how uh, high performance computers uh, are being developed and used and optimized and the tools uh, that run on these uh, supercomputers. They do have helped us to increase the resiliency uh, of the operations uh, and, and the adaptability of systems. Uh, but we do know that there is a lot more that needs to be done uh, to have uh, better uh, intelligent systems. So in order to push this envelope uh, for many years, uh, not only in DOE, but um, many agencies, many research agencies uh, within the federal space uh, have been thinking on, on how to enable research opportunities that could enable uh, autonomous systems. Uh, but most importantly, uh, systems that are able to to have more more sense making, more safe sense making that they're more reconfigurable, and and there is still a lot of opportunity for for making uh, these um, for for the research to have solutions. Uh, given that the this research uh, it is extremely uh, multidisciplinary. And having uh, multidisciplinary research efforts uh, sometimes can be quite challenging, uh, given the the language barriers that we may have uh, between disciplines. Whether it is from a hardware point of view, uh, from a mathematical, computer science, biology, or neuroscience point of view, and so one of the challenges that we have is. How can we ensure that we make those opportunities available so that we can have this cross examination? Uh, because uh, obviously um, there, there is a lot more to, to learn and to understand uh, from, from nature as we see it today.
So in DOE science, uh, we, we've begun to focus on neuromorphic computing. And one of the questions uh, that we get is, uh, why neuromorphic computing? And we all know uh, computers have become extremely essential to all that we do, um, whether it is from industrial controls uh, to, to healthcare, finance, uh, education, national security, uh, we need computers and electronics. And a lot of energy is spent in, in moving information, transforming information, processing information. And one of the challenges that we have in particularly as we develop large scale computing systems uh, is, is the energy consumption of the systems. Uh, which in some, in some respects, if, if no new innovations happen uh, to get a handle on the energy consumption, uh, it could be very challenging to, to power uh, large scale computing systems. And neuromorphic, neuromorphic systems, as we see biology uh, from uh, neuroscience based uh, systems, uh, the energy consumption uh, could be many orders of magnitude uh, compared to, to the systems that we use today. So one of the research paths that, that we are pursuing is to couple uh, biologically inspired uh, computing processes uh, with materials, with novel materials or new materials uh, for new devices uh, to develop the models to emulate the nonlinear processes that are taking place. Uh, we're, we're looking uh, to support new tools and techniques uh, for fabrication uh, that, that could be um, potentially uh, integrated with CMOS, uh, but not required in the near term. Uh, we would like to, in, to accelerate new platforms and to be able to prototype new types of flat platforms, new types of devices, uh, new types of coprocessors. And one key challenge uh, that, uh, that that we see today is that the, the tools, the advanced tools uh, for developing conventional or current state-of-the-art microelectronic processors, uh, they, they may need a lot of rework uh, to be able to, to be used in new types of computing architectures, uh, to use new types of devices, uh, new types of nonlinearities, uh, within the devices, uh, which by itself is a big challenge um, to model and simulate new computing architectures uh, that are based on nonlinear dynamics uh, with conventional digital systems. Given that we, we take computing to streams and and we see the need for, for increasing capabilities from a computing point of view, uh, we would like to see these systems to be scaled uh, to beyond uh, biological, beyond the biological systems that we uh, see today. But one of the key aspects that we would like to support is the understanding uh, first of these systems. So that we've been uh, pursuing uh, machine learning uh, for, for well over six years and thinking about neuromorphic uh, for about the same time. Uh, last year, our office was able to release the first funding opportunity announcement 
in neuromorphic computing. And one of the aspects that we are supporting is the interdisciplinary nature between uh, neuroscience, engineering, and material science. Uh, we believe that that synergy is very important if we are to make new breakthroughs beyond uh, what we have today. Uh, we want to be able to, uh, to support R&D in systems uh, that, that are able to understand uh, history or time and that are more complex uh, in nature uh, from the systems that we have today. So we want, to, we want to be able, some of the challenges that we have today in advanced computing at large scales is the combination of uh, fine-grained computations with models uh, that, that operate at larger scales and vice versa. That interaction is very important, uh, in particular in, in physics-based models. Um, the efficiency of the computing and the systems that we use, um, as I mentioned before, are maybe sometimes millions of times uh, more energy inefficient that we could say, for example, biology of the or the human brain. Uh, we we really uh, are placing a, an emphasis on justifications based on neuroscience, even if the, if the research um, is taking place today at, at smaller scales. And one of the key focus is on the analog computing dynamics uh, that we see present uh, in biology. So we are making a distinction between uh, digital-based approaches two analog-based approaches uh, that are more uh, synergistic with biology. And the things that we're pursuing are really energy efficiency, learning, but really more on the understanding and the sense-making. As we believe that these uh, future computing systems um, are gonna be needed, given that data uh, continues to increase uh, exponentially, and sensors uh, become uh, uh, more, more capable of generating and capturing more data uh, to the point that, that, that we do need the systems to be able to, uh, to accelerate discovery in uh, studying the data that we generate. Uh, this year and a few years ago, we began the process of of the role of what microelectronics has uh, for future computing beyond our state-of-the-art digital systems. Uh, we use in science microelectronics not only for our high-performance computing systems, but we use them for sensors, for detectors, uh, in many, many types of experiments. And given that, uh, in, in DOE science, um, we, we lead uh, the US in basic research in the physical sciences, and we do support historically uh, many aspects of materials, science development, and we are world leaders in, in, in that area as well as computing. And we believe that given the challenges that we see globally in the development of new microelectronics um, technologies, uh, we, we do see an age where we could play a role in bridging the gap between the large scale computing and our expertise in material science. And the areas that we're really looking for is on materials, chemistry, synthesis, fabrication, devices, systems, 
the architectures and the algorithms and the software, which is really uh, the the full uh, the full stack of development of new technologies from hardware to applications. In terms of microelectronics, we have different, uh, we have five priority research directions. And the main one is really to, to change the paradigm of how we develop technologies. How could we better accelerate materials and device adoptions to new or existing architectures? Um, memory and storage has been a challenge and continue to be a challenge in particular uh, within processor uh, memory. How could we redefine um, new computing that can leverage new types of physical phenomena for new types of devices and apply it uh, not only uh, to, uh, to energy delivery and distribution, uh, but also uh, to new computing architectures, sensors and devices. So in the center, uh, we see a stack of how conventionally technology development has is is normally seen where we start, you know, we do a lot of many years of materials and chemistry research. We understand the physics, we come up with some devices, and then we try to integrate them and to make architectures and apply algorithms and solve uh, applications. So we're trying to, to look more towards uh, the right, uh, the circle figure, where could it be possible to accelerate the process of technology development and its research by doing many things sim sim simultaneously um, within a co-design framework? Obviously, it's very challenging. Uh, because as we go like from chemistry to architectures is, is many, many scales and, and many disciplines within itself to cover. Uh, but the question is, uh, as a scientific community, are we ready today uh, to begin uh, taking opportunities to, to accelerate scientific innovation and so currently we are placing a lot of emphasis on co-design. Now, as we look at, at where the world has been moving for the past decade, which is towards mobile adaptable systems, uh, 5G has brought new new key capabilities within the wireless communication domain that makes it uh, suitable for scientific applications. And the adaptability and software-defined nature of this next generation advanced wireless network could, could begin to uh, to make uh, significant impacts in how we perform science. And when we look at what these um, new wireless could bring uh, to, to, to edge devices, uh, the, the opportunity to tailor uh, the communication, the level of service or the quality of service to each uh, particular application uh, does uh, make it a competitive uh, technology uh, to wireless, to wired uh, network architectures. And given that it is wireless, we do have an opportunity uh, to have a, a more distributed 
uh, dynamic and changing uh, communication to, to our sensors, uh, to our antennas, to telescopes, uh, to light sources, to accelerators. And we do have an opportunity to, to, in, to reinvent what the continuum between an edge device or thousands or millions of edge devices are to cloud computing, data centers, and our high performance computing systems. So when we look at the interaction between advanced wireless networks and, and our scientific enterprise, uh, we do see an opportunity in integrating advanced wireless with our uh, existing infrastructure. For example, uh, as you guys can see right next to the 5G logo, there is an ESNet logo. ESNet is the Energy Sciences Network, which is a, a about 400 gigabit network that connects all of the US and Europe and connects uh, all DOE national laboratories and all our scientific user facilities at very, very high speeds. And one of the challenges that we've had when we have experiments uh, that are remote, that require, that use small sensors, uh, actuators, different types of antennas, or that are remote, uh, that the communication to those systems uh, has always been a challenge. And through 5G or advanced wireless networks and the new um, capabilities that it brings with it, uh, we do see an opportunity. Uh, this year, we launched uh, the 5G for Science initiative and we made awards, uh, new project awards to our national laboratories. And one of the key themes that came out during this, during the competition was that every single proposal is implementing uh, some sort of artificial intelligence technology uh, to optimize uh, the communication, whether it is at the edge, uh, in transit, or for analysis. So as we begin to look at the new types of devices and applications that we could have, we do need the opportunity for also making those devices, those sensors, those processors, those architectures, in new hardware. And that's one of the reasons uh, we are supporting uh, or beginning to support microelectronics R&D for these new types of devices or sensors. And uh, given that uh, I don't believe um, machine learning uh, will, will will go away, um, there is an opportunity for, in some aspects, to develop new types of ASICs based on state-of-the-art uh, AI algorithms. And as we push the envelope of conventional computing, could we uh, have um, even more powerful digital systems, neuromorphic-based or even quantum-based, computing sensors that uh, could give us new capabilities uh, to, to make new discoveries and to accelerate science. And so the future is quite exciting, um, I believe, and, and hopefully there'll be many, many opportunities uh, to, to revolutionize how, how the future of technology uh, will be. So as I mentioned, as I mentioned, 
uh, we're placing a lot of emphasis in supporting uh, collaborations between uh, neuroscience and computing. So last year, uh, we joined a program uh, which is called uh, Computational Collaborative Research in Computational Neuroscience, CRCNS. Uh, it's a program that NSF, NIH, and many countries have been running for many years. NSF, for sure, for, for at least 16 years. That supports um, multidisciplinary research in computational neuroscience. And so we joined last year and we, we begun this year, well, this past year in 21, well, we're still in 21, to make um, awards in this opportunity. And so I, I would in, invite you to look at this opportunity and to, to, con, to, to consider uh, applying for it, um, whether it is a US, US collaboration, US, you know, national lab collaboration or international collaboration uh, with the countries involved, um, it is allowed. Um, and the proposal day, due dates for, for the 2022 uh, fiscal year is, is coming up in November 23rd. Now, if you look at the solicitation, it is quite big given, well, it's quite broad from a computational neuroscience point of view. Uh, but for DOE, um, I took kind of the, the liberty to, to look at the entire funding opportunity and to say, okay, if, if you were going to do a proposal, uh, there is of interest uh, to DOE. Obviously, many of the things that I said in the talk today uh, fall in, in line with it. Uh, but what's written in the FOA and the funding opportunity, these are some of the areas um, that I believe are closely aligned uh, with DOE, with the DOE mission. Uh, however, uh, I, I would say that this year, um, we funded opportunities relating to uh, prosthetic modeling, um, dragonfly uh, brain modeling. And so, so we are, we, we are taking a, a broader look in supporting uh, these research activities uh, with the underlying mechanism, with the underlying, uh, how can I say, stressing that our interest in, in supporting uh, research lies in terms of the understanding of the fundamentals of computing from a neuroscience point of view, whether it is tied to devices, to applications, to modeling, uh, but one of the things that we want to support is bridging uh, the state of the art of computational neuroscience or neuroscience uh, data to uh, computing, whether it is um, digital, machine learning, deep learning, convolutional, neuromorphic. We want to support uh, new ideas and new research uh, in those areas. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time and hopefully I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have or feel free to reach out to me directly uh, on my email. Uh, thank you.
All right, so I see a question on the chat. Uh, can industry leverage use DOE computing resources itself? Can you provide a, learn, a link? Yes. Uh, so the link, if you go to, well, I don't remember the link off the top of my head, but if you go to science that, oh, well, I will have to look at it. Yes. So the way we, industry can use our supercomputers is through, um, through a cost basis model. So for industry and proprietary um, um, uses, uh, DOE charges uh, for what it costs us to, to operate the machines. And so yes, many, many industry, many in industry do use um, many of our scientific resources, not only computing, uh, but other um, facilities for proprietary um, activities, but the industry does have to pay for it. All right, seems that I cannot hear you guys. Can you guys hear me? Lee Robinson's clear, I can't hear you, but I don't know about if they're talking to you, I can't hear them either. <clears throat> All right, I, I can hear Claire. All right, so I see some questions here. So what do you think would be a stopgap approach for these computer systems before we reach scalability. We would like for large scale connected intelligent systems. Uh, well, to me, one of, the, one of the biggest challenges today is really understanding. And the, the, many of the speakers uh, this morning, uh, they provided very, very good um, evidence to show that uh, is is that today's AI systems can can fail quite quite badly, and and to me, we do need to spend more time in understanding and scaling up uh, the systems in a way that that they're understood and. And at the same time, uh, develop methods for for the for verification of the results uh, that we get. Because once we we deploy the systems in a large scale, it will become almost, if not nearly, impossible uh, to verify uh, those systems. Do we see new programming standardized tool suits for synchrony across abstractions that will be coming out uh, of the new programs? Yes, yes. Uh, I hope that, uh, that in the near future, uh, there we will be, well, I, I say it as, I hope that we will have the opportunity to support more activities 
that focuses on, on, on the programming languages, on the programming environments that bridges both uh, digital, analog, neuromorphic, new types of computations, quantum, uh, yes. Uh, one, of, one of the projects in, in the national laboratories that we are supporting uh, today, currently, is our Oregon National Laboratory, uh, where they are working to develop a large-scale um, neuromorphic simulator. And it, it's going to be a framework where uh, the user could, uh, uh, could explicitly state uh, the models for neurons and synapses and other, uh, and other effects uh, that would make a, a graph. Uh, could it be uh, you know, similar to what we see as uh, deep learning, artificial neural networks? But the idea would be that uh, it would be uh, spiking in nature, um, but it will be user defined in how the graph may grow. Um, and, 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 and they're working on it, hopefully. I hope that maybe by in the near future, uh, they'll be able to begin publishing results. And one of the, th I hope that uh, the code will also be um, open source so that others can use it in simulating large scale um, neuroscience-based computing architectures. Uh, one of the challenges that I see in the near term is that we're targeting to, for it to be, to be deployable in the exascale systems. However, you know, we'll have very few of those systems. Uh, and so it's gonna be challenging for many people to perform the simulations at extreme scales. Uh, but at least at smaller scales, um, I hope that the code will be available uh, so that many, many people can use it and innovate and come up with new ideas and to test new ideas uh, as we move forward. Thank you, Robinson. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you faintly. I'm going to raise my volume. Thank you so much for that. Um, sorry about the technical glitch here. So you mentioned that um, there would be new programming uh, stacks and tools, uh, suites that would be helpful for the broader community and will be open source to some of these programs. But the challenge perhaps is that some of these um, are more suitable for the exascale systems that are very limited. Um, do you see there would be modular tools in neuromorphic uh, uh, stack that would also be beneficial for the broader community to test some of the uh, scalability aspects, whether it is uh, compute at the edge or other aspects that you have mentioned, um, even in some of your other programs, so. Yes, as we, as we continue our microelectronics and advanced wireless, we will support um, a smaller scale, not only prototyping, but modeling and simulation. But one of the things I also want to say in terms of extra scale, that one of the good things that are, that are gonna be a byproduct of extra scale is gonna be that, yes, uh, DOE has spent several billions of dollars developing and working with industry to have these exascale systems. But the, the, the boards, the racks by themselves will, will be affordable to the community. So what that means is that for you at, at a university or even at home to have a petascale type computing system is not gonna be hundreds of millions of dollars uh, is going to be quite affordable. So you, you may have access to the, 
to a smaller scale technology uh, to perform uh, smaller scale uh, modeling and simulation experiments, uh, but obviously getting access to, to the full-fledged exascale machine, uh, it is for anybody, it is, it is free for basic research, but many people compete uh, for, for the time. And so I do expect that, that many people will compete uh, not only for modeling and simulation of future computer architectures, but obviously from material science, biology, and other areas. Uh, and so it, so the access is not going to be so much available because it's a limited resource. Uh, but from a smaller scale point of view, uh, high performance computing in the petascale regime will become much, much more affordable. Thank you. There's one more question here. Um, predictions are generally hard, and especially when it comes to perhaps technologies like AI and neuromorphic computing, it is perhaps even challenging, even more challenging because of the dynamic nature uh, of how, or how rapidly these fields are evolving. But uh, do you see where um, neuromorphic devices could be more adopted in the mainstream? What would be that time frame looking like uh, from your perspective? Well, and, and that's one of the reasons why we have our microelectronics initiative. Because from, from a commercial point of view, it's too risky to adopt new, a, new, a new device technology that may not be commercial, commercially viable uh, within a few years. And so we, we, we believe that a lot of funding and research funding uh, is, is required uh, for, for innovators, for researchers, uh, to be able to take that risk and to take those ideas. And so, so that's why uh, we, we're starting all, all this initiative. Well, synergistically, it, it kind of works out uh, that, that, that new support uh, is, is needed for these devices. Now, it, many of you have heard about like the CHIPS Act uh, that Congress passed um, earlier in the year uh, that authorizes uh, the government uh, to support uh, state-of-the-art R&D uh, in microelectronics. Uh, now that is an authorization uh, law and, and potentially there, there could be significant funding in the, in the, in the budget that, that Congress is working on. Uh, but, and, and that could be significant, a significant lift uh, for, for many federal agencies uh, to, to support uh, innovation, prototyping of new types of devices. Um, I mean, in, in the US, we've spent over maybe close to $30 billion over the last uh, 20 years in nanotechnology. There is a lot of uh, know-how, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, knowledge that hopefully uh, it, it is the time now uh, to, to, to push that transition uh, so that we can do more research into what we can do with new types of materials, uh, with new types of devices, but also to, to develop the, the systems and, and, and environments that would allow us to model those new types of devices with the new types of nonlinear elements that could make even small systems a reality. And that's why when I emphasize like our collaboration with uh, computational neuroscience is that even small 
research efforts focused on on understanding uh, we 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 want to support those uh, because obviously the challenge is is quite big uh, we've we've shown a lot of results at large scales using machine learning as we as we know it today but we know that there is a lot more to understand uh, to be able to make those systems to have more common sense uh, to be able to from a historical point of view to be able for them to tell what what's important when was it important from a sense making point of view um, that may be that may be critical for for future autonomous systems said that your is launched and has been uh, sponsoring new programs. And I think that's a great backdrop that you have as a computer engineer. I can. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. Welcome to the panel of next generate on next generation of artificial intelligence models. I think we have everyone. Let me see. There we have Catherine. And I still don't. So are we are we all good to start? Oh yes, I see her. Okay, perfect. So um <clears throat> It's it's one minute past, but it's my it's my honor and pleasure to moderate the, today's panel uh, that will focus on next generation of artificial intelligence models. And um, I would like to welcome our three amazing panelists, so Dr. Ratsko Wee Rao, who is the chief uh, of intelligence perception branch at Army at the Army Research Laboratory, and Dr. Catherine Schumann, who is a research scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and. Uh, Mr. Chuck Hovel, who is the Chief Scientist for Responsible AI at the MITRE Corporation. And um, um, I am your moderator. My name is Dr. Svetlana Volkova. I am a Chief Scientist in Decision Intelligence and Analytics at the National Security Directorate of the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And this panel today will focus on discussing the, the, the speed of AI progress and actually um, um, elaborating more on indicators without the, using the word exponential. Then we will, we will touch on recent advances in artificial intelligence that have been achieved by developing really, really massive scale models that are 10 and hundreds and even thousands time, times larger than a few years ago. And I think um, the job for this panel will be to really elaborate on science and engineering challenges because there are a lot, as well as research gaps and research directions and the potential for this massive scale next generation AI models to improve multimodal general purpose learning um, as well as predictive and prescriptive inferences, including machine reasoning, but not limited to machine reasoning. Uh, this panel will also talk about the need and the potential for next generation uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning solutions for the Department of Defense. And we will wrap up by, uh, by talking about how AI uh, can be used for data on environmental challenges. Um, the way that the panel will be structured um, is uh, we'll start with, with three position statements from each panelist, and then um, I will take questions from the audience, and I have questions that, I, that the panel will cover that we prepared for you. So I'm really looking to this, um, I'm really looking forward to this panel, and let's start with Dr. Radhu Rao with his position statement. Each panelist has five minutes, and then we'll go in order, and we'll, uh, we'll cover the questions. So, Dr. Rao, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, I uh, will be showing a um, uh, screen, uh, except that I'm seems to be running into problem the moment I uh, try to share it here. Uh, if I don't bring it up in a moment or two, we should probably let. Uh, uh, let the um, 
Uh, I, one of my co-panelists to go ahead. Uh, let, let me just give this a shot. Uh, Sounds good. Yes, it's sharing. Okay, all right. Uh, so uh, what you should see is a screen that uh, describes uh, my branch. I had the intelligent perception branch at the uh, Army Research Laboratory. We are located in Adelphi, Maryland. So the mission of the branch, or the vision, if you will, is machine vision making sense of the battlefield. By way of our mission, we conduct foundational research or basic research, if you will, as well as applied research with focus on automatic spatial temporal scene understanding. The current focus is on machine vision for autonomous multi-domain operations, force maneuver and battlefield intelligence. And whatever we do, we transition our knowledge as knowledge products uh, to the Army, the DOD and other government agencies. And we collaborate extensively with universities. The uh, graphic on the right pretty much captures the fact that there is a hierarchy of layers uh, with which we are involved in the development of our technologies all the way from close to sensors to generating semantic scene understanding, which is of course the holy grail. The key research activities and deliverables that we see over the next three to five years focus on multi-view and multimodal scene understanding techniques and algorithms, and then synthetic scene generation tools for efficient machine learning. So on this last bullet, I'm gonna elaborate a little bit in the next couple of slides. Uh, what you see here is a report we generated the front cover on a Army science planning and strategy meeting on this on synthetic environments for artificial intelligence and machine learning in multi-domain operations. The motivation for looking at synthetic data has to do with the fact that many of the machine learning approaches, uh, which of course are a key component of artificial intelligence, the machine learning component, Many of them are deep learning based, and it's well known that you do need good solid training data, both in terms of the quality and uh, quantity to enable uh, uh, accurate operations in real world situations. Now, it so happens that in the defense world, it's not always the case that you're gonna get representative data. It's almost impossible to get representative data. A solution that people look for, many have proposed, is looking at synthetic data. There's a hardly a meeting that I go to where the notion of synthetic data does not come up, but that's a can of worms in the sense that how do you know that whatever approach you're gonna use for generating synthetic, synthetic scenes is good? How do you know that machine learning algorithms when trained on them are gonna do well in the field? So what we do require is a systematic understanding of the business of synthetic data, which of course, is gonna be worked in tandem with understanding machine learning itself. And so we had this meeting, which was attended by some leading experts from multiple universities, as, as the DOD laboratories and several uh, recommendations came out. This is an open report. Uh, anybody wanting that can write to me and I will be happy to send a copy of this to you. Uh, so we have had our own initial engagements with synthetic data uh, for a few years already. And here are some examples that we did initially trying to train robots with gestures. So given the fact that we could only work with a few human volunteers, we got into generating synthetic soldiers or synthetic uh, humans who could then uh, uh, be used to generate the gestures to train the robots to follow those gestures. And what we found then was a mixture of real and synthetic data did improve the machine learning's ability uh, to identify targets better or identify the gestures better. But then uh, that's uh, one instance, one set of data. How can you generalize? And which is where the meeting came up with several recommendations. As a follow-on, we have a lot of uh, activities going on at ARLS in-house research. We have multiple university collaborations that resulted after the particular meeting we had. Uh, and uh, the uh, we're doing it through what we call the Army AI Innovation Institute housed within ARL. Here are some uh, universities with whom we have developed partnerships. We are open to more partnerships and we have other university consortia and there's particularly a big one with the University of Maryland systems that we're working with. So that's uh, that's my initial spiel by way of uh, introducing myself as chief of the intelligent perception branch at ARL, as well as 
our current interests over. Thank you, Dr. Rao. That's perfect, right on time. So, um, so I think the next panelist is Dr. Schumann, if you're ready. Yes, I will share my screen. Can you see the full slide? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Katie Schumann. I'm a research scientist at Oak Ridge National Lab. I'm actually a neuromorphic computing researcher. I focus primarily on the development of algorithms and applications for brain-inspired hardware. Um, so when I'm thinking about the new generation of AI models, I work every day with spiking neural networks and, and brain-inspired, neuroscience-inspired um, models. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to explore those for the future. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to talk about is, is bigger really better? Um, so we have on the, I have a chart showing the, I'm, I apologize, but Lana, I'm going to use exponential, exponential growth in the size of language models of, uh, over the last couple of years, even, um, just last week, a new language model, Megatron Turing NLG, uh, came out with three times as many uh, parameters as GPT-3. Um, and so I, I really like this paper on the dangers of stochastic parrots. Um, I encourage you to check it out if you haven't already. Talking about some of the dangers of these very large scale models. Um, so the upside is they're more accurate, but I have a question mark here because what does accurate even mean in the context of these models? How useful are they across translating to new applications? Is the accuracy worth the dangers that they bring. Um, so what are the significant downsides and dangers? I'm in neuromorphic computing, so I care a lot about energy efficiency. The environmental and the financial costs for training these models is staggering. I think GPT-3 used the equivalent of the, or, or generated the equivalent of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that 120 cars generate across an entire year. Um, these systems also require huge training data sizes to the point where we can't get a hold really as people how much data is actually being put into these systems and what is in that data. Um, so moving forward, these models, we need to be doing some sort of curation with the data that's going into them so that we have a better idea of what it is that they're, they're learning from that data. Um, and one of the big issues is the potential bias and the lack of diversity of the authors of the data that's going into these models has an impact on how the models actually perform. Uh, and, and what is accountability in terms of these systems? When systems like GPT-3 and, and this new Megatron uh, Turing system start to generate language, who's accountable for that? Um, where does it come from? Is it the, the trainer of the model? Is it the company that is generating the model? There's a lot of questions associated with that. So within the context of um, my research, I really, really like dealing with very, very small networks. Um, and I think there is tremendous opportunity to look at more neuroscience inspired components, neurons and synapses, to be able to do tasks that are more complicated than you would be able to do with a traditional approach with the same number of components. And so I have a little video here um, showing uh, one of our, our spiking neural networks that's doing a three-dimensional navigation task, um, avoiding obstacles and, and uh, driving towards a target. You can see the entire network. Those are individual neurons and synapses that are in that video. And you can see how they're activating as it's navigating throughout the environment. So when you have networks that are this small, you know, less than 100 neurons, less than 100 synapses, you can train faster, you can implement them more efficiently in hardware, and you can interpret the results. We can actually drill down into a network like this and start to say, okay, what is it doing? How is it making decisions? How is it, how is it looking at its environment, making a decision and um, solving this task? And we've done this across a variety of different control applications and classification tasks where we generate very small networks that can still do something intelligent, but we can start to actually get some interpretability and explainability with them as well. So I really just wanna emphasize that for the future of AI models, I think smaller is the future and we should be looking at research that can give us these smaller networks, perhaps with more neuroscience inspired components so that we can still solve complex tasks, but also have a better understanding of what they're doing.
Thank you so much, Catherine. This is excellent. I'm glad that like, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. This will be a great panel. And then the last panelist will be Mr. Chuck Howell and you have the floor. Um, thank you. And let me, uh, hopefully you can see my slides and I will make the slideshow. Is it showing okay? Great. Okay. Well, um, I, I think if I if I had a, a an IQ above two digits, I would just say what Katie just said. Yes. Um, uh, the 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 aspect that I wanted to focus on very briefly is the uh, the how do we establish and preserve um, uh, justified confidence in these very large, complex, expensive, uh, and yet consequential models. So just just a very brief context. Um, the the uh, it, it's just clear these large models of various kinds are going to be uh, introduced into very consequential complex socio technical environments. It's not just uh, picking you know cat videos on the internet, and it's not just about what runs on electricity. It's it's these things are being dropped into these complex socio technical systems where they affect and are affected by individual and collective decisions and actions, assumptions and biases policies, laws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a very complex mix. And in that complex mix, um, as Katie just illustrated, there's so many challenges really having confidence that you understand the performance envelope of, of the model um, as it's being subjected to all kinds of unusual circumstances. Um, the, that's, that's been the case even for just software and automation. It's clearly even more the case for machine learning particularly machine learning implemented with deep learning. And then with a variety of new models, I was, I was tempted to put some of the, you know, you can't keep up, you know, oh, BERT and GPT-3 or so last week, they were tiny compared to what we've got now. Um, but I also wanted to, to just uh, include in this broad category of new models that present opportunities and challenges, contrastive and self-supervised learning. I think in addition to the growing awareness that we simply, can't continue to rely on an approach that requires um, a city's worth of consumption of electricity and acres of GPUs and storage, overstating only a little bit for effect, um, that that's the opposite of the democratization of AI. That the other, uh, uh, another example of, of, a, of a ceiling or a bottleneck is uh, supervised deep learning or supervised learning in general, but producing lots and lots and lots and lots of correct, accurate, unbiased uh, labels is uh, more than a challenge. And so contrastive or self-supervised learning is an intriguing approach. It brings with it both uh, its own issues of scale and of understanding and, and the performance envelope. So um, I just, one other aspect to, to sort of say, you know, again, reemphasize, although the, the challenges of in the model building and model assessment itself are enormous and very important, um, that there's this larger sort of socio-technical context that's very important because of the role these systems are taking on, um, that there is uh, uh, no real way for individual stakeholders to always be the, the ones making those decisions about whether or not it's appropriate to use this any more than um, I would be in a position to make an informed judgment about whether or not the software that's um, driving uh, an MRI or uh, in the avionics and an aircraft I'm about to get into. I, I'm absolutely unqualified, even if I was provided all the relevant information, I have no idea what I should be looking for, what, what's good, what's bad. Um, what I do have reasonable confidence in is a socio-technical framework that does have access to expertise, that does have access to data and uh, test results, et cetera, et cetera, and, and reaches a consensus conclusion that the system is, uh, is adequately safe or adequately uh, effective. Um, that still presents an enormous number of challenges, and I know we've talked about some already, and we'll talk about more, but I just, I think there's sometimes a little bit uh, of a fruitless focus on the assumption that what we have to do is have models that explain in excruciating detail in natural language to the end user exactly why they are doing something or proposing something. And I think that's holding those systems to a different standard and probably isn't even realistic. Um, so there are, the, there are all these concerns about, so what do proxies for us, 
who are going to make these decisions about whether or not it's responsible to use a, a large model system, for example, what do they need to know? And what are the boundary conditions for, for when those systems are uh, appropriate for use and when they aren't? Um, in cybersecurity, uh, overstating again for effect, wrapping up, it's, uh, it, it's not quite the case, but, but uh, it, to some degree, it was as if over time, the internet grew and grew and grew. And then we suddenly realized, wow, this has become a global critical infrastructure. We need to go retrofit some of those protocols that we never really gave any consideration to hostile actors uh, in. And, and that hasn't worked well. And so I think what one of the really great things about the, the focus of this conference and all of the research that you guys represent is we, we may be, it's not too late, we have an opportunity to bake in from the start um, concerns about robustness and fairness and transparency and uh, accountability, um, rather than suddenly belatedly trying to retrofit them in later, which doesn't typically work well. Um, there's, there's a link to, a, uh, I think, a fascinating article uh, about this notion of, of uh, proxies for, for establishing justified confidence. And what does that mean? How does it work in other domains? What's required in order to get to that level in, in consequential AI? Um, so thank you very much. I will get off the stage and I'm looking forward very much to the discussion. Thank you so much. That's a great overview. And I absolutely agree with everything that was said, um, especially the need for trusted and responsible AI and the need for this massive scale models to go through more rigorous evaluation. And that's, that's a challenge for me. I accept it as a challenge. That's where we really can make science and technology improvements and advance the science. Mm -hmm. As um, Stanford um, had a workshop on foundation models, that's the term that they coined for this massive scale language and actually not the only language, but also multimodal models like CLIP uh, and the perceiver, for example, from Google. But absolutely, there is a need um, to, um, to improve the data that goes into these models. These models are indeed costly to train and, and not possible. it's not possible for academia and for national labs to really train these large scale models. But this is the fact that so far they are rocking and whether these massive scale models are the future of AI or maybe that's a stepping stone, we still don't know. But what, what we know is for sure that we need to rigorously evaluate them. We need to make sure that we interact with them properly. We need to make sure that we put the right data inside these models, we train these models on the right data, and, and we need to make sure there are no biases. That's crucial. This, I absolutely, I read the paper by Emily Bender, a fascinating paper, um, and I agree with everything that's said there. Yes, absolutely, there are biases, and people are biased, and people who train these models are biased, and we have to fix it, and I accept it as a challenge. I believe we can fix it, and I, and I also believe that that the national labs have a special role in it because the industry is driven by their own drivers, right? And they fed the whole lab, I mean, not the whole lab, but 600 gigabytes of the web data into the model, um, right? And that's why the model is very biased because this content is generated by us, by humans. So um, um, just to, to, to summarize, I think we're all on the same page and we have a great, a foundation to start this discussion. And I would like to open this discussion by my, my first question. If you can elaborate on in your personal um, indicators of AI progress, I think you all agree uh, that AI made significant progress over the last couple of years, but what is this progress for you? And what are the indicators of this progress? Who wants to go first? Okay, so uh, on the duty side, uh, although I am very much involved with the video and imagery, uh, one area where we have seen progress, which I and my unit does not get very much involved in personally, but I'm very aware of because it does happen in our lab and uh, uh, my uh, colleagues and some of the other branches have worked on it, uh, is indeed natural uh, language processing. Uh, the fact that um, the U.S. has been engaged in uh, military operations in the Middle East and in Afghanistan uh, 
Uh, and until recently, uh, one of the challenges was indeed uh, fast and efficient language translation. And we have certainly seen a lot of progress there. And that, that's what comes to my mind readily in the uh, uh, application area in, 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 the, in the business that um, I'm involved in. So coming from the DOE perspective, the like opportunities in scientific data specifically are extremely compelling of late, especially I think AlphaFold is the most, um, in my mind that stands out as the achievement of deep learning. I mean, the natural language models are, are, you know, they're amazing. They've gotten some really great, really great results, but the ability to better understand scientific data to help us answer questions that we just have not been able to answer previously, that, that's the hallmark for me. Yeah, I, I was, uh, I was going to exactly use the example of AlphaFold and also some, some work we're doing with, with um, Health and Human Services um, related, uh, not nearly as galvanizing and, and really a, a big step forward as AlphaFold, but, but again, the notion of, of um, AI enhancing scientific discovery um, is, I think, uh, you know, like a meta tool. And, and, and there, there have been some less dramatic, but really important advances, uh, especially in the biological sciences and, the chem and chemistry and, and even material science. Um, that are really remarkable. Um, so, I mean, that's that doesn't get the same headlines, perhaps, that some of the other uh, applications do. But it, you know, twenty years from now, we may look at, at those as the really important hinge points. Absolutely, I agree. Apologies about the noise. Um, and just to add, I agree um, on the potential of. Um, of next generation AI models, I will be a little ambiguous here, for the science and security domains. Like there, there from two months ago, there is a PNAS paper on um, using transformer, massive scale transformer models for biology and learning this representation that is a unified general purpose representation that can be taken then and used for many tasks like uh, uh, mutation recognition and other biological tasks that um, that were not possible before. So I, I agree with all of you. And these are, I mean, you're, you're spot on in terms of the progress and, and indicators. But do you, where do you see the potential for self-supervised learning? Because that's how humans learn. And then that's the way that this massive scale models learn in a self-supervised fashion, right? We don't provide labels with them. We pre-train these models, but then we fine tune it later uh, for specific tasks, right, or for specific domains, which which really speeds up the development of, of this next generation AI. Do you see the potential and where do you see the potential for self-supervised learning? Well, I, I, I mean, I think it's, it's um, at, at some point, a sufficient change in, in quantity is really a qualitative change, which I mean, obvious, but um, I, I think there's some regimes where it just doesn't scale. It's, you know, it's, it's just never going to be the case that we can have uh, agreement on labeling schemas and, and then all the, you know, there's only so much work you can do with Amazon Turk. <laughs> so um, I, I think that, that there are uh, regimes that just where the volume of data is, is so huge. I was going to say astronomical, and, and that is an example. You know, there's just... Um, ludicrous amounts of data coming from things, you know, like the, you know, like whether it's uh, colliders or, or, or uh, collect, you know, the uh, astro astronomical instruments, et cetera. Um, and in that enormous volume of data are patterns and signals that, um, that we can, we maybe now can, can extract and use and see that we couldn't before. And in some sense, it's that, that that's the value. It's not the, always just the predictive model itself. It's the, the exposure and making explicit what was implicit in really, really, really large volumes of data or really subtle connections across the data. Um, and I think uh, contrastive or self-supervised learning provides an opportunity to, to, to take advantage of scale, just ludicrously large amounts of data. 
I agree. I was going to say, and then again, I'm going to come back to the scientific data and, and certainly the astronomical, the telescope data that's being generated is truly, truly astronomical, um, as a matter <laughs> of fact. But um, I think that there's also um, a tremendous amount of microscopy data across mm -hmm. domains and materials and biology um, that can also be used in this, in this domain. And again, if you're looking for patterns, you're looking for the ability to extract these relationships. And I think that self-supervised learning has the opportunity to help in those domains as well. Do you mind if I just, one other, no thought goes unuttered, I'll, I'll make, but um, a completely different area that, that is also fraught with some challenges, but the notion of, of we, we are becoming an instrumented society in so many different ways, digital exhaust, and, and our every interaction is digital and is captured and is, is uh, at least in theory, uh, amenable to being ingested into some large analytic. Um, the, the dystopian aspect of that are, you know, the obvious, you know, surveillance society parts, but there's also just uh, understanding patterns of interaction, understanding cause and effect, understanding um, pockets of differences in, in society or cultures or interactions that, that are invisible to us, again, just because of the volume. Um, that, that I think is another place where, where self-supervised learning might really tease out some interesting and ideally helpful patterns and, and connections. Absolutely. <clears throat> Dr. Ryo, do you have anything to add on the potential of self-supervised learning, especially for your domain, for the vision domain? It, I mean, it transformed it in 2013, right? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so to a great extent, um, it depends on how well a particular problem is bounded and how complex the problem is where you employ your self-supervised learning. Uh, so so, so, so uh, I mean, here are these questions that can be posed in very simple forms and very simple sentences but it may mean different things to different people, correct? Um, the question itself about self-supervised learning was posed in a fairly simple manner. But then when you think about it, there are all these nuances. And so, uh, so in situations where uh, what you have set the self-supervised learning to do is to develop a taxonomy based on its observations of data, uh, perhaps in those situations, uh, indeed, uh, th there is a lot of potential, but a question is uh, one of scale as well. So if you let, let it lose in a situation where uh, you as the ultimate arbiter, the human being, uh, is aware that there are say 10 or so classes Perhaps that's a small enough problem for a self-supervised system as it accrues data to indeed come up with what the proper taxonomy is and indeed come up with those classes. And instead of 10, it may find that there actually are 14. Uh, on the other hand, if the problem is one where it's very open-ended and there's a possibility that there are 50,000 classes, I just don't know. Uh, so that said, uh, coming back to the question, there indeed is a lot of potential for self-supervised learning in the vision domain, uh, uh, even in uh, the DOD type applications. Yeah, absolutely agree. And um, the next question will be about our favorite topic, um, transparent and, um, and interpretable models. So, I mean, there are many challenges, even not in the massive scale AI models domain, right? So can you please elaborate on what are the bottlenecks in, in, in designing this transparent and interpretable models kind of in general and specifically, what can we do and how can we push the state of the art for the foundation models in transparency and, and, and robustness and other dimensions? I'll argue for going smaller again. Um, I think we need to start smaller and build up in complexity because otherwise we won't be able to, to understand what 
how, how these systems are working, how they're coming to the conclusions that they are. And then I think in terms of these massive scale data models, I mentioned it in my position statement, we need to understand the data. We need to Absolutely. have, we need to have a better understanding of the yeah. data um, that's going into these models and not just blindly throw everything at it and hope that yeah. it will, it will be able to filter it out. Absolutely, totally agree. And I would like I would like to bring to attention the NERPS were upcoming workshop at NERPS this year that is led by Andrew Ahn on data centric artificial intelligence because he argues he gave a few very inspirational talks recently where he argues that our community have been working on model improvement and model advances for for years for the last I don't know how many years many years. But let's look into the data because that's what goes into the model. I'm super excited about that workshop and I absolutely agree with you. I would challenge you on the going smaller statement because um, that isn't it what we have been doing until 2013. Uh, but smaller with a different type of model. So you look at more complex neurons, more complex synapses. What can we do when we start to take more inspiration from neuroscience? Because those models are known to be more computationally powerful than traditional models. So we could start smaller with those, apply them to tasks that are progressively more complex, and maybe we can get a better understanding of what's going on there, just because it's easier to reason with those than it is to reason with these very, very large models. But 100%, I mean, obviously, our, our performance gains have been by increasing the size, but I think that's a mistake going forward to just keep increasing the size of these models bigger and bigger to get performance improvement. I mean, so you argue for control in learning, for the data control and bias is absolutely 100%. Yes. Okay, so what are the other bottlenecks in, in transparent and interpretable models that we face right now? Well, I, I love the quote from uh, Fred Brooks. Uh, you know, we have to be careful how we fix what we don't understand. And, and I think one part of it, again, to, to loop back to the, you know, I'm a man of few words, I just repeat them incessantly. That these are that the real reason we care about this is because these are being introduced into and shaping complex socio-technical systems, and so one part of that is beginning with so what is it that we care about? What are the boundary conditions? What are the the externally visible effects that we really care about that we need to know about? And then that inform and 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 that's a, a discussion with stakeholders, with policy, all kinds of stuff long before you've started building a model. If you've established that thoughtfully and intentionally, then you can identify what data and what information and state you need to capture. And that informs your design. Um, if you wait again until the very end and then just say, well, let's just cast a wide net, and gather a bunch of data, you just add into the volume and the jabber. You're not, you're not getting insight into what this thing's doing. So that, that sort of very intentional identifying what, what are the guardrails that we need to understand and what sensors do we need to put into the system to writ large, the broad system, to understand how we're doing and whether we're hitting a guardrail or getting close to it. And then there's also the, uh, when bad things happen to good systems, the after action forensics or audit. So, so this didn't go the way we would have wanted. Why did that happen? How did it happen? How do we prevent it? Um, we do that in other complex systems. And I think um, uh, just sort of echoing what Katie said a bit, I think we tend to, to instinctively throw CPU cycles and, and, and volume at problems in this domain, um, it's it's worked in a lot of ways. I, you know, I can't I can't say it's not a bad strategy, but it won't get you to, to justified confidence in complex consequential systems. And so, I, I think really thinking through what is it we need to understand, um, and what do we need, and can we get there? And if so, what do we need to do to get there is really important. Just by the way, I really really like the travel posters behind you. Absolutely. Dr. Rao, do you have anything to add? Uh, to, to some extent, the uh, problem is inherent in the way uh, neural networks, assuming that when we talk about AI and ML in this particular context, most of the time, uh, even if it is unsaid, we are looking at deep neural networks. Uh, I mean that necessarily. I mean that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. But of course, in today's world, that that's all the rage. Uh, the the fact that they're inherently nonlinear in itself presents the challenge in developing uh, uh, explanations or in generating interpretation as to why 
the decision making went a specific way as opposed to some other way. Uh, so when we had expert system or when we have systems built entirely on if then logic linearly without nonlinearity, it's always possible to go back and uh, given a particular outcome, figure out that it was in this step of the computational process that such and such thing happened, which ultimately led to this specific outcome. That, that is an inherent challenge with the neural network model itself, is the way I look at it. And nevertheless, there are insights that seem to come out when you dig deeper uh, we, uh, for instance, currently have a project supporting uh, MIT in uh, neural network dissection, where uh, that is something that's uh, being figured out, that uh, when you're able to generate an association between data types, features within the data, specific decisions that the neural network makes, and specific states that the neural network weights reach within the neural network, there is some degree of uh, confidence in saying that under such and such conditions, these are the decisions that are going to be made, uh, whether they're right decisions or wrong decisions. I would say that it's the essential structure, again, that poses a challenge in this context. Absolutely, agree. And I think that there is a question from the audience right now. So right now would be a good time to ask your question. We still have a couple more minutes. Is there a question from the audience? Uh, yes. Uh, can you Go hear ahead. us? Okay, I think one of the questions was for the statement that Katie made about our smaller models being more interpretable, but I think that was kind of answered uh, in her saying about the complex synapses and making these um, neurons more uh, complex, you could perhaps have that understanding. The other question was actually for uh, Chuck on uh, something you said is more aspirational at this point. In, in a sense, like, you know, one of the grand challenges that is being redefined in the field right now with the new AI 100 report is that the next generation of AI systems should have, should be able to seamlessly co cooperate and collaborate with humans, right? And kind of understand the human values and preferences in the process. So, and in here comes a lot of challenges that you mentioned about like, you know, in terms of uh, fairness and uh, uh, biases that come into the system. So how do we really, it, while, while we see that it is aspirational at this point and there has to be a lot of work to be done to get there, that's why it's a grand challenge. But what do you see are some of the first steps uh, to be moving in that direction? Or what, are you, what do you think are some of the studies that are inspiring us to move in that direction? Um, well, I mean, it's definitely a, a huge aspirational challenge. And, and it's also... I mean, I think there's an enormous amount of excitement and enthusiasm around the opportunities for, for real teaming, not, not, uh, not just replacing hu humans with machines or, uh, or having a human in the loop as sort of the, the, the safety loop, but, but real teaming that augments. I, the example I've, I've seen more than once are uh, canine teams with the police officers um, that can accomplish things that neither a dog nor a police officer by themselves could do. But no one thinks that with sufficient training, the, the dog is going to replace the police officer. Um, I actually probably am a little bit of a, a near-term skeptic uh, about incorporating values into um, high-performance linear algebra or, or you know, whatever's running the, the, uh, your, your model. Uh, the same way that I'm a little bit of a skeptic in the near term about uh, model explainability, where uh, a, a digital avionics box is going to converse, I'm overstating for effect, but converse with a pilot and, and explain exactly what led to the conclusion to, to bank left or, or whatever. I, I do think, though, that there is a middle path where uh, making much more explicit the value decisions that we're putting into this system 
Uh, anytime you've got a machine learning system, you're making trade-offs in terms of priorities, objective functions, et cetera. Those often are value decisions and they're implicit and making saying we value this more than this, or we're willing to ignore this consequence in order to achieve this efficiency. The, those aren't necessarily right or wrong, but they represent value decisions. And they're usually made implicitly, making them explicit and, and actually codifying them I think would go a long way to, to starting uh, us down the road of having more confidence that these complex systems will reflect our values. How long will it be before they actually internalize them and are, and are executing them in, in any sense, I think is a really interesting discussion. But I do think we need to hold them as part of being accountable for saying it's okay to use this system uh, that's high consequence. I think a lot more attention to how do you capture those trades and make them explicit. I think that's a research agenda in itself. I mean, I don't think that that it's obvious. Um, so I think that's the, the near and midterm, and then certainly the long term. Actually, how do you reflect values in running code um, is is a fascinating topic. But I don't know if I. I hope I touched on the question. Yes, that was so great. Yeah, thank you. And I think we are right on time. Oh, I had one more question for you, but I don't think that is time. So I would like to thank all of the panelists. That, that was a great discussion. I'm so glad that I was given the opportunity to moderate this panel. And, um, and I just want to thank the panelists again and the audience for, for, for great questions. Um, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was really a pleasure. Thank Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. See you guys. Bye. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Atchison. I'm the Director of Federal Relations in Washington, D.C. for the University of Texas, San Antonio. It is my great pleasure to present our next speaker, the Honorable Susan Gordon. Ms. Gordon has currently serves on the boards of both Khaki and Palace Advisors in providing strategic um, consultancy on risk strategy and technology advancements. In her three decades of government service, she served in many distinct roles, including the Deputy Director of National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, she was the fifth principal deputy director of national in, director of national intelligence, where she served as a key advisor to both the president and the National Security Council. In her 27 years at the CIA, she served in all four of its directorates. Throughout her roles, she has championed the advancement and application of technology strategic and innovation solutions that can be applied to the mission and the needs of the government and its agencies. She led the design and drove the forming of InQtel to deliver innovative technology for the agency and the broader intelligence community. Her expertise and perspectives are at the heart of today's forum and discussions on the objectives of advancing technology and how to incorporate them into our future needs. And so with that, I would like to turn the forum over to Ms. Gordon. Well, uh, Michelle, thank you so very much and great to see you again working your magic, albeit in a different form than last we met. Uh, what a great conference. I was listening in to the last panel and I confess I wanted them to keep going because I thought the conversation was just so incredibly rich. Um, and as a matter of fact, the conference in general was a combination of brilliant speakers and an especially relevant topic. And I'm honored and humbled to be a part of it. And I promise I'll work to be worthy of the minutes I've been granted. Um, as Michelle said, and as my bio reveals, I'm an intelligence officer by training and discipline. 
My singular goal since my start in the government in the 1980s was to keep America and her allies and partners safe from those adversaries and competitors who would advance their interests at the expense of ours. National and global security used to be the purview of governments, but now it's a shared responsibility between government, the private sector, academia, and our citizens. And so even though I'm going to talk from my perspective, it is really our interests and your potential that I'll be mostly speaking to. Uh, I have, in fact, for my career, lived at the intersection of technology and mission outcome. And as the threat environment has changed from mostly physical to mostly digital, I've tried to ensure that we always have advantage and clarity and wisdom and insight to facilitate decision-making and action. So think about that. If you think about what these technologies really have the potential to do, it's clarity, wisdom, and insight for the purpose of making decisions and affecting act action. And what's cool about looking at it from a national security and governmental perspective is it's really big purpose and really consequential. And so it drives you to have to do a set of things, but once you do, you can get a lot of benefits. So think about it, when we went to the moon, we got Tang and Velcro. So there's purpose in looking at big mission and then driving it into the things that we're building along the way. There are in fact, few subjects that are more interesting to me um, than AI. In fact, little known fact that in 1983, I was a young telemetry analyst, overwhelmed by data from orbiting Soviet communication satellites and I initiated one of the CIA's first contracts for artificial intelligence with a Maryland-based company called Delphi Systems to do change detection at scale. Said differently, I just wasn't getting to all the data that were available to me. And I had this feeling like I was missing something. It turns out um, that uh, with the capabilities of AI at the time, um, I wasn't missing much, so I would say it didn't work. But I will tell you the lessons of that first effort and the potential inspired me. So let me give you a little bit of a roadmap for my remarks today. I'll start with how I see the world and the moment in which we find ourselves to hopefully impel you to greatness as you go back and do all the hard work to make potential kinetic. I'll talk about the kinds of advantage I think AI affords, national security, which is so much more than war fighting, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, to give you a big complex goal that is still elusive and whose solution will provide incredible benefit to society. And then I'll close by talking about some of the adjacent issues that will have to be addressed within organizations if AI is ever going to reach its transformative potential said differently, oh, you wanted to use it. And I'll talk about those things that have to be addressed. As a matter of fact, Chuck in the last panel was talking about a lot of the issues around human machine um, integration that I think will be key to, to key research areas to make uh, great things happen. Um, so said differently, you all do all the hard work of the what, I'll focus a little bit on the why and the how of it. Um, listen, this is a really remarkable moment in which we find ourselves. Certainly these are disruptive times. It's as though we went to bed one night and when we woke up, Everything looked the same, but the things we used to do don't work anymore. So we're going to have to create a new, not just draft off the good work of our predecessors. And I think that's relevant because there are certainly things AI can do to help us do the tasks that we already imagine better, more efficiently, faster, clearer, a whole bunch of things. But to me, the real potential allows that it allows is what we will be able to do that we simply can't do now. There are in fact three dominant conditions that affect the world today. The first is ubiquitous technology. Everyone has access to every technology and capability is not the advantage, but it's the ability to put capability to clever use faster that makes the difference. And if you have an installed base, an infrastructure that are works, ways that you do things, big government systems that I was a part of, this is in fact a disadvantage in this world because undoing how you've done things is very difficult. Um, second, it's a world of near perfect digital connectedness. 
That digital connectedness obliterates distance and boundaries. It allows unlimited, unlimited reach. It changes aspirations and it makes global fortunes intertwined for good or bad. And that makes speed of insight and action an imperative. Moreover, it makes everyone part of the threat surface. Uh, and we need look no further than cyber attacks on businesses or information attacks um, uh, on to influence or shape society to know that um, there are some really big problems that we as a society face just because of digital connectedness. And then data abundance, which should be a boon for people who want to understand the world, um, but can be a bane uh, if you are unable to deal effectively with it because it is really difficult to dis distinguish signal from noise. And again, each one of those conditions has created a world where all the threats and opportunities go through information. So the importance of data technologies to our future is absolutely critical. Um, yep, I love it for the recommendation of um, a Netflix movie, and I really appreciate it in fraud detection, but it's much bigger than that uh, as we go forward. Um, it's also a world where the definition of national security has gotten a lot bigger than China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and terrorism. Uh, so national security interests now include cyber and space and pandemics and climate and economic instability, societal unrest, information disorder and humanitarian crises. Um, those are huge issues that I really don't think that we have the ability to address in a meaningful way without real advances in our ability to understand disconnected, discontiguous information to be able to put it together to understand what's happening so we can decide what to do. So differently, um, back in the 1960s, we were worried about global thermonuclear war and we invested in capabilities to defeat that threat. In 2001, we were faced with terrorist attacks and we developed new capabilities to be able to defeat or at least push back that threat. And in 2021, we have a set of huge interconnected issues that we don't have the systems and wherewithal to understand what's happening in a way that will allow us to take action. And I think this is one of the things that inspires me the most and made me force Michelle to let me come and talk to you. So while you're doing all the hard work, you understand that I see that what you're doing is in fact, not just about making things go, but making sure we have the environment where things can succeed. To me, the use cases that these new national security threats present to us are absolutely inspiring if the words inspiring and daunting can be interwoven. Um, it's not just dealing with massive amounts of information to detect change. I don't think we've even begun to understand the interaction of climate on global events to not only seeing what is, but to infer intent in the patterns of the action that lead to that. Those same patterns that will allow us to sense, to launch cyber counterattacks before the attacks hit their target because we have understood so much the difference between a nuisance hacker and massing at the border in cyberspace. To uncover correlation and causality I think some of the most interesting work going on in AI right now is in the medical fields where they're doing work and looking at all of the whole body of cancer research, not just 
to see what's going on now in any single domain, but all that has been done and what they're finding is correlations that they never imagined before and what that could be real about coupling effects and allow us to do and put that into an even larger national security context. And it's pretty introduced and pretty interesting. I think AI can make transparent what seeks to be hidden because in the life and breadth and pattern and movement of information you are going to find origin and target. To provide decision makers with all relevant information, our decision makers don't have dashboards today that allow them to see the whole of the information we have. And I think that is an even a realistic five-year goal for them. To identifying what is true and ensuring that we can trust our systems, because I will tell you that truth and trust are the foundations of free and open society. And if there is any area where I would really like to see AI take hold, it would be in how we understand what is true, not from a content perspective, but from a pedigree perspective and how we can ensure trust in our systems, because this is one of the great enablers of free societies to simply offloading the routine so there's time for the more thought provoking. But it'll take a lot of work to get from there to where we are today, just based on the big well-funded organization that I came from, um, the distance between the potential and the ability to provide real actionable advantage is huge. In other words, let me curb my enthusiasm with a dose of reality. Um, or at least broaden your perspective on the areas where I think from an organizational perspective, we must also do work to achieve outcome. Um, I think narrow AI has the potential within five years to make real discernible difference in terms of what information is in front of people. But it is another 20 years before we can really see the kind of human machine interaction that will allow us to do different things at speed with more certainty. You know, over the course of my career, I've seen so many capabilities with potential go by the wayside because no one thought about it, how it would actually be instantiated in any workflow. So even though most of you are really focused hard on the capability itself, um, let me encourage you to be advocates for the advance of some of the adjacent dependencies that I'm going to talk about. Or at the very least understand that you are not the only player in this ecosystem. And if the use of what you're developing is what you're aiming for, then you have to care about the simultaneous advancement of the environment in which you're going to seek use. So here are just some of the areas that I think, from my perspective as a consumer user desirer of artificial intelligence to help me on my way. I would say the first barrier is just data itself. We are swimming in it, but all of it exists in impenetrable silos. It is in so many different stores, different ways, stored differently with so many different characteristics. And if the ability to be able to use it both in the narrowest sense and in aggregate requires time to train, we are going to be far away from being able to use it because right now what we do when we can't use our data is we build more systems to collect more data rather than focus on how we make sense of the data that we already have. So I encourage you to imagine the reality of an environment that already is crushed with data and thinking about how that data is going to be used and what your systems demand of it. And is that a realistic demand or are there things that you need to do to push back? I think the digital foundation is still so mixed. Um, you know, if you're in the private sector, the Googles and the Microsofts can talk about um, on-demand compute capability that is not always uh, the reality of people working in a bureaucracy. So understanding the demands of compute and the infrastructure 
that is going to work with the systems you have and how are you going to put it into a platform so it's not so narrow a use that it ever scales to big outcome. As I mentioned, Chuck in the previous panel had a great discussion of the question of human machine integration and the intersection of explainability and judgment of res and responsibility and how that is gonna to have to be wrestled with before we can put AI into some of the big decision-making schemes. Um, to give you an example from the world of intelligence that might help you understand how difficult the decision to use AI and ML capabilities in decision-making will be. Um, an intelligence officer's job is essentially to have a jigsaw puzzle of a problem with only, with no knowledge of the picture, with only a quarter of the pieces, with a policymaker that wants to know what the picture is in five minutes, and they're going to take a decisive action. In other words, in intelligence, where there's uncertainty, the job is to make a call and be responsible for the quality of that call. How is that analyst ever going to turn it over, any part of that, to a machine? So one of the things we've been thinking about is distinguishing between what humans can't do in the future because the speed of the world is too fast and identify those tasks as ones that are really ripe for machine effort. What humans want to be able to do with machines, right? How do they want to be able to use it? And then finally, what humans can only do when it comes to making decisions. The best example I have for that one is decisions of lethality, that it is really hard for me to imagine how close that is. But thinking about the issue of human machine interaction, I think is a really important area for research. For some jobs, explainability will need to be there but it's still going to have to be given to the machine. And in other areas, you're gonna to have to have a human and understanding between those things is really important. So a really ripe area for research. And to me, culture is a big issue, but this is much more than culture. How are you gonna have humans and machines interact when you get further down the trail of what the potential of these technologies are? I think we're just beginning uh, to do real work on AI and algorithmic assurance. Uh, this is really important, one, for consequential work, two, for work where there's uncertainty in it, and three, for work where adversaries and competitors might have reason to keep you from having a true picture of what you have. AI assurance, and security in general, again, is really the domain and the concern of free and open societies because it's what allows us to be free and open because we can have trust, because we can assure the things we have. So AI assurance has got to be done hand in glove. And if it's done hand in glove with development, it's likely to work. Uh, I think ethics are really important. I think the discussion that I heard on values is incredibly important. You know, the, the, the rub between Google and the Department of Defense on their concern about providing capability for the Defense Department based on a, a view of what was ethically proper was on one hand, one you can understand it, on the other one that's a little misguided because the technology isn't thing, the thing that produces outcome, it's the rules around it. What are the rules that we place? What are the values? The US and free open societies are nations of laws. How are those instantiated? So imagining 
that ethic and understand the ethical boundaries and what will need to be able to be measured is an important part. And the last thing is, I, I think this is really important. I think this is a really important push um, for the government is there need to be the resources applied um, to this field. They need to be applied at the academic level, at the intersection between academia and the private sector. The private sector has done so much work to press this forward, but I think there is even more fundamental research. Um, I think that my guiding mm, example of what happens when you have a technology with, with potential, but that isn't committed to is Kodak. So Kodak was forgot that their mission statement was to preserve, make keeping memories as easy as writing with a pencil. And even though they had invested in digital technologies earlier than everyone else, they couldn't commit to them and they're largely not on the scene. I think these technologies that you are talking about today and will be talking about tomorrow that you're advancing on every front are so important to the world's term, to the order that we need to ensure that society doesn't just go flying off because we can't figure out how to have organizing principles, but it has to be well resources. We have to commit to all the adjacencies so that we can put this to use. So I've tried to tell you that there are, this is a world that is digital. It's a world where all the opportunities and concerns go through data and information, where the technologies that you're working on have the potential to change us for the better from the mundane to the aspirational, that there are those who would try and advance their interests at the expense of ours that have the exact same tools and capabilities and technologies in their quiver that we have to understand that we need to be able to counter in order to be able to advance. Tried to tell you that I think there is unlimited potential for good when we can put these into effect for both security and society. But the distance from where we are, and not just in the technologies themselves, but in the environment in which we want them to have effect, is an area that still needs advance. And if you want to deliver the outcome that your work inspires, you have to care about those adjacencies as well and make sure that you've got someone on your left and right who's making sure that what you develop can be put into use. Um, and if we do that together, my 20 year view is that we will be seeing the world with much more clarity and be able to act with much more responsibility than we can today just because the data will be available to us because you all will make it so. And with that, Michelle, I think I've probably talked longer than any one human should without interaction or challenge. Um, I'm ecstatic about the work you all are doing, the conference you've put on, and the grace you've shown me by letting me come and speak with you. Thanks, Honorable Sukhorin. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience here. Sure. Are you able to hear me well? I am. Great. Uh, the first question is, data accessibility and inequity that you mentioned are tightly coupled with capability and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. How can we address this in the digitally rich world where we, we want to develop fair and robust AI solutions 
when such inequities exist? How how do we go about? Um, so I think I think probably two things. One might be in your control. One that that is think is something that we will um, have to address as a society. I hesitate to say standards, and that is right now data are being produced according to the preference of the system that gathers it or creates it with no mind to how it wants to be used but only how it wants to be collected and proffered and so i think there is some room for standards when it comes to the production of data so it can be used within organizations that already have huge data stores i think there are two actions that need to be taken number one is we really need to address policies of data sharing i will tell you that the policies that preclude the mixing of data are more onerous than any technical solution so let's get the lawyers at finding policies that allow use rather than disallow um, interaction. And then this, the second is, um, I think there has to be some technical development that gets data to some fundamental level that can be acted upon. So one, what standards do we have when we produce it? So we stop producing unusable data and within organizations, how do you condition data for use both from a policy side and a technical perspective? and that those things have to be more rapid. And if your tools and capabilities require something, then you need to make that clear to the people <laughs> that want to integrate it so the choices they make can be influenced by your things. So, so this is a kind of, uh, my answer isn't good. But the foundation of my answer is we are all acting as though we are each doing one piece with no concern that it has to be used on the left and the right. And I guess if that were one takeaway of my remarks, it would be understand the ecosystem you're a part of and have a conversation with those with whom you must interact. system in general. Are you, are you able to hear me? I am. Okay. So the next uh, question from the audience here is, as an IC executive, you perhaps were presented with aggregate, aggregate data in several occasions. What were your metrics or insights that you have used as a guide or as a guiding principle to trust the data that was presented to you? Oh, great question. Um, within the intelligence community, almost all the data we have historically used was collected by us and then curated by huge agencies who were responsible for taking raw bits and turning it into something that could be acted on with confidence. Right. The challenge is, and I think this is an opportunity, as every challenge is, is that when intelligence community really started, most of the data were held in government stores hidden from us. And so we had to go get it. We had to be hunters. And so we could develop a system was to go get the data, curate the data, process the data, and then assure the data within it. Today, most of the data and much of the data that we know would be helpful is just being produced openly. And the community has no huge facility that is going to take that open data, amass it, curate it, and then present it. And so Historically, we've done it because it was data we collected, curated, analyzed, processed, and presented to an analyst for use. Now we have a world that there's all this data available, and we almost don't know how to do it 
when we don't have that huge facility. And so it's one of the great debates that's going on within the government is how do you use data that you did not collect and you don't have the facility to assure? Again, I think it's a great opportunity for AI capabilities to go after that open source data. Thank you. There is uh, one question from the virtual audience. If there is one thing that you could change about data today, what would that be? Sorry, data. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, think, I, mean, <laughs> I, I heard you. I just don't. <laughs> I, I heard you. I just don't have. I, I'm, I'm trying so hard not to be glib because all of this is really hard. But I think what I would say, the one thing I would change is you can't produce data if you don't know how it's going to, if you, if you don't imagine its use. I, I just think, I, I, I just think there has to be a responsibility um, bigger than just this is the way my system prefers to produce it. One thing I would change, I um, maybe some wrapper. Maybe all data gets maybe all data gets put in a wrapper so it can be used in a certain way. Um, I will say that that the reality is it's the policies that we make around the data to ensure who can use and who can't use it that are probably more problematic than the technical aspects. So this is Michelle. One last question from our Hi, audience. Michelle. Um, they would like to know what you think is um, needed by the intelligence community and the broader government workforce in preparing for being able to use um, AI products and AI services. What is the type of training or what you think the workforce needs to be prepared in receiving this technology? Uh, probably three things. It's always three things with me, Michelle. Um, uh, the, the one is probably cultural and it's something leaders need to do is more and more discussions about how the mission that they love is going to have to be prosecuted in the future. Hopefully a better version of what I tried to offer here that says there's no longing for a simpler time in order to be as successful as we've been. We're going to have to harness more technology at every level. I mean, more information at every level in every job to be as good tomorrow as we were today. So the first thing I do is leadership to talk about what we're really doing here, not the jobs we've been doing. Um, the second thing is I really would invest in the technical infrastructure. It is historically something that is underinvested in. And when it is underinvested in, doing anything new is hard. And when it's hard for someone who's being asked to do a new task, they won't do it. So we've got to make some easy buttons in our system. And then I think the last is, again, what Chuck was talking about in the panel that preceded me, which is, we, we've just got to take this notion of explainability and judgment by the horns and really do some research and do some research with humans who have tasks to say, what is it that you're not, you can't do now because it's just too voluminous? What would you like to be able to do? And what do you have to stay in the loop? And let's break it down and try and get some of those things to be factors in what we introduce. Great. Thank you very much for your candid perspectives and joining us virtually today. And uh, we look forward to uh, being able to hear more uh, about uh, your future uh, consultancies and helping change the uh, vector of technology for the nation. Thank you. you bet. And don't worry, I'll be tuning in tomorrow because today was just a great listen for me. Thank you. All right. Cheers.
Well, good afternoon. My name is David Silva. I am the Dean of the College of Sciences at the University of Texas, San Antonio, and the Distinguished Professor in Physics and Astronomy. Um, I've been asked to provide some closing remarks and some general comments. I promise to keep it brief uh, to let people get on the road or get on with their day, whatever they want to do. So on behalf of the University of Texas at San Antonio and our partners, Big Bear AI and the Missy Dreamport, uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for this inaugural AI and quantum com computing symposium. Uh, it's an honor to have such prestigious organizations partner in this event, including our DOE and DOD National Lab partners. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Darisha Kubitapetti, uh, Director of the UTSA Matrix AI Center for Human Wellbeing, for leading today's AI track and for being the key intellectual leader for this workshop. Matrix is just one example of the investment made by UTSA uh, to expand expertise and R&D capabilities in AI. Thanks again to all the speakers, uh, both here and out in the virtual space for sharing their exciting results and insights, as well as their lessons learned from the frontiers of AI research. Thanks as well to all the participants, physical and virtual. We hope today's talks sparked ideas and got you excited to point you in new directions that could be productive in both your research and mission-oriented projects. As I said, I was asked to provide a few general observations, uh, which I will keep really short. Well, we've heard some excellent talks today, and I'm just going to draw from some of those themes. While AI is often perceived by the public, and in fact, by many of the consumers of your work as some kind of general approach to solving all data intensive problems. I think all of today's talks illustrated in their own way that the reality is much more nuanced. We are making rapid progress in building remarkable decision support systems that are highly tuned to specific situations where we have a deep understanding of the data. However, as noted by many of our speakers, how we grow out into more generalized applications or more complex situations, or even whether we should or need to do so, is much less clear. This is particularly tricky in situations that involve human health and well being. I'm not the expert, but I'm highly skeptical that my human general practitioner is going to be replaced by an AI system or that my car is going to drive me to the supermarket on command anytime soon. And to state the obvious, we're a long, long way from anything like real human cognition. Just, I was intrigued by, I have to say, I was intrigued by the discussion of what AI can do for big science problems. Uh, I am an astrophysicist. Uh, I have grown up from a world where uh, we could study a couple hundred stars and 10 galaxies and feel like we'd made huge progress. As several of our speakers in the panel this afternoon mentioned, we're now in a world where we're dealing with hundreds of millions of galaxies with uh, perhaps thousands of measurements in both time and in various dimensions. We're really good at finding anomalies in that data, which is somewhat like the problem that the IC um, needs to deal with occasionally. But we're not very good yet at actually trying to draw out new physics and new knowledge from the data set, simply because it's easy to see spurious correlations. And I think that remains a challenge for everything that uh, you do and that we do. In any case, I think as today illustrated, it's certainly a rich and exciting time for researchers, but I myself worry that our marketing promises are somewhat over optimistic and our, cons our consumers, whoever they are, uh, will become frustrated with what we're doing. I'll also observe that, we made, that, that we've made rapid progress in recent years, not only because lots of clever people are looking, working on algorithms and applications, they are of course, but because of the rapid continued growth in computational capacity available for research and operations, um, most generally characterized as the introduction of cluster computing and cloud computing and just making uh, huge data sets and huge, um, uh, computation algorithms uh, uh, flops available to everyone. And that, of course, takes us to tomorrow's topic, which is quantum computing and information, and the hope to increase computational capacity by many orders of magnitude in the near term. Not every problem can or should be solved by brute force, but more computational capacity is an absolute good. 
So to give us a report from the trenches of the quantum information revolution, we have an incredible array of speakers lined up from top academic institutions with dedicated quantum information programs, as well as industry-based thought leaders from such companies as Honeywell Quantum and Xanadu. For those who have joined us here at Missy Dreamport, there will of course be continued opportunities to network, cross-pollinate, and discuss lessons learned as well as the challenge and opportunities on the road ahead. It's an exciting time. UT San Antonio is committed to building a network that will lead to joint collaborations to advance both AI and quantum. Please be on the lookout for future events and partnership opportunities. So once again, thank you for joining today. Thank you for sharing your lessons learned and your knowledge, and we hope to see you all tomorrow at 9 a.m. Thank you.